Hi everyone, good morning. Can you hear me? A very good morning to all. Um, it gives me great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all participants, students, and delegates for this scientific global digital gathering at the 11th Emirates Pathology and Digital Pathology Conference. I'm Dr. Radhakrishnan. Um, I'm actually a clinical pathologist and executive director at Mug Sharp and Dome here in the UK. And um, I'm a pathologist for the last 27 years. I'm working as an executive medical director leading the pathology component for new adjuvant trials and leading digital pathology efforts within my organization. About um, the UCG conferences, I think I would like to take a couple of minutes to share with you all. The Utilitarian Conferences Gathering offers a wide range of events, meetings, conferences, workshops, and symposium. We have a dedicated team who are aimed at acquiring the technologies adopting the knowledge of business needs and accelerating with best ideas and strategies. The Utilitarian Conferences Gathering is a pioneer in the area of event management collaboration. We are a full service event provider specializing in the field of medical, clinical and healthcare life sciences, pharma, as well as environmental science for academic and industrial sections. Um, the UCG team stand out distinctly from their competitors for their commitment to quality, round the clock service and unmatched price, and they're able to provide you with the best event and meeting experiences under one roof. At the UCG conferences, they make sure that you as a client choose the most appropriate event. We thank you all for finding time despite your busy schedule to be here today. And today marks a major activity in the brief existence of the UCG conference a moment where we are interacting, sharing experiences and reflecting on various areas. The 11th EPUCG 2022 is a remarkable event which brings together professors, researchers and students in the field of pathology and digital pathology who are making this online conference a perfect platform to share experiences, foster collaborations across industry and academia, as well as evaluate emerging technologies across the globe. With that said, we cordially invite you to join us and witness the advances in this field together. The conference has attracted delegates who have come from all over the world, across the continents, and the subject of the conference is surely of great global importance to all of us. The team at UCG would like to thank all the individuals and organizations who have worked to make this conference a grand success. The UCG program committee has put in multiple hours with many creative efforts. And finally, we would like to extend our appreciation to the participants of this conference, of course. We hope you enjoy the conference and that our participation will contribute to further professional development and relationships. I'd like to in introduce you now to Westbox, established in 1954 with the sole vision of augmenting and catering to the medical services in India. Today, the Westbox Group has emerged as one of the acclaimed leaders worldwide in bringing new innovations to the field of scientific instruments. They are ISO 9001-2016 certified, they have an ISO 13485-2013, GMP certified, and their products are European CE certified as well. They manufacture quality products that excel in performance features, reliability, conformance, durability, serviceability, and aesthetics. They have over um, 1, 1,500 unique product lines for medical education and laboratories. Their product categories include histopathology equipments like microtomes, the tissue processor, cryostat, slide stainer, wax dispensers, scanners, 
cooling plates, embedding station, autopsy tables, grossing station, next to. We're glad to have them here with us today and their representative will be giving us a talk. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with the West Fox team if you'd like to know more. With that, I'd like to also introduce um, the keynote speakers for our session today. We take great and immense pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers for the 11th Emirates Pathology and Digital Pathology Conference that's happening today and tomorrow. Dr. Anil Parwani, the Vice Chair of Anatomic Pathology and Director of Pathology Informatics and Digital Pathology from the US will be presenting his speech. Mrs. Sherry Scott from UK, Dr. Anil Berger, who is the VP for Sales and Marketing at MindBig Germany, and Dr. Michael Retsky, who's from the University College of London. Thank you all. We will now proceed and begin with the sessions for, the, for this morning. The first um, speaker for our presentation this morning will be Dr. Dilip Mishra from India. And uh, he is going to be speaking about the role of immunostains in the diagnosis of orbital tumors. I'd now like to pass on the stage to Dr. Mishra to take over the speech and proceed. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Once again, I think I'd now like to invite Dr. Dilip Mishra from India um, to be talking about his presentation today on the role of immunostains in the diagnosis of orbital tumors. Um, Dr. Mishra, you um, uh, would be glad if you could um, start your presentation and um, um, go ahead, please. Thank you. If you could please introduce, reintroduce yourself and your start, and uh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so we do not know what is happening with Dr. Mishra is no, we're not able to get in touch nor um, get any response from him. So I think without, um, you know, any further delays, we would probably move on to the next speaker if they're ready and we could bring back Dr. Mishra at a later time to present. Um, so thank you, Dr. Parvira. Now I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Satria Pervira from Indonesia to present on his poster. Thank you so much for, for um, you know, being ready and uh, to start your presentation. 
uh, this is much appreciated, uh, Dr. Prabhupada. So we'd like to invite you to go ahead and um, you know start your presentation on your Thank poster. You so Thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, it is an honor for me to be able to attend this event. This is my first international conference as a resident. Thank you to the organizing committee who has helped this event to success and my college seniors, doctors, and professors. Congratulations on attending this event. And hopefully we can gain our knowledge and science, especially in the field of pathology. Today, I will present autopsy findings on sudden unexpected natural death in no special type breast cancer. This case is a bit unique because usually what we autopsy are cases of unnatural death such as homicide, suicide, or accidents. Although at a first glance, it appeared that there were open wounds on the chest that made us suspect of breast cancer, the autopsy findings turned out to be much more complex. Before we begin, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Satria Perwira. I come from Indonesia. I am currently undergoing a first year residency in the Department of Forensic Medicine and Medical Legal Studies at Dr. Sutomo Teaching Hospital, East Java, Indonesia. And also as a first year student of the Forensic Science Graduate Program at Erlangga University, also in East Java, Indonesia. Without further ado, I'll start the presentation. <clears throat> Sudden death caused by the disease often raises suspicion for investigators and the public, especially if the death happened to a person well known to the public. Suspicion of a criminal element in the case of sudden death is mainly due to uh, the problem at the crime scene, which is not at the victim's house or hospital, but in a public place. Thus, sudden death is a forensic case, which uh, we need to examine further, further to reveal what was the cause of death. Although autopsy results show that the victim's death was due to heart disease, cerebral hemorrhage, a rupture of cerebral aneurysm, cancer, etc. For case presentation, a body was found in the residential area on Jalan Ngagel 165, Surabaya, on Monday, January 10, 2022 at 11.45 a.m. West Indonesian time and reported to the police for investigation. A forensic expert identified the body at Dr. Sutomo Teaching Hospital, West Java, Indonesia. External, internal, and laboratory investigation were conducted. The body arrived at the forensic medicine and medical legal installation of Dr. Sutomo Teaching Hospital, Surabaya, on Monday, January 10, 2022, at 2.50 p.m. West Indonesian time. We conducted an external examination on Monday, January 10, 2022 at 2.57 p.m. West Indonesian time and an internal examination of autopsy on Thursday, January 13, 2022 at 9 a.m. West Indonesian time at the Forensic Medicine and Medical Legal Installation of Dr. Sutomo Teaching Hospital on the body. Uh, name, Mistress X, female gender, age 63 years old. We perform an autopsy because of the request from uh, the police and no family acknowledge it and uh, confirm the cause of death. On external examination, the body is female, aged between 55 to 65 years old, body length of 150 centimeters, weight of 68 kilograms, brown skin color and excess nutritional status. Property of the corpse, the body is wrapped in a yellow body bag with the, inscri in the inscription BP Berlin Mas Kota Surabaya, measuring 200 centimeters by 100 centimeters. One piece of clothing made of cotton with a gray base color, floral motif, no size and no band. A serum made of cotton, green color, plate pattern without a brand. Measuring 100 centimeters by 60 centimeters. One cotton towel, green color, measuring 120 
cm by 60 cm with the red and white brand. We also found diplomatis on back and buttocks, published in color, disappear with pressure, stiffness of the locomotive in the jaw joints, right and left upper arm joint, and right and left lower leg joints, and challenging traces. No signs of decay found. On the right and left eye, we found that the mucous membrane of the upper and lower eyelids showed bleeding spots and dilated blood vessels. The transparent membrane of the eyeball looks clear. The rainbow membrane is blackish brown. The complex membrane of the eyeball is white. There are bleeding spots and dilation of blood vessels. The diameter of the eye beads is 4 millimeters. No signs of violence were found. On mouth, we found a white fluid similar to pus around the oral cavity. The mucous membranes of the upper and lower lips appear bluish, gums appear bluish, no signs of violence were found. On the upper and lower extremities, we found the tips of the fingers and nails appear bluish. We found no abnormalities and signs of violence. On the chest, eight centimeters left from uh, the mid front line, seven centimeters below the top of the shoulder, found an open wound of irregular shape. The angle of the wound was absent and the base of the wound was chest muscles. Blackish in color, heart palpation, not tissue beach, with a length of 13 centimeters and 12 centimeters wide. In the area around the wound, rotting skin and muscle tissue was found accompanied by a white pus like fit. On the brain membranes, we found dilated blood vessels. The weight of the cerebrum is 1,200 grams. It measures 18 centimeters long, 18 centimeters wide, and 10 centimeters high. Well, the cerebellum measures 10 centimeters by 8 centimeters, weighing 200 grams. On the membranes of the brain, blood vessels were dilated, no bleeding was found, there were no abnormalities in the pituary, and bleeding spots were found on the slides of the cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem. In the chest cavity, in both lungs, there were additions in the front, which were attached to the chest wall, and additions at the back, which were attached to the back wall. The right lung weighs 450 grams and measures it's 30 centimeters long, 20 centimeters wide, and 8 centimeters height. The consistency is spongy and pale in color with black spots on the surface. For the left lung, weighs 500 grams and measures 25 centimeters long and 20 centimeters wide. The consistency is spongy, black in color with black spots on the surface of the lung. Uh, for the thoracic spine, as you can see at the pictures, the 4th to 12th vertebrae are uh, asymmetrical. For additional examination, we send samples of left lung tissue, left breast tissue, ovarian tissue, and left kidney tissue to the anatomical pathology department. In left lung tissue samples, it appears that some of the pulmonary artery are filled with exceeded fluid and larger blood vessels and congestion in the pulmonary alveolar septa on microscopic examination with 100 times magnification. In left breast tissue sample, so species of tumor tissue arranged in glandularness with 80% tubular formation consisting of proliferating anaplastic epithelial cells with round of nuclei, pleomorphic, narrow cytoplasm. The tumor grows infiltrating into the stroma of the fibrous connective tissue. Metasis 7 per 10 HPF with the conclusion invasive breast carcinoma of no special type infiltrating the carcinoma, not otherwise specified grade 1. In the left ovary and kidney tissue samples, the tissue was authorized and the capillary blood vessels were dilated with a slight inflammatory uh, lymphocytic infiltrate. For discussion, uh, the skin, lung, bone, bone and uh, liver are the most common metastatic target site for breast cancer and the leading cause of cancer deaths among women. Uh, forensic autopsies are required to find the disease process and or 
the presence of injury and the objective was to investigate the cause and manner of death. <coughs> Forensic expert interpreted these findings, explained the cause and looked for causal relationship between the abnormalities found and the cause of death. If during the examination, several types of abnormalities are found together, then a determination of which abnormality is the cause of death and whether other abnormalities have contributed to the end is carried out. The cardinal signs of asphyxia are cyanosis, congestion, and petechial hemorrhage, as we found in this case. Asphyxia is a condition caused by interference with respiration or due to lack of oxygen in inspired air, due to which the organs and tissue are deprived of oxygen, causing unconsciousness or death. The word asphyxia is not commonly used to describe a range of conditions for which the lack of oxygen, whether it is partial or hypoxia or complete or anoxia. The form of anoxia in this case is anoxia anemia, where there is not enough hemoglobin to carry the uh, oxygen. As a conclusion, we reported one case of unwitnessed, unexpected natural death. The estimated time of death was six to eight hours before an external examination of the body was carried out. The case was a female, aged between 55 to 65 years old, body length 150 centimeters, mongoloid race. From external examination and internal examination, it is strongly indicated that the metastatic process of breast cancer causes death. This was also confirmed by analysis of pathology anatomy of the breast, which showed uh, invasive infiltrating ductal sinoma, not otherwise specified, grade one. In this case, the deadly incident was concluded as natural death to malignant process that spreads, causing blockage in the airway, leading to suffocation. Thank you. If there are can hopefully we can meet again in person at another time and opportunity. You can reach me uh, by WhatsApp number or uh, direct message and Instagram. Once again, thank you very much. You are on mute uh, yourself. You are not. Audible. Thank you so much, Dr. Parivida, for a very brilliant and very nice presentation. It was very comprehensive and uh, very useful. Uh, much appreciated. I think we will then uh, proceed on to the next presenter. Um, I think uh, we now have Dr. Mishra uh, online. So Dr. Dilip Mishra is from India, and he's going to be speaking about the role of immunostain in the diagnosis of orbital tumors. So over to yourself, Dr. Mishra. Thank you. I'm audible for you. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, uh, I am Dr. Glip Mishra. I'm audible for you. Yes, Dr. Mishra, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, so my uh, thanks for. Uh, giving me chance or opportunity to participate in the, this uh, valuable uh, conference. So I'm presenting uh, my topic, uh, role of immune stain in the diagnosis of orbital tumors. So uh, first of all, I have no con conflict of interest uh, for this presentation. And my aim of presentation is uh, to the no uh, know the normal anatomy of the orbit, lesions of the orbit, and what are the role of ISC in the diagnosis of orbital lesions. So as you know, the orbit is a compact uh, uh, pyramid-like structure, uh, which is formed by uh, mainly bone, having seven bones, uh, namely frontal bone, spinoid bone, diagonal bone, ethmoid, lacrimal bone, and uh, palatine and maxillary bone. So orbit has uh, spaces uh, that is called conal spaces, intraconal spaces, which is formed by the extraocular muscles and optic nerve. So what are the spaces contains? These uh, uh, space contains, uh, intraconal space contains orbital fat, ophthalmic artery, and cranial nerves second, third, 
and nasociliary nerve uh, sixth and uh, fifth nerve and myofascial cone contains extraocular muscles interconnecting fascia and cranial nerve four where are extra cranial spaces uh, extra cranial spaces this is the space where uh, most of the tumor arises it contains fat lacrimal gland and sac so orbit uh, is a mirror the uh, all the tumors uh, which arises from the other organs of the body these tumors can occur in the orbit and some specialized tumor also occurring in the orbit the term is given orbital tumors like pseudo tumor uh, or nsvid non specific inflammatory orbital tumors approximately 70% of the orbital tumors originate from the orbit itself whereas 30% tumor arises from the adjacent structure or metastasis from the other side so what are the congenital or developmental anomaly in the orbit these are sinusoidal wing dysplasia neurofibromatosis sonoma uh, then uh, plexiform neurofibroma fibrous dysplasia dermoid epidermoidosis hematoma and meningoencephalocele whereas inflammatory and infectious diseases are orbital cellulitis orbital abscess idiopathic orbital inflammatory inflammation that is also called pseudotoma tumor granuloma that is serpied or vaginal granulomatosis tuberculosis and fungal whereas parasitic are cysty sarcosis and hybrid cyst and traumatic are penetrating foreign body uh, hematoma these are the uh, inflammatory infectious diseases whereas neoplastic conditions are rhabdomyosarcoma uh, these are the malignant lesions neuroblastoma uh, or vital uh, uh, retinoblastoma ewing sarcoma lymphoma and metastasis from the other side whereas benign lesions are hemangioma lymphangioma hemangioparasitoma neurofibroma and meningioma so i'm going to uh, my presentation with some uh, interesting cases which i diagnosed uh, in my uh, uh, in institute uh, so case 1 uh, uh, this is the abbreviation used in my uh, this presentation sm means uh, submandibular lymph node roplas means regurgitation on pressure over lacrimal sac area fnsc means fine needle aspiration cytology nld means nasolacrimal duct immunohistochemistry isc and pet ct means uh, positron emission tomography computed tomography so this is the first case uh, 52 uh, year uh, female a homemaker uh, presented with a swelling of the lower eyelid of two month uh, swelling and This was given lacrimal left lacrimal sac tumor with left submandibular lymphadenopathy. So after that incisional biopsy, we got around uh, three into two millimeter size uh, uh, gray uh, brown uh, tissue. And on histopathology, it shows some uh, basophilic area and eosinophilic area. On higher magnification, uh, there is localized basophilic area uh, with eosinophilic area. so on further higher magnification this uh, basophilic area are uh, lymphoid aggregates along with this lymphoid and uh, aggregates and plasma cells there are some foam histiocytes and multinucleate uh, cells which are uh, uh, in, inside the circle so these are the multinucleate giant cells or multinucleated cells along with the uh, lymphoplasmocytic cell infiltrate This, uh, multi, uh, this is the other area of the higher magnification multinucleate cells along with fibrocollagenous tissue this is the fibrocollagenous tissue so on this that which is in lacrimal sac area the three things can uh, happen uh, arises that is chronic dermatitis cystitis so in our case uh, there is no lumen and the, the more uh, 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 the stromal aggregates are lymphoid and fibrocollagenous a tissue along with the some multinucleate cells so this is not chronic dermatitis cystitis then lymphoma uh, it affects the total architecture of the uh, soft tissue invasion of the basophilic round cells so this is the not case of the lymphoma so third is differential is histiocytic uh, disorder so in histiocytic disorder uh, this fits because it contains a uh, basophilic uh, uh, infiltrate along with the uh, fibrous tissue 
At the same time, we got the uh, fine needle excretion cytology of this patient from the sum and liver lymph nodes. We saw monomorphic, uh, sorry, uh, a polymorphous population of the uh, lymphoid cells aggregates with some uh, multinucleated cells. On further higher magnification, these multinucleates are nothing, but they show imperipolysis. So imperipolysis, imperipolysis means uh, phagocytosis of, uh, by the histiocytes uh, uh, to intact cells, the plasma cells and lymphocytes. So this is called imperipolysis. Uh, this is a, a very uh, good uh, uh, cytological image of the imperipolysis. So coming to the, our case, uh, S100 was done. Uh, we saw uh, very uh, highlighted uh, uh, highlighted the imperipolysis. Uh, these are the imperipolysis area. On further higher magnification, uh, we we are able to we can see that uh, imperipolysis uh, macrophages or histiocytes engulf the intact plasma cells. And this is CD68. Uh, we saw uh, some histiocytes in the background of lymphocytes and plasma cells. CD1A is negative because uh, Langerhans uh, histiocytosis is or eosinophilic granuloma is one of the differential diagnoses of this disease. So CD1A is negative, and uh, uh, IgG4 showing some uh, scattered uh, plasma cells, and this IgG is uh, 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 dense positivity uh, in plasma cells. So in, um, in my case, lymphocyte uh, predominant lesion with histiocytes. There is imperipolysis. Uh, CD68 expressed, CD1A was uh, negative, and IgG4 uh, IgG ratio was only 2%. So this is not a IgG4 disease. So uh, S100 is po also positive. This confirms that this is Rosai Dorfman disease of the lacrimal la 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 sac area. So in orbit, uh, the sinus histocytic with massive lymph endopathy is very less. In TT, it occurs uh, 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 around 5%. Uh, most common uh, organ is skin after that lymph node. So there are very few literature uh, which shows uh, that our vital or adnexal structure uh, involvement with Rosai Dorfman disease. So this case uh, highlights the uh, Rosai Dorfman disease. Now my second case is three-year-old uh, uh, boy with protrusion of left eye since one month. Uh, that mass was painless, acute onset, rapid progression, antecedent history of rhinitis, no history of trauma, fever, weight loss, or malaise no significant medical alignment or surgical intervention done. A birth uh, history was also uneventful. Uh, other uh, history are uh, uh, not significant. And uh, on uh, clinical examination, mass was, uh, the patient has axial proposis, firm on retropulsion, and uh, extra ocular movement uh, is limited in all gazes. There is, on CT finding, there is a mass uh, extending from the uh, eyeball to the uh, uh, optic canal and extending to the apex of the orbit. So this is the other cut view of the swimming uh, or vital involvement with the uh, well-defined mass. So the, on that basis, uh, CTS can click on finding uh, the uh, differential diagnosis was made neuroblastoma, lymphangioma, rhabdomyosarcoma, chloroma, living sarcoma, and PNET. Other investigation also done, uh, uh, complete blood picture, uh, which was uh, with a normal limit. Bone marrow spread was negative for atypical cells or leukemia. CSF cytology was also negative, incision biopsy. So in, in incision biopsy, we are able to see round cells along with the, there is, uh, they are arranged around the blood vessels and background has eosinophilic uh, staining. So these are the uh, blood vessels, around the blood vessel lumen, uh, these cells are arranged. So that is called hemangioendotheliomatous uh, uh, arrangement of the cells and their eosinophilic body deposits. These eosinophilic body deposits are uh, strongly pass positive or per iodic acid diastase positive, resistant positive. So these are the, uh, some deposits uh, in, inside the tumor cells, uh, which is intracellular or extracellular. So on that basis, uh, the round cell uh, lesion was given a provisional diagnosis and uh, rhabdomyosarcoma for ruling out the rhabdomyosarcoma myod1 and desmin was done which is negative so uh, that rules out rhabdomyosarcoma chloroma that uh, mpo was negative uh, so chloroma is also rule out then evening sarcoma uh, fly1 and nkx2.2 was negative so that also rule out uh, that lymphangioma at architecture is not showing the lymphangiomatous so that also rule out the lymphangioma and neuroblastoma for ruling uh, cyanotoxin and chromagranin was done. That is also negative. So also that rules out. 
so what the next so this uh, tumor is uh, pan cytokeratin positive and it also highlight the there is a lumen uh, the cells are arranged around the lumen and K, uh, cell uh, 4 uh, protein is uh, uh, strongly nuclear positive in the tumor cell cell 4 uh, uh, protein uh, which uh, uh, helps in embryogenesis uh, uh, of the uh, fetus or human k67 was very high so on that basis, malignant left or vital yolk set tumor uh, involving the sinuses was given to know the whether it is primarily or metastatic. Uh, uh, we did a PET CT scan in which a left sinovital lesion was seen, and the patient has serum alpha beta protein was very much high, and serum beta G was uh, normal. So this is the final diagnosis: malignant left primary or vital yolk set tumor with involvement of sinuses was made. The patient was uh, given chemotherapy. So this is the uh, uh, before and after chemotherapy uh, uh, image, clinical image showing uh, uh, improvement in the uh, patient's proptosis. And CT scan finding also shows uh, improvement in the tumor size. After the treatment, uh, serum alpha beta protein comes to the normal and whole body PET CT was also normal. So primary uh, yolk set tumor uh, is very rare entity. We already published this article in 2016 and the serum alpha beta protein uh, is the diagnostic and uh, marker and posting a marker for that uh, uh, tumor. And uh, this tumor has good prognosis. So uh, this tumor occurs mainly in uh, female, more uh, predominance uh, and mean duration at presentation is two weeks. Uh, extension beyond the orbit and into the surrounding structure was seen in 50% of cases. Initial histopathological misdiagnosis because this tumor is very rare in orbit. So it is misdiagnosed. Most of the cases misdiagnosed. And this case was also misdiagnosed uh, initially from other center, uh, which is uh, referred to in our institute. And uh, the, uh, it was diagnosed as hemangio endothelioma uh, without the IAC. And uh, raised serum alpha beta, uh, alpha beta protein levels useful for diagnosis, prognosis, and management of this tumor. If time allows, then I will uh, go to the case three. Um, yes, you have some time, Dr. Mishra. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, so this is a nine-year-old female uh, uh, with history of uh, uh, mild uh, trauma with, while playing with uh, her brother. His head uh, hit near uh, right eye and reduction of vision in right eye after that injury. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, case was uh, we uh, uh, got in post-COVID after the COVID uh, era. Uh, that means uh, last year, 2021. Uh, in which second wave in India that was very much uh, high. So this is the post uh, COVID infection. The patient has COVID infection, and her near vision was uh, 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 loss of uh, that is not good. By snails uh, chart and on gross uh, there was axial prosthesis with inferior dystopia. And the CT scan of different cuts showing this mass extending from the uh, inferior inferior uh, lateral to or vital area. So on that basis, uh, clinical basis, evening sarcoma, peanut, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, lymph lymphoproliferative disease was made and incision biopsy was done. So this is the incision biopsy showing uh, small cells, blue round cells. On further high magnification, these round cells are monotonous and monomorphic population and with high cellularity. This uh, round cells have uh, uniform uh, nuclei with uh, uh, prominent nucleoli. And these uh, are the atrophic SNI, lacrimal gland SNI. So these tumor cells are arranged around the lacrimal uh, gland area. This is the uh, crust artifact of the tumors in other area. Uh, there is dictum if you get a crust, more crust artifact, then chances of uh, malignancy is very high. So uh, if you get uh, any uh, tumor having cross artifact, then you must confirm with the ISC immunostochemistry. So this tumor is uh, very aggressive and uh, uh, having cross artifact in other field. So bone is also uh, involved with the tumor cells. A round cell neoplasm is given and advised addendum report to follow on ISC immunostochemistry and systemic workup was advised. Meanwhile, uh, the patient uh, uh, a bone marrow aspiration was done, uh, which shows only erythroid hyperplasia. There is no uh, leukemic deposit uh, in initial uh, bone marrow aspiration. And other uh, uh, immunostochemistry, cytokeratin, CD34, CD20, MPO, desmin, myo D1, 
all these IAC investor chemistry markers are uh, negative for in this patient. K67 uh, was very high, almost 90%. Most of the cells has taken K67, that is proliferation index. CD45 was a uh, very faint expression in the tumor cells. CD90 was strongly positive, CD99. Then uh, FLY1 is also showing uh, some positivity, uh, faint positivity in the nuclear uh, uh, nucleus of the tumor cells. Y19 was strongly positive. CD3 was uh, positive. And TDT is a strong, very strong positive. So this case was positive for the uh, TDT. Uh, CD99, uh, then uh, FLY1. So on the left, uh, was made uh, T cell uh, because CD3 is positive. Uh, so this diagnosis was made uh, T cell acute and that bone marrow biopsy was advised. Uh, bone marrow uh, biopsy shows uh, the tumor cell infiltrates. So the final diagnosis was acute lymphoblastic leukemia was made. So take home message from my uh, uh, presentation is orbit is a compact organ and arises from the orbit, uh, whether it is metastatic tumor, uh, metastatic deposit or primary tumors. The tumors of the orbit on histopathology primarily uh, categorized on round cell or spindle cell tumor or a mixture of two without immune stain. It is impossible to uh, cytokeratin, uh, myeloperoxidase, CD99, CD45, desmin, and uh, proliferative index ga 67 Thank you. And thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, in this conference. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. That was indeed an excellent presentation and uh, very beautiful images and uh, you know uh, very comprehensive. Thank you so much. Um, since we have a couple of minutes before our next speaker is due to start, I'd like to open up uh, for any questions from the um, audience. You could either type in your questions to the chat and we could try and answer that, um, or you could ask as well. I'm not seeing any questions coming through the chat. Okay, I'll just give a couple of another minute or so. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So I don't see any any questions. Um, sorry, was there any question? If there was a question, we are not able to hear you very well. Could you uh, speak a bit louder, please? Thank you once again, Dr. Mishra. That was really an excellent presentation. I think the audience are also sharing that they really liked your, um, you know, clear pictures and a very comprehensive presentation. I don't see any further questions coming in from the audience. Thank you so much once again, and we'll move on to the next speaker for the for the day. Uh, I'd like to now invite Dr. Satish Panchal and Dr. Mr. Tejo Thomas from India um, to start their presentation if um, they are ready now. Dr. Panchal yeah. and um, Dr. Mr. Thomas, please. Yeah, so shall I share my screen? Sure, yes, please, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning. I'm Satish Panchal. I'll be presenting a topic on application of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies in toxicologic pathology. This presentation will be jointly presented by Mr. Tejo Thomas and myself. Mr. Tejo Thomas is head software development at Aerometrics in India. And myself, I'm a toxicologist and pathologist by qualification. 
working for Sun Pharma Advanced Research Company Limited in India. So just to set a background on toxicologic pathology. So what is toxicologic pathology? It's a biomedical specialty that integrates the study of poison, that is a science of toxicology, and the study of disease, that is a science of pathology. So in any drug discovery program, the toxicologic pathology plays a significant role uh, while conducting the toxicology studies in laboratory animal species. Toxicologic pathology is also used for predicting human and animal responses to drug chemicals, over-the-counter herbal products and therapeutic devices, food additives, and genetically modified foods. Toxicologic pathology studies adverse and environmental exposure responses in aquatic organisms, domesticated and wild animals, humans, and uh, laboratory animal species. Pathology also helps in identifying the injuries at cellular, subcellular, and molecular level. What is the role of toxicologic pathologists? What, what the significant contribution is done by toxicologic pathologists in drug discovery setting? So toxicologic pathologists, basically they help to identify efficacious and toxic effects of a new drugs by histological analysis of tissues and organs from various laboratory animal species like rat, mouse, rabbit, guinea pig, hamster, beagle dog, cyanomolgus monkey, etc. Pathologists also help determining the no adverse effect level and that will be used by clinician for starting the clinical trials in humans. Toxicologic pathologists also peer review the histological findings just to solidify or enhance the scientific accuracy and quality of findings done by the study pathologist. So there is a study pathologist and study pathologist findings are being reviewed by peer review pathologist just to make sure that patholo study pathologist findings are accurate. And toxicologic pathologists also help to determine whether the compounds should be pursued or terminated based on the safety and efficacy data generated while conducting number of toxicology studies in various laboratory animal species. Toxicologic pathologist has a daunting task to perform by reviewing number of slides per toxicological study using microscope. And depending on the duration and type of toxicology study, there can be 2,000 to 5,000 slides per study, which is really time intensive and which looks at the drug discovery process. So how the digital pathology plays a role in toxicologic pathology. As a drug discovery process, as we all know, it's a very long and time consuming process. It takes almost 10 years for any drug to come to the market. So digital pathology would help reducing the time by hastening the drug discovery process. The digital pathology will help uh, generating the whole slide images. And that is a heart of the scanning is to be done for the glass slide and scanning is the heart of digitization of toxicology pathology domain. And currently available technologies are capable of producing images that compare with the quality of uh, viewing quality of microscope. So it is a primary requirement that the images generated using a scanner should be have a viewing quality equivalent to that of microscope. Digital pathology will also help in work automation. So currently the toxicologic pathologies, they uh, have a manual work process and uh, we, the digital pathology will also help by providing the software solution and that will reduce the load of pathologist. With digital pathology, uh, slide reading can be done while viewing over the desktop or web-based platform. So it can be done anywhere uh, it would need just a laptop and internet connectivity with view, a good viewer. It will also help annotating and quantifying tools. So pathologists while reviewing the slide would like to annotate what are the changes, what is the severity, where is the distribution. So annotation can be done. At the same time, the software solutions developed can also help in quantifying the histological findings. It will also have a provision to compare the images by keeping the images side by side in a viewer. And that will also even help training the junior pathologist. The software solutions will also help for organizing, searching and sorting up the images, depending on the type of lesion, organ involved, severity of uh, lesions. And uh, 
there is a paradigm change in the work process by digital pathology. So it will potentially reduce the cost of pathologies, travel, as well as slides shipping. So if study is done in a one city and if is to be slides are to be examined by a pathology sitting uh, in another country that can be done by the digitization. So currently the pathologist has to travel to a distant place for viewing the slides or slides are to be shipped to the pathologist's place. And during this process, there are chances that slide may get damaged during the transportation. So digitalization would reduce all those uncertainties. And with the digitization, the quantitative assessment can be done from what currently is practiced that is semi-quantitative or qualitative assessment. And that will also help standardize pathology or training for consistency of interpretation. During the routine toxicology pathology evaluation, there are several challenges faced by the pathologist when whole slide images do not always offer the best viewing quality due to artifacts and staining issues. So we all pathologists understand that during the slide preparation, number of artifacts that are being generated during the process. Second challenge is the whole slide image is in a, a gigabyte. That means if we have more number of slides per study, then it would generate a data in pentabytes. And that will lead to uh, storage and management related issues. So digitization would help uh, solving these issues. There are also practices around the placement of tissues which are not uniform and not standardized across the lab. And every lab would have their own protocol and SOP of placing the tissues and type of tissues to be kept in a slide. So sorting and searching them, then it becomes a conversion. And the quantitative assessment of lesion is challenging in absence of appropriate tools and technologies. So these are the challenges that pathologists face. And uh, later on, the application of current tissue evaluation strategies, which are suited for microscopic examination, does not really yield the full potential of digital pathology. So there are several challenges being faced by toxicologic pathologists during the drug discovery process. And uh, we are working in collaboration with the aromatics who are developing a several software solutions to support the toxicologic pathologies for slowing the drug discovery process. So with this, I would like to hand over it to Mr. Tijo Thomas, who is from Aeromatrix. Uh, Tijo, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, Satish, you may have to um, stop sharing uh, so I can share my screen. So let me uh, present my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we are able to. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dr. Sadesh, uh, for setting the context. Uh, for presenting the uh, digital pathology workflow solutions uh, that will help address uh, the challenges in uh, uh, digitization for toxicologic pathology using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, so Sadish so uh, kind of uh, towards end of his uh, talk outlined the challenges connected with uh, adopting uh, digital pathology in the toxicologic pathology area. And these challenges are not just for uh, toxicologic pathology, and I'm thinking it's gonna be applicable to uh, uh, any uh, pathology, and, uh, pathology areas, uh, the research side, the oncology, um, uh, and, and hence the solutions or uh, you know, the ways and means to address those challenges are also going to be uh, equally applicable to uh, all the uh, major areas where digital pathology is getting adopted. Um, so we discussed about uh, 
um, you know, one of the challenge being the quality of the whole slide images that are getting produced. Right? And then, um, so that uh, why for viewing and making observations or for running some analysis algorithm on it, and both ways that pose certain challenges. Um, if the slide or the slide image is of not good quality. So one of the major component in that sense in the digital work pathology workflow solution is a quality assurance solution. So we'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, and then uh, comes the identification and quantification type solution. And these are uh, software solutions, AI-based solutions to uh, identify tissues. So especially in the preclinical uh, context, in the toxicologic studies, um, the slides that come from animals. Um, so their tissues are distributed uh, in, let's say there are 50 tissues and they are getting into like 20 to 25 slides, which means that a slide will have more than one type of tissue. So it's important um, that uh, an automation type uh, scenario playing a role there to figure out uh, what kind of um, tissue are there in a slide. Then of course, the most popular among um, the AI-based uh, solutions are the image analysis solutions that can segment, that can classify, that can detect uh, lesions in the tissue. Of course, uh, uh, there are image management systems, the viewers and um, uh, management of images uh, that help uh, sorting and uh, creating the right kind of viewing experience for the pathologist. Of course, that's not an AAML one, but yeah, I thought it, for the sake of completeness, I'll put that to here. Now, the artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies are there to increase the potential of digital pathology workflow solutions. And um, the couple of solutions that I covered, the quality assurance or identification and quantification pieces are, uh, I'm calling them inbound solutions that bring efficiency to digitization, that put uh, cost, time and reward, or create metadata a tag for the slides. So to give you an example, so um, in this image here, what you see on the bottom is a data lake solution, like an image repository. So some of the clients at Iramatrix that we have, we came across uh, organizations with a huge amount of digital data, whole slide images. Now, in such a scenario, to get to the right image, or even without even uh, viewing the whole uh, image, the whole image is like a 50K by 50K kind of an image. So it's a huge image. It takes time to actually go through it. Um, if there are AI-based solutions that can run on these images and give certain understanding beforehand, and that's what our inbound solutions are gonna do. So uh, an analysis server will run on it and then uh, attach certain information, metadata to the um, whole slide images that are in the data lake, um, which then, uh, you know, again, can be uh, used for uh, analysis, like segmenting, classifying, and detecting uh, to deliver the digitization benefits to the pathologist. So I'm going to these pieces, uh, the components of the digital pathology solutions in some detail to start with, uh, the quality assurance solutions um, are those which prepares the image to fit with pathologist work process. Now, what it does, it does the tags images with uh, image quality metadata descriptors, like it identifies artifacts, even quantify them, and it tells the pathologist that okay, this image has, let's say, you know, um, twenty percentage uh, part of it is blurred. So further, uh, yeah, it can define quantify artifacts to uh, even uh, suggest an automated rescan. Uh, the other thing that it can also do is uh, normalize the stain and then 
um, I don't have to tell the pathology community about uh, uh, the stain variation that exists in the industry, the lab to lab, batch to batch, study to study. So, um, and then uh, for you to view or for it, an algorithm to work, um, you need to have some kind of consistency. So there we have an algorithm to make a new image adopt the uh, ideal staining conditions, uh, at least in a virtual manner. So uh, uh, this is uh, what we got in terms of quality assurance uh, solution. And uh, in terms of the uh, kind of uh, algorithms that we have uh, at Ira Matrix, uh, Ira Matrix is an organization that uh, uh, develops uh, AI ML uh, solutions for uh, uh, pathology area, both for biopharma and for the hospitals. So I kind of listed down the type of uh, things that we handle uh, in the quality side, the fall, the wrinkle, the curling, um, uneven stain, acidophilia, formalin pigment, stain deposit, crust, tear, knife mark, chatter, split. So these are the kind of stuff that we handle. And then um, we also have, as I said, uh, uh, analysis algorithm that will uh, standardize outputs from multiple uh, sources of images. And then we even published a paper. Uh, the table here provides the kind of performance numbers that we have on um, you know, our solution. Now, those were the pre-processing or the inbound type solutions. Um, and now uh, let me again uh, talk about one more of that, which is the identification and quantification module. Now, what it essentially does is uh, it identifies the uh, tissues in the slide and mark it. So, you know, again, if you consider a scenario where you have uh, quite a lot of images, um, I'm talking about petabytes of data. And if you want to kind of, you know, search for your right image, just, uh, you know, you want a heart of a, um, uh, let's say a rat, right? And then, yeah, so, you know, this is a solution that facilitates that. I have, of course, uh, again, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of performance, of the current algorithm that's uh, given here. Uh, we have uh, uh, validated this in on about uh, uh, 989 uh, whole slide images, and we got a performance of 92 percentage. Coming to the next set, uh, which are the image analysis solutions. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few examples. Now, the the two types of stuff that we have seen, the quality uh, assessment type algorithms um, or the stain adjustment type algorithms, they're common to anything, to any domain. You can uh, apply that to a biopsy image, to uh, image from an efficacy study, uh, toxicology study, uh, anything. But then when it comes to image analysis solution, they're going to be specific. So I am. Uh, I thought, in uh, you know, it may be interesting um, to uh, see some such examples. Um, uh, but then um, the ones that I'm presenting are uh, in the uh, toxicology area. So let me show you a few examples very quickly. So uh, at a very basic level, all these algorithms, the image analysis algorithms, they are all about either quantifying or, or uh, classifying uh, or at a basic level detecting some type of a lesion, some type of a feature in a whole slide image. Now, one such example is uh, hepatic fibrosis estimation. So the liver fibrosis. Um, so a conventional way of um, doing uh, or estimating uh, liver fibrosis was uh, uh, using PIS stain. But of course, when it uh, was done using a microscope, it is at the best done in a semi-quantitative manner. So we have uh, 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 developed an algorithm 
uh, that can uh, automate that process. So as you can see the table here, um, uh, the algorithm that uh, we have developed for quantifying fibrosis uh, in uh, uh, liver of rat uh, on uh, picro series red stained images, we got a sensitivity of uh, 86 percentage and specificity of 85 percentage. And we then undertook a more challenging problem, a problem of uh, uh, estimating that in uh, H and D images. And again, uh, two things. One, we got a very high concordance, a PHM coefficient of 0.93 with uh, uh, because series red images. And then uh, when pathologists validated it uh, against the ground truth, uh, we got a sensitivity of, sensitivity of uh, 97 percentage and uh, specificity of 90 percentage. Uh, and, and this work is also published. Um, something similar, um, this is about, uh, you know, uh, quantifying, identifying and quantifying hepatocellular hypertrophy in liver. Uh, so this algorithm, um, you know, again, it's one of the um, algorithm that we took time to develop, but then the results are good. As you can see in the table, um, we have a sensitivity of uh, 87 percentage. Uh, on an average, uh, we are at the area of about 90 to find out uh, the mild, moderate or severe cases of um, uh, hypertrophy in liver. Uh, going ahead with uh, the uh, fatty change uh, quantification, the hepatic steatosis uh, estimation in liver. So this is another uh, piece of algorithm that we have done, uh, something uh, that we published too. Um, we have a very good uh, sensitivity of 85 percentage in estimating the uh, vaculation in liver, and uh, we got a precision of 98 percentage. So another uh, interesting work that we are doing um, is uh, um, automating and creating image analysis algorithm for uh, enhanced histopathology of immune system. Now, the, um, some of the work uh, that we came across establishes uh, the use of even um, you know identifying and identifying normal features in uh, immune organs such as spleen, thymus, uh, the lymph nodes, uh, uh, and in uh, bone marrow. Uh, and then you know comparing those uh, quantities with uh, that of uh, control slides. So, so we have uh, taken uh, that type of a work and then um, uh, you know in this case uh, what you're seeing is the results that uh, we have got on spleen. So what we have done is we have uh, looked at the germinal centers, the marginal zone, the white pulp, the red pulp pigmentation. So we identified them and quantified them. So yeah, so this is uh, uh, you know uh, something in the area of uh, uh, immunotoxicology. Um, another word that I thought of uh, talking to you about today is the spermatogenic staging assessment in rodents. So indeed, uh, this type of a work uh, we have done for a couple of different species. Um, what you're seeing is uh, the uh, testicular uh, section from a Vista rat. And the algorithm essentially uh, segments out the tubules uh, from that section and then uh, classify uh, the tubules into one among one to 14 stages of uh, spermatogenic maturity. Now, this is uh, interesting uh, primarily because this is one of the difficult tasks uh, for a toxicologic pathologist, because we're talking about uh, in a rat section, for example, you will have about some, uh, you know, somewhere between 800 to 1000 tubules uh, and then going through them. And then again, you need some uh, amount of um, 
training to really um, assess this. Um, most of the time, the tubules look uh, pretty similar. Um, you know, the the position or the uh, clustering or, or the size and shape of some of the gem cells decide the stage. Now, this problem that uh, typically is probably in a physical sense, if a pathologist looked at it, it would take about a day, a couple of days to do this for a section, and that algorithm can do in a matter of, let's say, about 20 minutes. <clears throat> so, so this uh, uh, we have uh, published in um, um, in the uh, Toxicologic Pathology Journal. Yeah, so the algorithm, uh, you know, creates something uh, like a stage frequency map. <clears throat> it compares the uh, uh, performance or the stage frequencies in a test animal with that of a control animal. Similarly, um, there is uh, another algorithm um, uh, that is on the female side, uh, on the female reproductive organ. Uh, we have an algorithm for um, assessing the phase of the cycle. And again, the performance uh, here also is uh, pretty good. Um, uh, we have uh, algorithms for uh, uh, enumerating the ovarian follicles and rodents. Um, as, an, as you can see in the table here, uh, we have a very good performance. Um, uh, our sensitivity is uh, almost at uh, 93, 95 percentage and uh, precision is quite high too. Um, so what it does is uh, it identifies the follicles and it uh, uh, you know, classifies them into either uh, primordial type one, prime model type two or growing follicle. Uh, another one from our deck, uh, which is uh, cardiomyopathy severity scoring in rodents. Um, this algorithm uh, looks for, I mean, identifies uh, and classifies uh, the lesions like fibrosis and necrosis, mononuclear cells and mineralization. And uh, based on that, uh, based on the quantities of this, are I set a score for the section? In a similar manner, uh, we have an algorithm uh, that uh, identifies, uh, quantifies uh, fibrosis uh, in uh, uh, lungs. Um, uh, this work is also something that we have published. And then, uh, as you can see in the table, um, this also has a very good performance. Yeah, I mean, uh, while there are many uh, in the, um, uh, and then the possibilities of algorithms that will help uh, quantify or classify lesions um, in the um, pathology images are like, uh, I'm thinking that it's unlimited. There are many such uh, possibilities, and uh, and at our company at Iramatics, we attempted a few on the rodent side, and of course uh, we have um, just as a information, uh, we also have a lot of that uh, going on in the uh, prostate cancer, uh, lung carcinoma, GI side uh, as well. So, uh, in the context of the uh, topic that uh, uh, we're presenting. Um, these are the few things, uh, the AAML uh, solutions in the uh, preclinical side of things, in the toxicology study side of things, are the ones that I presented. I think I have a few more minutes, so I will quickly want to show you a few uh, algorithms. I have a few demo videos. Let me just take you through that before I uh, uh, finish. So uh, let me start with a quality assurance module. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yes, we are able to, Mr. Thomas, um, but yep. we don't have too much of time. So if you could finish in the next two or three minutes, that would be appreciated. Thank you. All right, sure. All right, so um, so this is, uh, um, you know, the uh, artifact detection quality assessment module. 
here uh, what you're looking at is uh, you know different artifacts getting automatically uh, identified by the algorithm and uh, let me quickly show you something from the uh, hepatic to toxicity so the different uh, lesions in the uh, liver section of rat uh, that gets detected by this algorithm and uh, that gets automatically annotated quantified so so you have for example uh, the kind of lesions that are identified are microgranuloma uh, emh the vacuolation uh, the single cell necrosis and hypertrophy um, so i spoke about uh, this um, here uh, what we are seeing is the result of uh, spermatogenic staging algorithm in which uh, the tubules of the testicular section gets um, uh, identified and then they are you know, classified in the one among one to 14 stages of spermatogenesis. Um, the next in line is uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. Again, uh, uh, here, uh, as I have explained in my slides, mineralization, mononuclear cells, fibrosis, and necrosis um, gets identified by the algorithm. It gets automatically annotated, quantified, uh, and uh, you know, there will be a score attached to the heart section. Uh, I think this is going to be the last one, uh, wherein uh, the enhanced histopathology of uh, spleen gets assessed. So the vipal, pretpal, marginal zone, lymphocytes, and germinal center of the spleen uh, gets uh, identified by the algorithm and then uh, a quantified too. All right. So uh, these are the kind of things that we wanted to present today. Uh, and, and thank you. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Panchal and Dr. Mr. Thomas. Um, I'm afraid we do not have you running over by a little. So we okay. will not have um, you know, the opportunity to ask for any Q&As. But uh, please do have any questions that are, if the team has, and we could try and address it if we do get some time before lunch. Um, but thank you. That was a very interesting and very um, comprehensive presentation. Much appreciated. We would now want to move on to our next presenter for the day, uh, Ms. Bridget Muller from Germany. We'd like to invite her to proceed with her presentation. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me right? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. That's perfect. Then I think I will go to share my screen so that you can also see what I'm talking about. Yes, we can yes. see you as well, thank you. That is perfect. So I hope you had a very good day up until now and a good start into this conference. Um, very interesting topics as far as I've seen already. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is also in the digital sphere, however, a quite different topic actually. So we are going to talk about how to digitize microscopy in the first place and how to digitize workflows. And um, yeah, my name is Birgit Müller, as uh, presented. I am the chief commercial officer at PressyPoint. PressyPoint is a company in the field of yeah, digital microscopy from Germany. And uh, we are talking today about whether we should digitize the digital, whether we should consider digitizing the intraoperative analyses as a very special subset. Um, I will give you a very brief agenda of what it is that I want to talk about. Um, firstly, I want to give you a bit more of an overview of who Pressy Point is. And then we look into different pathology use cases, which you all are very familiar with. Um, and then uh, why should we not uh, scan in every case? And then what is digital life microscopy? Um, so Pressy Point uh, microscopes were built with a technology by Mr. Müller, who is actually not related to me. Müller is just a very common name here. <laughs> um, and he started in the 1980s with uh, XY stages that are automated. And we then started building probably 10 years ago, 
um, digital microscopes for life science. And what you can see in the screen is the models that we have so far with the newest edition, the IOMATE being for surgical pathology. Um, so what it is that, that we really work on and that is very close to our heart at Pressy Point is understanding the entire workflow and building solutions in a way that they actually fit to what it is that you're doing. Which is why it is so important for me to discuss today that there's different use cases. Because each of these use cases impacts how you digitize in the end. So one of the big research uh, use cases that we have is, is research, right? So um, that's definitely also the part that is most analyzed. Then education definitely is a, is a second pillar of, of use cases that you definitely see in pathology, um, which is, on the other hand, I think, compared to, to research, a little bit under-digitized um, today, even though I think it's a very interesting case as well to start looking into the exact same picture in teaching. Uh, and then the third case, that's the one that we want to talk about today, is diagnostics. So that's really digitization on a routine workflow base. Main um, sub-use cases. You have surgical pathology, so that is intraoperative procedures of all kinds. Could be Routine workflow based on formalin fixed paraffin embedded slides, for example, when you have histology. Um, so that's then really where you do the concrete analyses of a case and the concrete diagnostics. What I want to stick to today is how to digitize surgical pathology. So those time pressure intraoperative analyses that you do. Um, now, let me take one more step back to why am I actually saying that there is different use cases and why am I saying that it does make sense to think about these use cases. Um, when you look from a process perspective on the digitization, there's different components that affect your process or characterize your process. There is a speed component to the process. A surgical pathology process definitely requires a higher speed to get to the analysis or to the, to the diagnosis than um, a routine pathology um, setting. Then the throughput also makes a big difference. In a surgical pathology setting, you would usually have a significantly lower throughput than you have throughout the day, the day in routine diagnostics. The type of analysis is also different. In, in a surgical pathology, it's usually a relatively quick analysis. You don't have IHC stainings and you know five different kinds of stainings. Usually you have to live with one kind. Um, and the location of the pathologist or of the, the analysis is in some cases also different. It makes a difference whether you are sitting comfortably in your office or whether the um, pathologist has to go down to the lab to do the frozen section there and then quickly do the analysis in the, uh, in the lab. Um, so all of these process uh, characteristics challenge the, sa the, the sample handling and therefore might require digitization to be thought uh, through in a different uh, location gap that you would have um, that analog, for example, cannot support. But on the other hand, you need to think about speed requirements such as uh, and just as well as throughput requirements. And then you, of course, also have the sample type that affects the entire process and the entire workflow. Um, in a frozen section, the sample is significantly rougher than it is in an FFPE sample. That is something that has to be considered for digitization as well, because 
of course, the digitization quality is affected by the quality of the sample. This is definitely where, when you look at it from an analog perspective, where an analog microscope has an edge, because the analog microscope is very versatile and you can very, very quickly adjust to different situations that you're in and different sample qualities. This is where scanning and, and digital solutions need a little bit of a help to get adjusted to that. Um, so let me go a little bit deeper into you know, the impact of the sample preparation and the sample quality. So an FFPE sample, which is the usual case in, in clinical pathology, is a very well prepared sample that is relatively even. It's a German autobahn, so to say. Whereas um, the frozen section, for example, or also a smear from a fine needle aspiration, for example, is usually you know, a little bit more of a bumpy road. There's ups and downs in the topography of the slide, which can make it a little bit harder when you look at it both analogously as well as digitally. So the German Autobahn is designed for fast cars, right? Everybody knows that there's no speed limit in German highways. Um, that's also what basically high throughput scanners are made for. So they are made for an autobahn. They're made for a really flat slide. Then they can go really fast and they can scan really fast. A scanner, however, is troubling a little bit on a bumpy road. You would not go with a you know, sports car onto the, the off-road. That's not going to work out well. So you need a slightly different car. You need more of an SUV kind of thing. And um, this is then the speed component that I talked about in the entire process. And this picture is the main reason why I am arguing that it doesn't make sense to look into scanning intraoperative slides, because we need to acknowledge that the quality of an intraoperative slide is more the bumpy road than it is the highway. And it doesn't make sense to have your sports car go on a bumpy road. Um, so now you could as well argue that the analog microscope has an edge there because, as mentioned before, an analog microscope doesn't really care. Um, but in my view, there is a few use cases and why I would argue that the analog microscope does not have an advantage everywhere. And now let me look into why I'm saying that. The answer is simply put an evolutionary one. Um, an analog microscope has been around for ages. Yeah, it has changed. There's been adaptations to it. Um, but in principle, it's been there for a while. Then there was a next step in this evolution that is adding a camera on top, adding, for example, a motorized stage um, so that you can actually, you know, steer the sample and look at that. From, from afar, from remote as well. And then also adding an automated nose piece in order for you to change the objective that you're seeing a sample through. And what I'm going to advocate for today is the next step of the evolution. That is a digital life microscope. That has basically the features of an analog microscope with a camera, with a motorized stage, with functionality to zoom yourself through and to adjust the focus, and at the same time then brings an innovation to it, and that is the bigger field of view. Whereas in an analog microscope with a camera, the field of view is restricted to a very small field of view that you would see in the objective currently. Uh, a digital live microscope, basically instant stitches a higher field of view um, so that you actually can see the architecture of the sample even larger, which for me and in, in, in our understanding is a very big advantage, especially when it comes to surgical pathology. So now let me take the other side on, you know, why is a digital live microscope better suited for surgical pathology than scanning is? There's a lot of reasons why scanning doesn't really work on these samples, as mentioned before. Um, firstly, it introduces an extra step 
in the relatively short um, workflow that you have in an intraoperative procedure. Usually the entire procedure shouldn't take longer than 20 minutes at best, maybe it's sometimes 45 minutes, um, but it should definitely not take a lot longer, otherwise it doesn't really make sense. Um, so if you want to scan, that's of course an additional workflow that you don't necessarily need. Then the time, as said, is also longer. Um, you can of course go on the bumpy road with your sports car, but you're not gonna be driving very fast in order not to ruin it. And that's the same with the frozen section. Yes, a frozen section sample can be scanned, but it will take longer time. Let me show you that here. So the scanning time of an uneven sample is probably between three to 12 minutes, depending on how uneven the sample really is. Compared to an even sample where the scanning time is in best case a minute, maybe it's three minutes if it takes a little longer. If you add that all up to you know, a usual case, because in most cases of an intraoperative procedure is not just one slide, but it's sometimes three, um, maybe even four slides. If you then multiply the time, that would mean that the scanning of, frozen, of one frozen section case could lead or could take up to 45 minutes. And that's only the scanning. So that disregards the fact that you would also have to prepare the sample. You would also have to analyze after. So the entire procedure takes minimum an hour, um, which in my view um, is definitely not what we, we should be aiming for. Um, the scanning time of an entire case when it's well prepared is a little bit more practical. And from that perspective, I'm not advocating generally against scanning, don't get me wrong on that. On a clinical perspective, when you have FFPE slides, scanning is definitely the way to go for when it's about digitization. However, in an intraoperative setting with quick prepared slides, scanning is not the option. And as a fourth reason for why you shouldn't do it is that there have been plenty of studies on the error rate of um, scanning with different sample types. Whereas the error rate of a FFPE slide with a good quality is usually under 5%, the error rate for badly prepared slides or quickly prepared slides um, is between 10 and 20%, which could mean that every fifth slide that you have um, you have to rescan, which of course takes time again into a process where you don't have time. Then, of course, in a lot of countries, the regulation also doesn't really allow or doesn't make it easy for you to actually use scanners for intraoperative procedures, because also some of the regulators understand that this is very, very difficult to do and it doesn't really create the best quality and the, the best uh, service for the surgeons. And then as a sixth case, if you want to do um, the, the analysis of intraoperative samples digitally remote, that would require you if you scan it to send these samples somewhere. And this is in a lot of cases, a hefty task for your IT, because not only do you have to have a quite good bandwidth, you also need to have quite some upload, um, you know, Mbit and upload uh, space in order to be able to do that. Because, you know, one case with three slides could actually easily be three gigabytes. Um, and that a lot of the internet connections actually don't allow you to so easily do that you don't lose time, you don't want to wait 20 minutes for an upload either. And then it's, of course, a change management task to actually introduce high-speed scanning into a very time-pressured process. And my argument would be rather stick to live microscopy because this is something that people know. Everybody uh, knows how to work with an analog microscope. Digital live microscopes, microscope works very similarly and it doesn't disturb the process. So in full, this is my, my plea for, you know, a little educational piece on why I think surgical pathology has to be treated in a slightly different way 
than, um, than clinical pathology has. Are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Well, thank you so much, um, Ms. Muller. I think it was a really excellent presentation. Yes, we certainly do have some time for any questions from the audience. Um, and I know we could also take any questions for uh, Dr. Panchal and Dr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas' um, presentation as well, if there are any. Um, so again, to the audience, you could either post your questions through the chat, or you could actually, um, you know, just um, unmute yourselves and ask a question as well. Either of that is acceptable. Well, perhaps so I many questions. The question, Bridget. Um, so, from your perspective, have you, you know, established or implemented this in any routine practice as of now? So, sorry, say again. Have you established your, um, you know, the approach that you're proposing in any uh, routine practice, or have you had any, you know, use cases that uh, are using this? That. You know, from your there are a few use cases on the research side at the moment. Um, the certification for our device is still pending. Um, but there are use cases in the research side, especially in Germany, but also in the US, where it has been tried both on histological samples as well as on fine needle aspirates, for example. Nice. And especially the fine needle aspirates, we see that it gives a very big advantage because there you also have, you know, in a lot of cases, when you have a smear, you don't, you cannot create a monolayer, yep. which makes it very difficult for scanning. And in our solution, it allows you to manually focus through these uh, clusters of cells, just as like you would do it with an analog microscope. And this is definitely where we see a very big advantage of working live rather than scanning. So does it provide something similar to a Z-stacking then? But the multiple layers. Yeah, exactly. It is like a C-stack, but it is a fully live C-stack, so to say. So it basically works like an analog microscope, just that you can steer it from a completely remote location via a computer screen. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So really interesting. <laughs> so looks like we don't have any further questions. Once again, I'd like to take the opportunity. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. So we'll and have, have a great conference. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. So we'll move on uh, to our next speaker, Dr. Rina Nakrav, who's uh, presenting from India. And um, thank you, Dr. Rina, to be there, uh, being there on time. Uh, passing the baton over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and uh, a very warm afternoon to everyone from Delhi, uh, not just because of the weather, but also the sentiment. And uh, I'll just share my screen. Just give me a minute. Looks like. Um, just give me a minute. I'm having a little problem selecting my screen. Is it visible? Yes, yes, we can see now. Thank you so much. Okay, that's that's great. Um, just put it on a full screen mode. Yeah, uh, so I'm Dr. Reena Nakra and I'm the principal director at uh, Dr. Lalpath Labs. Uh, we are a national uh, diagnostic chain uh, with the hub and spoke model. And uh, what you see on the picture is our reference laboratory from where I'm speaking today. And uh, 
uh, this we we actually uh, you know process around 45000 samples which is uh, approximately 45% of the load of the organization in a day and uh, we are uh, also uh, you know a team of around 50 pathologists at this reference laboratory this is spread over 85000 square feet uh, today, the topic would be on implementation of digital pathology in the clinical setting. I, we just heard Bridget talk about, uh, you know, uh, how in the diagnostic setting and in an interoperative, uh, they are coming up with newer modalities. But till then, uh, digital scanners in the clinical setting are here. Um, they are widely up for adoption. And we would like to share our journey of implementation as well as the challenges and opportunities that that presents. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, we, we, we have a wide test menu of around 5,000 tests. Um, we have close to 216 processing uh, laboratories, uh, which are satellite labs. And uh, uh, aside from this, uh, we have around 5,000 logistic points, 1,700 sample collection centers. Uh, we service uh, 19.5 million customers every year. Uh, so for us, uh, digital pathology, the what and why, uh, I think this group needs no introduction to DB. Uh, however, just uh, simplistically said, the digital replica of a glass slide. Uh, today we have uh, you know, very advanced digital scanners uh, to process uh, and capture whole slide images which can then be used uh, to report cases, share with each other, uh, archive, peer review, uh, also be used as an education and research tool. And um, uh, while the market scenario definitely uh, presents, you know, an opportunity and an interest to uh, delve into digital pathology. Uh, the increasing level of interest in the clinical setting came um, in 2017 from our side when the FDA granted approvals for, for whole slide uh, image device for primary diagnosis. And uh, we, we definitely felt that this was an opportunate time to you know, uh, get into digital pathology at that point. Um, we were the, you know, we, we are the India's largest single site histopathology processing lab with an annual workload last year, uh, despite COVID. We, we had close to quarter of a million cases in histopathology alone. And uh, uh, this translates to around, uh, you know, uh, 0.6 million blocks. Uh, we use the Starlins uh, system from Abbott for our lab information system. Uh, the use cases and you know the context as to why we wanted to enter into uh, digital pathology was because uh, we had increasing volume and complexity of histopathology workload. We had a pressure on turnaround time. Uh, there is always uh, you know the limitation of talent specific to a geographic location. Uh, we would necessarily not always have good uh, histopathologists available uh, at you know, to, to hire uh, at Delhi alone. So that was one. Uh, the need to for us to increase the capacity and of course, to drive uh, our network and service uh, to create a network of histopathology reporting laboratories or even histopathologists. So this drive towards, um, uh, you know, adding uh, digital uh, was what uh, we started off with. Uh, we, we had the clinical cases in mind, um, the context we already had, uh, we, we wanted it to, you know, be for primary diagnosis of pathological specimens, uh, to standardize our assessment of uh, IHCs, uh, to create a, you know, multidisciplinary team tumor board equivalent across uh, for our reporting. Uh, we, we wanted to, uh, you know, kind of look at whether we can do frozen section diagnosis, but of course we learned that later because of the Z stacking and even, you know, the, the I think Bridget really elaborated on that. That was one use case which we haven't explored till now, but these were some of the cases that we, use cases that we had thought that we would uh, explore. Uh, second opinions, review, uh, remote working, and of course in sourcing and outsourcing of our diagnostic work was uh, another. Uh, so that is why uh, we then, you know, went in for installations of the high throughput uh, digital scanner from Philips. Uh, and this was installed at our organization. 
Now, why uh, is it important for us and today to share this implementation journey? I think uh, over the last two years, uh, we have seen uh, health take center stage and also the empowered patient alongside the thermometers, pulse oximeters have moved into patient uh, room homes. And you know they, they are more and more connected with their health. Uh, what we saw was there was a 72% rise in the adoption of digital solutions um, in this period. And actually 46% of these were first time users of telehealth solutions. Now that's a significant statistic, not, not only because um, of what it presents as, but also as the opportunity that is there to scale up uh, telepathology and digital pathology. So it becomes, uh, you know, I think very important to address this right now. Um, the pandemic also put a magnifying glass on another health crisis, which is health inequity. And uh, I think uh, we realized during lockdowns how, how certain geographies had no access to healthcare and how uh, patients, uh, you know, were kind of stranded in terms of uh, access. Um, what comes to, sorry, what comes to mind is that how we can use technology and I think AI and IoT to be the great equalizer in this. Can we create health equity by using technologies and by removing barriers to education, diagnosis and treatment and even healthcare setups? So uh, with this context, uh, I, I do see and we do get to know a lot of organizations adopting, uh, you know, digital technology, uh, digital pathology being one, and um, uh, best to learn from experience. Why repeat the mistakes? Uh, so definitely, we would want to share as to what were the challenges that we faced and how we can, you know, um, how we overcame them, and what are the opportunities that digital pathology presents today. Uh, so. Uh, so this was uh, kind of the timeline of implementation at um, our lab, LPL is short for Lalpath Labs. So this was our uh, timeline. And uh, what you realize that, you know, in from this slide is that in 2017, uh, we installed the digital pathology uh, for, for digital pathology, the scanner. Uh, however, the, uh, I, you know, the implementation exactly and the identification started in March 2019, two years uh, to actually bring about uh, actual implementation journey initiation uh, after installation. And, and this is something that we're not really proud of. And, uh, you know, it's not how we, we uh, usually work. But so what caused that? And, and I think that's something that we often, uh, you know, uh, we often iterate in our organization to say that this is not how, uh, you know, things should happen. Um, so uh, when I reflect back, and as a team, when we reflect back, I think, uh, there is this NAS framework for patient facing healthcare technologies, uh, which talks about how, uh, you know, adoption uh, can get influenced um, and specifically so how to overcome non-adoption and abandonment to ensure there is spread, scale up and sustainability of any technology that is adopted. And largely this is directed for patient facing health and care technologies. And in this framework, they talk about seven, uh, you know, important uh, guidelines uh, to take into consideration. And um, so condition, which is like probably the context of the entire, uh, you know, uh, the adoption, the use case, uh, the technology, uh, which is of course the whole slide imaging scanner in this case that we picked up. Uh, the value proposition, uh, all the use case scenarios the, um, which, which, which were envisioned, uh, all this was in place. Um, we, we had done that before we went in for, uh, you know, installation. But I think what, what escaped us was largely the adopter system influence, uh, the staff, the patients, um, and also the other stakeholders in our organization, uh, which needed to be involved uh, to adopt this technology. 
So that is that is one piece that I feel is very, very important uh, to be able to engage with the wider uh, uh, you know, stakeholders uh, in the organization, as well as the people who are going to adopt the technology. So uh, a bottoms up approach is something that would need to get considered while the strategy and the design uh, would definitely be you know, kind of formalized from the top. Uh, so in the process flow, um, I think uh, it was also elaborated in the previous presentation. Uh, it, it is about capturing, uh, it has some key elements and, and that's like capturing the whole slide image uh, after processing. Uh, there is a storage and archival of, uh, you know, the image that is scanned, uh, which is required. So you would need an image management system. You would also need, uh, uh, you know, data storage. Um, systems. Uh, there is then, of course, the viewing and reporting and sharing platforms that are there through the IMS and, of course, the physical uh, infrastructure like the color monitors to, to be uh, viewing that. So uh, throughout this process, um, what are the challenges majorly that get encountered? One, of course, is the you know, like we all change is any case difficult for all of us. And there is this technophobia. Um, we, we like looking through our microscopes. We feel safe. We feel in control. And that's what we have practiced through many, many years. Uh, so transitioning to a computer screen um, does, you know, um, feel challenging. Uh, so there is a lot of um, that uh, in the on the hardware front, uh, the involvement of the IT stakeholders uh, from the IT team uh, to ensure the right uh, you know data storage capacity, the data transfer speed that may be required because it could become a deterrent to your workflow, uh, the workflow integration that uh, would be required to allow ease of. And of course, the regulatory uh, environment to be kept in place. Um, and uh, there is the, the finance team that needs to be involved for the investment and the implementation costs. So um, in, our, um, in our workflow, what we realized was that one of our major challenges was the, uh, the interface with the limbs. And we had to uh, you know, change our barcodes um, completely from the existing 1D barcode labels to 2D. Otherwise, it would have to be a manual feed, which would, in the volume of work that we handle, become very difficult to handle. So uh, it was required to ensure that we have that bi-directional flow in the interface from the IMS to our limb system uh, to capture the patient demographics correctly and to be able to scan and assign the cases. So uh, that was one of the major challenges, and uh, we, we that was one of the major milestones that we overcame. Uh, the other is, uh, of course, in the quality of the HNE sections, uh, they have to have minimum folds, they have to have uniform thickness. Uh, so all I, I, I always believe automation is unforgiving, and uh, you know the minute. Uh, there is any issue, um, it would it would get um, it would get put called out uh, manually. You can you know bypass, overcome, uh, work around it. But um, whenever there is uh, this uh, issue, like the scanner would get stuck. Uh, if if there were a fold, it would not be able to pick the slide. If there was a too much of DBX or mountain, so it 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 had all those issues. Uh, so improving the quality uh, and training the technical staff who felt that they were very experienced, they had been working for so many years, um, definitely they felt that, you know, this was not needed. But uh, uh, that's one of the change management that we had to do to make them see as to what is the, uh, the outcome directed at and how it would uh, ease their work. So case assigning would become faster. They would just have to load and go. It would, it would just scan, assign the cases to the pathologist. When they saw that those were the benefits that they would have, that is when they, they actually you know, came around participating to, to come with solutions as to how they could overcome uh, this, this uh, problem. Uh, so there was a lot of workflow adjustment that was done. Uh, avoided the use of marker pens on the slide. Uh, scanning we were doing at night to adjust the additional scanning time. 
to ensure that our turnaround time was not delayed because this was happening in parallel. And uh, uh, this is how we transitioned our slide from the 1D to the 2D barcode. Uh, the common errors that we encountered in uh, whole slide image scanning were like, you know, like I mentioned, the section out of focus, uh, there were vertical bands that we could see. Really, the scanner would not be able to pull out the slide from the rack. And uh, that is something that we had to work with in terms, you know, how would we mount and cover slip the slides. So uh, these errors were close to around 1.5 to 2% in our lab, and they required rescanning. Uh, there were uh, uh, there were issues that we needed to address in terms of excess mounting medium, uh, making sure the cover slip thickness is diff you know specific. Um, even variations in that were getting called out. Uh, so there was a lot of pre-analytical work that needed to be put in. Uh, the training and validation of pathologists uh, is, is, is a very essential step and, and uh, it, it was required to add, you know, for our adequate transition. Uh, this, uh, we, we held workshops with our pathologists. We, uh, you know, ensured that uh, uh, they were familiarized with the gap guidelines and, of course, uh, you know, had the comfort and time to report out uh, through digital. We did the validation uh, by the CAP protocol and uh, uh, the case load that we assigned was a minimum of 60 histopathology cases uh, per pathologist, per consultant. And uh, if there was any uh, additional modality uh, that had to be incorporated, a different stain or uh, you know, IHC, uh, it would have an additional 20 slides per additional modality. Uh, of course, there was a washout period of two weeks that was observed between viewing the digital uh, and the glass slide uh, so that uh, we could, uh, you know, um, ensure that there was no bias. Uh, the cases were selected randomly by the uh, technicians in charge and not by the pathologists to avoid a selection bias in cases. And uh, we achieved an agreement of close to 98% in our validation study. Uh, just a snapshot of how uh, the validation and concordance of results was done. So what, what were the benefits uh, that you know, we achieved? Uh, we, we did end up with a faster and more efficient workflow. Uh, the internal logistics, slide sorting, case put up, archival and retrieval became much simpler. Uh, we could do easy multidisciplinary consultation and even external consultation for peer review. Uh, there was, uh, you know, we, we have uh, uh, specialized histopathologists across India for specific areas of expertise. So we could assign cases to them based their area of expertise and they could report it from there. Uh, it also gave a kind of, you know, um, um, democratization of the, the cases. Uh, it was not like only the reference lab had all the, all the good cases to report on. Uh, even our remote satellite labs were, had access to report uh, uh, these cases. Uh, there was uh, optimum utilization of services out of the peripheral locations. Uh, it, it did uh, have a, you know, kind of intangible benefit uh, on our attrition because uh, pathologists uh, were getting to see good work, um, even in peripheral locations. Uh, there was an interpretive accuracy improvement and uh, we, uh, we did have uh, that rub off. Uh, so uh, the case, like one of the, uh, the assigning got simplified definitely uh, because it was as per what we would, you know, uh, the algorithm that we set. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just the one of the technical benefits you get to see on digital scan, the bird's eye view of the whole image. It, it's after all histopathology is like all patterns and uh, it, it really gives a very good view. Uh, there is uh, the ease of annotation and measurements. And of course, uh, anytime, anywhere view. Uh, during COVID, our pathologists could sit at home and report. Uh, they did not have to travel and the patients didn't have to and, you know, uh, suffer because we kept our turnaround time. 
So um, live collaboration um, analysis by software algorithms we were using VisioFarm uh, for our uh, ERP or HER2 uh, breast cancer IHC. And uh, of course, so, uh, otherwise from the physical mode retrieval is difficult, but instant uh, digital at least retrieval could be done uh, for a second review. Uh, I, this is this is the consolidated uh, benefit that we saw across patient safety, our diagnostic workflow, across our workforce issues, as well as the improvement in our service quality. Um, I think uh, the benefits actually went across uh, through not only our regional network, where there were opportunities that we have unraveled for laboratory consolidation and reorganization of services. We do have a lot of, uh, we have more centers processing histopathology now uh, because we've been able to scale those up. Uh, the institution uh, level, we had a leaner workload, workload allocation and uh, it had enhanced our recruitment and retention. Like I mentioned, it, there was improvement in training and education and rapid access to digital uh, slide archival and retrieval. Uh, in sourcing and outsourcing work was another benefit. Um, at the pathologist, uh, you know, the stakeholders felt they had an ergonomic improvement looking at a larger screen rather than peering down a microscope, uh, more flexible, uh, they could do remote working, and uh, of course there is easier measurement and annotation uh, of slides. There is, uh, there is this always the comfort of enhanced access to second opinion. and. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is this digital pathology also a kind of set stage and is the essential first step for building uh, AI and AI algorithms, uh, use of AI algorithms on it. And um, that is another opportunity. Uh, this is to, you know, the, the definitely uh, challenges also um, incorporated the high investment in initial deployment and development. Uh, there is a necessity to workflow adjustment in the technical laboratory. Uh, there will always be, you know, time constraint in case turnaround time in the private setting uh, can make initial uh, learning phase more difficult. However, the benefits and the opportunities outweigh these challenges. Um, our journey um, is kind of captured here. Uh, if you look at cost, as the bottom, uh, you know, line and uh, the return of investment up, up front. Um, what we see is that while in 2017, 2018, it was only cost on our side, but gradually over a period of time, we have been able to get return on investment in, in digital pathology uh, by, uh, you know, uh, benefits of remote reporting, remote consultation, uh, standardized IHC reporting, uh, benefits of that in turnaround time as well as quality. And of course, uh, we have now partnered with IBEX for um, you know, AI, using their AI algorithms for prostate cancer. So uh, I, I think I would like to quote uh, one of my favorite authors, Eric Paul, uh, that AI has the potential to transform and uh, everything from our note-taking and medical scans. Uh, it actually frees us from tasks uh, to, you know, which do not need human connection to those where we can uh, spend our time uh, on creating a space for real touch and healing. And I think uh, if uh, we do not use this means cannibalizing yourself, but, but it does definitely, it's an aid, it's a tool, it's an assistant that we can use. Uh, and uh, AI based on, you know, digital pathology is something that is really a future to look forward to. Uh, thank you. This is the team from here. I would, I'm open to questions now. If we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakhra. That was an extremely brilliant presentation. Um, and uh, yes, I think we do have some time for questions um, because we are a little early for our lunch. We do have one question from the um, audience. Um, you, how have you maintained to minimize pre-analytical errors during the COVID lockdown, 
particularly in transfer of samples from small towns to city? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we were privileged by having a very strong uh, logistic network and a satellite laboratory, uh, you know, kind of hub and spoke model. Uh, so that that was definitely there. Uh, during the first uh, lockdown, uh, we actually had a drastic decrease in samples reaching us. Uh, uh, definitely because surgeries, surgeries as such were you know kind of suspended uh, but um, there was there was uh, there was a different um, uh, thing that we noticed you know in at least near near around there were many small labs which actually stopped processing histopathology because of shortage of manpower uh, people not coming in people falling ill uh, so they started outsourcing their samples to us uh, because as a larger setup, we were able to at least, you know, sustain uh, operations. Uh, so that is somewhere where we actually realized that suddenly we had a, a different segment of uh, clientele, uh, you know, sending out specimens to us. Uh, but because of our logistic network, we were able to do that. Uh, interestingly, though, that's one thing which has, you know, kind of uh, that experience has made us uh, expand our histopathology processing sites. and. Today, we have 50 more sites in a year's time. That's a brilliant achievement. And I think um, it, it speaks to the you know, technological advances that we are doing. Thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions myself. And you know, looking at uh, the, the amount of work that's gone into it, I'm based in the UK and I know it was during the same time that in the UK, we were also going through the same process of establishing digital pathology across our hospitals. And the COVID really, as you rightly said, has pressure tested all of us and having to move into this space very much, uh, you know, much more quickly than what we would have had we not had that. So, you know, I guess what's one of the, the, the other positive sides, there's no positive to COVID, but you know, the other side of COVID. It's so, a silver lining. <laughs> Right. Exactly, uh, in the very dark, gloomy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I was interested, um, Dr. Nakar, is, um, you know, you were talking about VisioPharm and using VisioPharm in your routine practice for, uh, you know, breast panel. So how do you use that? Do you use it in, as an ancillary aided tool? Does your pathologist still have to review the case once the automated algorithm provides you an, a positive or negative result and, and sign off on it? Or is it an automated, fully automated, you know, result that is uh, churned out? Right. Uh, so, so um, you know, we, we are using it as a first treat uh, right now. Uh, but... Uh, uh, we do we do correlate uh, in between like there is a concordance that we would like to especially uh, wherever the pathologist feels the need because they have done the histopathology uh, they would like to review but it's much faster um, and visio farm uh, i think we you still need to kind of select uh, the, the area, of right but now there are others which are coming in as algorithms where you do not need to. So I think uh, that is where probably you can have totally hands or eyes off <laughs> what, what we would say. But um, as of now, we, we do review them again, but it's a first treat that we think. And uh, are you having any plans of uh, bringing in any additional algorithms, particularly you know, with PDL one and the number of different antibodies? Do you have any interest in that space to bring in any Absolutely. Absolutely. Approaches. Yes, we, we are already uh, looking at that. We are also looking at partnering for building AI algorithms um, and, you know, uh, specific to use cases that we see, um, uh, you know, that, that are becoming very relevant. Uh, so we are we are doing that. So that this is something that came, uh, you know, um, as along uh, along with uh, the, the scanner that we had. So yes. it's the first thing that we adopted. Uh, but we are already evaluating and adopting more. Thank you. That's In great fact, to um, uh, tomorrow, I think Dr. Rajiv Dangi will be talking about uh, Visio Farms and you know how he used it and yeah. his, his uh, experiences there it's from our organization. He will be talking about that. That's great. Great. We're looking forward to the presentation from Dr. Rajiv. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any further questions from the audience. Yeah, can I have a question, please? Uh, yes, please. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Reena, I am Dr. Mishra uh, from Eli Prasad Eye Institute, India. Right, right. Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, I am also using a digital scanner, uh, but uh, what is the minimum or minimal size of the tissue for a scanning good image? Uh, so I, I think it uses um, a 1.5 mm by 1.5 mm. Uh, you can kind of pick that size also. 
Yeah, actually, uh, you know that in eye pathology, the tissue size is very small. Uh, it's in uh, 1.5 uh, mm uh, like that, or even uh, smaller than that, like vitreous biopsy uh, for the diagnosis of lymphoma. So <clears throat> scanning of uh, this, uh, these are very difficult. So you have any uh, knowledge of uh, that things, uh, how to uh, eliminate this uh, kind of error? Um, I think, uh, you know, there is, there is, uh, there are now scanners where you can select out or mark out to the area and it can pick, uh, you can even focus on that and, you know, allow them to pick the slides. Uh, so there are there, uh, we, we would uh, be open to, you know, evaluate this for you uh, at our center. You can, you can get in touch with us and we can definitely help you standardize that. Yeah, we are uh, the same method we are using manually. We are uh, trying to focus that. But even though, suppose it is a, a distance membrane, uh, it is impossible to take. So I will share with uh, that uh, slides to you. Uh, Surely, to Surely uh, we'll definitely try and help you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, sorry, Sitra, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm looking for any further questions um, because we do have a couple of minutes, um, not just for Dr. Um, Nakra's presentation, perhaps for the previous presentations. Anybody has questions as well, we can take it. Um, looks like we don't have any major questions coming from anybody else, but, uh, you know, that was indeed a very interesting presentation and um, good luck with the future and for bringing up more AI based approaches in your hospital and institution. I think um, it's definitely the step forward uh, in moving into digital pathology across, uh, you know, not just pathology. I think radiology is far ahead of us. So Absolutely. it's really amazing to see that there's so much of effort going on in the pathology space. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakra. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think with that, we probably are going to take an early break for lunch, um, given that uh, you know we did not have one of our speakers who was um, supposed to be speaking this morning. So we will um, break for lunch now. It's um, 1.02, and we will probably be coming back um, after lunch at, um, I think we're giving a 30 minutes uh, break, and we should be back um, at 1.20 for um, post-lunch. Um, thank you so much. So we'll see you back at um, 1.20 p.m. Uh, UK time or London time. Thank you.
Um, hi, everyone. Just a very quick update. Um, we will be joining back after lunch at um, 13.45 hours or 1.45 um, as per the original program schedule. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. Uh, we are now moving on to the second half of the um, sessions for this afternoon. I'll hand over to Priya to introduce me as I will be the speaker for this, the next talk. Thank you. So we'll go ahead um, and start the second half of the presentation for this afternoon. Um, I'll be the next speaker for, um, and I will be speaking about uh, uh, the uh, role of the pathologist in new adjuvant clinical trials. Um, and I will briefly share my presentation. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm having a, a bit of a technical glitch here. I should be able to um, share briefly. I hope you're able to see my screen. Are you able to hear me as well, please? Okay, something went wrong and uh, my screen is no longer visible. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present to the um, organizers. So today I'll be speaking about the pivotal role of pathologist in new adjuvant clinical trials. I'm Radha Krishnan. I'm the executive director from our, um, okay. I'm the executive director from um, Merck's Sharp and Dome. Um, and um, Moving on, I'd like to pro provide an introduction to what is new adjuvant therapy. I think many of you are aware of the standard adjuvant therapy that we would I'm sorry. Is, is there a question there? Hello. Yes, please. Dr. Sama, uh, Dr. Radha, we can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, let me go back to my settings to see what has happened. I'm sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, it's audible yes, now. It's you audible can proceed. Audible. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll probably want to restart from the beginning of my slides. Yes, please.
So very good afternoon to everyone and welcome back after a, a nice warm lunch. And um, this is Radha Krishnan. I am the executive director and uh, part of the Companion Diagnostics Early Clinical Development Team within Merck Sharp and Dome. And uh, today I'll be speaking about the pivotal role of the pathologist in neoadjuvant clinical trials. And I thought I would take this opportunity to speak about the critical role we as pathologists play in a neoadjuvant setting. Looking at new adjuvant versus adjuvant um, clinical trials and approaches to therapy, if you want to have a quick definition, we could say that a new adjuvant anti cancer therapy is given before surgery and adjuvant therapy is given after. Of course, the caveat is that during the new adjuvant phase, local or primary disease is usually present, but there is no evidence of metastatic disease. And oncologists and, um, who are prescribing treatment have to assume that disease burden is possibly present outside the local or primary tumor area as well. And there is a role for systemic therapy to control this local tumor and the microscopic metastatic disease as well. New adjuvant chemotherapy, as we know, is used to debulk tumors preoperatively. However, the hypothesis that was launched with the current wave of new adjuvant immunotherapy trials posits that this form of treatment will enhance the systemic T-cell response to tumor antigens. This systemic response is predicted to result in enhanced detection and killing of micrometastatic tumor deposits that are disseminated beyond the resected tumor, which are ultimately the source of post-surgical relapse. The key corollary to this hypothesis is that new adjuvant pd one blockage, while the primary tumor is still in place, as opposed to adjuvant therapy directed only against micrometastatic disease after resection, will leverage the higher levels of endogenous tumor antigen present in the primary tumor to enhance T cell priming. Essentially, we are saying that the higher tumor antigen load present in the body in the context of new adjuvant therapy relative to post resection adjuvant therapy will hypothetically result in presentation to and thus priming of more tumor specific T cells circulating systemically. If we look at, there are two potential mechanisms that are hypothesized for the enhancement of systemic anti-tumor T cell immunity after PDL1 blockade. We're taking PDL1 as a case example here. We can see here that PDL1 blockade could result in the insight to expansion of tumor specific T cell clones that are already within the tumor microenvironment, which is largely driven by dendritic cells that you could see here in this example, in this image. The tumor-specific tumor infiltrating lymphocytes may represent either naive T cells or T cells that have already been primed to the tumor antigen prior, ahead of the PDL1 blockade. In addition, you also have tumor antigen containing dendritic cells that originate in the tumor that pick up the tumor antigens and they traffic to the tumor draining lymph nodes. There, they present these antigens to the tumor-specific T cells. So you could see that PDL1 or PD1 blockade acts at this point, enhancing the productive stimulation of tumor-specific T cells or partially reversing any tolerance induction. The activated T cells then they enter the circulation by way of efferent lymphatics, as you can see here, and then ingress into the tissues. And there's also the other pathway for these lymphocytes via the systemic circulation to seek out and treat sites of micrometastatic disease. As we saw earlier, there are two pathways that are uh, hypothesized. So following administration of neoadjuvant IO therapy, you can see here that there is a cyclical process of tumor killing and probable de novo priming of T cells. And subsequently, you're also seeing once a primary tumor and the associated lymph nodes are, re are removed uh, during surgery, any residual active tumor and associated microscopic suppressive tumor microenvironment is also removed thereby theoretically removing any major location of T-cell exhaustion or dysfunction. This allows for a more effective and functional contraction of this T-cell repertoire into the maintenance phase and ultimately long-term functional immune-mediated memory, which has been primed against a broad repertoire of tumor antigens, including those that are subdominant. So we know that neoadjuvant therapy provides local control of disease. It provides for potential downstaging of tumor and easier resectability in tumor, certain tumor types. But we're also seeing that there is, it allows for modulation or altering adjuvant therapy, thereby providing proper patient selection, decreasing the risk of overtreating patients with adjuvant therapy, especially those who have achieved a complete response to new adjuvant treatment and or surgery. This can be seen in bladder, um, bladder cancer, and there are several ongoing trials looking into this, as well as 
I'm showing an example of what is being done uh, in, in the melanoma space. As you know, melanoma is a poster child for neoadjuvant treatment. So in melanoma, we've seen that the modulation or altering of adjuvant therapy based on pathological complete response is possible, but why can we do this? With IO, the pathological response at week six, as you can see here, is an excellent predictor of patient outcome. This work done by the International Melanoma Consortium performed a pooled analysis of multiple neoadjuvant adjuvant trials, and they showed that in, a new, in an IO trial, if PCR was achieved at week six, as you can see here, then outcome is a flat line of a relapse-free survival for these patients. So at week six, we already have data to say the, uh, the, about the patient outcome. And if response is not seen, then escalation of treatment is required. But if you look at the same thing in here, and there's the C here where you can look at the targeted therapy across all the cohorts, for targeted therapy or chemotherapy, the results of pathological response is not as clear. Um, clear cut as you can see in IO therapies. The partial responder that you see here has um, a behavior like a non-responder, and patients with pathological complete response, they do not have a flat line either, as you could see in the immunotherapy cohort. So this shows that IO outcomes are way more clear, clear cut than chemotherapy or targeted therapy outcomes, demonstrating that pathological response is indeed a good surrogate for IO compared to targeted therapy. Now, having established that you know, pathological response is a good indicator, we want to make sure to discuss the role of pathology response assessments in the neoadjuvant setting. A comprehensive understanding of the efficacy and F safety of neoadjuvant therapy is essential to guide treatment and hence standardized strategies to determine responses of great importance in a clinical trial. Clinical ev evaluation of therapy effectiveness as change in the tumor burden is usually assessed either by radiology following the WHO criteria or by resist criteria. But in new adjuvant immunotherapy, you would see that assessing tumor response according to the conventional response criteria may actually underestimate the pathological response, which is to date the best predictor for relapse-free survival or RFS. So we know now that the role of pathological response has been shown to very strongly correlate with improved overall survival and event-free survival, and it's being interpreted as evidence of efficacy to a potential new treatment. And following this, we know that historically, the neoadjuvant treatment was reserved for locally advanced breast cancer patients with the goal to render large inoperable tumors operable. But we've now extended this concept across and applied it across several tumor indications, particularly with neoadjuvant, with immunotherapy and novel drug targets. And in May 2012, the US FDA recommended that PCR or pathological complete response is used, be used as a surrogate endpoint for accelerated approval of new agents for new adjuvant treatment in a high-risk early-stage breast cancer setting. And they also shared that achieving pathological response is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, which the FDA defines as clinically and statistically significant improvement in event-free survival, disease-free survival, or overall survival. And you can see that by 2014 of October, we had well-established guideline recommendations that were published by the FDA for evaluation of pathological response in early stage breast cancers, which are you know, followed by a number of our pathologist community across the globe. But more interestingly and more importantly, in November 2021, there was the phase three uh, Keynote 522 trial in early triple negative breast cancer which showed meaningful increase in um, clinically meaningful increases in pathological complete response and event-free survival. And these EFS findings for a new adjuvant Pembro chemotherapy suggest a potential new standard of care, which led to FDA approval and to a workshop that was um, established by FDA to evaluate event-free survival as an early endpoint in clinical trials. Now, currently there are more than 100 clinical trials that are ongoing in, uh, in the new adjuvant setting, not only with anti pd one therapy, but also with multiple IO as either monotherapy or different combination therapies, including IO immunotherapy combinations or radiation, chemo, kinase inhibitors, or any, any such combination therapies. So this goes on to prove that the, FD, the role of the pathologist and the standardized guidelines that are needed for pathology assessment. If we look at what we do from a pathology perspective in these patients, FDA approved the definition of pathological complete response in breast cancer as I shared earlier in 2014, we had guidelines published by FDA. And this was subsequently adopted by multiple other clinical trials for solid tumors. 
So we know that the definition of pathological complete response, which is the most stringent criteria, is defined as the absence of any viable tumor in the definitive surgical resection specimen and any draining um, lymph nodes. But we also know that although informative for most of these patients achieving a pathological complete response, this readout misses a potential opportunity to prognosticate and make treatment decisions for a vast majority of patients. So to that end, major pathological response or MPR, as you can see here, was uh, proposed to describe a treatment effect resulting in less than or equal to 10% residual viable tumor as an alternative endpoint. And this was proposed by Hellman et al, who used it and applied it in non, um, resectable non-small cell lung cancers. And since then it has been applied across other indications like head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. And recently Tetzlaff Tetz Tetz et al, also in their work in melanoma, talked about not just about pathological complete response or near PCR, which was MPR with less than or equal to 10% tumor, but they're also looking at multiple other components like partial response where there is less than 50% tumor or no response where the patients could have more than 50% tumor. And as you can see, the response, different types of response assessment can vary between and within tumor types as well. And pathological response assessments are being used as primary, secondary, and exploratory endpoints across multiple trials. So this goes on to re further reiterate the need for standardized guidelines for pathological response assessment of these neoadjuvant samples and grading of pathological response in these samples. And from this new regulatory pathway, it further signif signifies a need for a standardized reproducible method of pathology evaluation. One of the several concerns that have been raised by both researchers and by FDA that the biggest challenge with using pathological complete response in a new adjuvant setting is the heterogeneity and the lack of standardization of pathology measurements and in treatment effects. And one of the main goals across the industry and our pathology community is to develop standardized reproducible methods of pathology evaluation, thereby reducing variability. One would wonder what these sources of variability are. We know that pathology assessment is manual. It's a manual evaluation. There are different interpretations. There are not always any formal criteria and the results are hence quite variable. If we dwell deeper into some of the challenges of why is there this variability? Is it just based on the practice of pathology that each of us um, pathologists with our individual experiences in dealing or uh, in handling new adjuvant surgical specimens are uh, coming across with different uh, output or results? Or is it the variability that exists in the methods of pathological assessment across different institutional practices? But compounding factors and even more challenging factors are within the tumor appearance following new adjuvant treatment. There are several challenges that you one as a pathologist would see. The residual tumor is often soft and very difficult to see grossly. The residual carcinoma could be scattered across the entire tumor bed as very small foci. The density or cellularity could be variable following treatment. And of course, we all know about treatment induced changes that can be seen. I'm gonna use a couple of case examples or case studies as examples here. This is a very nice example that Bossiud et al. They published in 2015 in breast cancer, which is again used as one of the primary examples to drive the rest of the tumor indications. There they showed that, you know, you could see here that the patterns of response to treatment could be very different. You can see within this area, there is a microscopic, macroscopically the tumor, the sample does not have any tumor, but then when you go into microscopic evaluation, you do find some small clusters of tumor seen on microscopy. And this is one of the biggest challenges that you would see is that the area of residual tumor could grossly appear and feel like soft fibrous tissue on gross examination. And hence it makes it all the more important that the examination is, is done methodically. If you could look at a second example, here's another case that shows the variation that you could see in the tumor density following new adjuvant treatment. Pre-treatment biopsy samples we know appear heterogeneous, but post-treatment residual carcinoma can also present a small foci of variable density or cellularity that's scattered across the tumor bed. If we take this example here, two different blocks of the tumor bed, one in black and one in blue are seen. These are adjacent to each other in the gross examination. So if tissue sections were taken from one of the areas that was marked with a black box, you see that there is no evidence of any residual tumor and is free of tumor. 
But if you look at the same adjacent section of this tumor that was taken under the blue box, you can find that there is a lot of residual microscopic um, area of tumor that is seen, which is showing, uh, which is seen here. And we describe this as a scatter pattern of um, residual disease in the patient. There are problems with random sampling. You've seen from the previous two examples that the decrease in cellularity could be heterogeneous and areas with complete response or no residual disease could alternate with, with areas with multiple foci of residual tumor, which I described as a scatter pattern. You can immediately see how random sampling of such a specimen could lead to very different estimates of cellularity with the potential for areas with residual tumor to be completely missed on microscopic evaluation. If the pathologist is not methodical, and does not follow standardized approach to evaluating the sample, areas of tumor could well be missed from the examination. And this could lead to a false diagnosis that the patient has achieved pathological complete response while they indeed harbor disease. So the goal, you can see now from the above discussions that the main goal is to standardize the criteria. And when we say, what do we standardize? We standardize every single step of the process, including ensuring that the pathology training is appropriate as well. The pathologist who initially receives a sample in their lab is extremely important. They, they are almost like the first line of, of treatment or of evaluation of the sample, and they are primarily responsible for ensuring that a standardized approach is followed with not only the grossing and sampling, but also the microscopic evaluation. And from what I have shared earlier, you could also see that not only is a pathologist required to say, is there residual disease in this patient or not, we are also required to provide a semi-quantitative assessment to say, is there 10% tumor, is there 50% tumor, is there more than 50% tumor? And this has to be done across not just the primary tumor bed or the residual tumor bed, from the margins and from all the lymph nodes that have been resected for that particular patient. And this is an extremely critical methodical assessment that needs to happen. What do we mean by local versus central? I'm coming in from a clinical trial perspective, but I have been a consulting pathologist for many years in the hospital industry before I moved to, a, to the pharma practice. And I've also been a chief pathologist at a central uh, clinical research lab, like a CRO lab. So, and I understand that there are differences in how we would approach pathology evaluation. When FDA approved, they approved the guidelines for breast cancer and they provided a standardized criteria. And they said, given that we now have standardized um, criteria that have been um, recommended by FDA and published by FDA, there is no requirement for a centralized pathology review at a, at a central lab for any of these clinical trials. A local or a site pathology lab can pathologist could perform this review and this is acceptable. However, for other indications, like in lung, bladder, or um, other types like melanomas, a similar standardized approval guideline has not yet been published. And hence, there is a need to perform a blinded, independent central pathology review across these different tumor indications. And at a central lab, the pathologists are blinded to diagnostic interpretations from the local laboratory, and they usually require to do a blinded adjudication review. So the central pathologist has several challenges. They are blinded to the clinical presentation. They have no idea how the patient presented, what was the radiology. They, know, they have no idea of what the gross presentation of the sample was. And they're also unaware of where the sections were taken by the pathologist at the site or at the local labs. In order for them to provide an accurate and a robust independent confirmation of pathological complete response, they require to perform a detailed gross description they need this information in terms of either a mapping or a diagram. They need the accurate cassette or slide legend, appropriately completed documents, and all the slides from the case to be submitted in its totality. And then they are then able to make a very comprehensive and overall evaluation if the patient has achieved response or not. What happens to the data quality? Why is it so important? You've seen that in, in breast, we've said local pathologists can perform this evaluation. It's adequate because you have well-established guidelines. In, in studies where it is not available, then the local pathologist or the site pathologist plays the most critical role because they are the first people receiving the sample, hence a due diligence of following a standardized process to perform both grossing and microscopic review is extremely important. Incomplete sample review or documentation leads to incomplete pathological response data, and this also leads to variability in the reports that are being produced. Not all labs or lab laboratories or pathologists follow the synoptic reporting protocol from the College of American Pathologists. Hence, the content and the quality of their reports are variable. 
And when we do send this across to a central lab pathologist, you find that they are unable to perform a comprehensive review because a lot of important critical data is missing. So there is an important need for using standardized cancer protocols to ensure that the gross and microscopic details are captured appropriately and appropriate corroborative information is available for the pathologist. Some of the other critical features and you also see in future what is happening in the new adjuvant space, not just with regards to the ongoing trials, but even moving forward, you find that the new adjuvant therapy as I shared in one of my case examples before uh, with melanoma, there is a possibility to define and modulate the adjuvant therapy that the patient is going to receive. But you also find that you can also personalize and modulate the extent of surgery that the patient could receive. Let's take an example of a patient who is presenting with melanoma of unknown primary with lymph node metastasis on both sides. So the, the routine uh, standard of care here is lymph node dissection on both sides with possible RT. But in a more recent Prado trial and a Pacinio trial, they found and they demonstrated that the pathological response in the largest lymph node represents the whole lymph node bed because they demonstrated that one, an index node that was removed from this patient is actually a, well, a good representative sample of what is happening across the entire nodal deposits of this patient in terms of response to therapy. So the patient has responded well to therapy. They do not need to go ahead and remove all the lymph nodes. And if they have not responded to therapy, then they can appropriately uh, choose the rest of the success of treatment. It also allows for early treatment adjustments the pathological responses, as you can have seen in, in my talk uh, so far, can be used as a very good prognosticator. Correlative studies, looking at multiple different components because you have pre and post IO specimens. Uh, the biospecimens are extremely crucial to look at multi-omic data and to also look at how we could advance uh, the IO discovery in terms of uh, next steps. So it's extremely important that uh, the pathology assessment is done appropriately. We know, as you have seen here, that some of these patients could have up to 80 blocks, 100 blocks prepared uh, from the primary tumor sample, from the margins and lymph nodes. So it's a laborious, time-consuming process for a pathologist. So bringing in machine learning approaches and deep learning or digital pathology approaches, which is uh, talk of this, um, this entire 2D, you know, um, is extremely useful and extremely critical. And we also know that because it's immunotherapy related uh, pathological response criteria, let's say used in melanomas and many of the other indications, this is not um, part of the routine pathology curriculum. So pathologists are not always trained to identify these uh, different features. So using mach machine learning approaches helps to develop not just a standardized quantitation of areas of tumor bed, but also provides a scalable alternative and a complementary tool for manual assessment. An automated machine learning approach could also potentially improve the prediction of uh, the PCR to clinical responses like EFS and OS. And as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Nakra presented very beautifully this morning, it also provides an expanded access, access to patients who are treated outside of specialized centers. To conclude, pathological response assessments are critical data as they form primary and secondary endpoints. They're demonstrated to show very good correlation with overall survival and even free survival, and are interpreted as evidence of efficacy of any potential new treatment. And these results are used to guide adjuvant or appropriate therapy in multiple tumor types and are extremely critical for appropriate patient management. Hence, as pathologists, it is important, and there's a great emphasis and a critical need for thorough but not exhaustive sampling of the surgical specimen, a good correlation with both clinical and imaging, identified by informed mapping and a detailed gross description and an accurate documentation of everything that was performed. The pathologist, we pathologists, play a pivotal role in ensuring accurate assessment of these response criteria to generate high quality data for neoadjuvant trials and immediate patient management. But we are also the custodians of tumor tissue samples and we play an integral role to drive the future of personalized neoadjuvant therapy lead successful correlative studies that is critical for advances in IO discovery. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much once again for the opportunity to, to speak to you all and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the amazing presentation, Dr. Radha. We have surely learned a lot from you. So are there any questions? You can always post your questions or comment in the uh, in the comment box, chat box. Now, again, I am handing over the stage to Dr. Radha. 
Thank you so much, um, Priya. And um, I think if there are no further questions for me, um, we can move on to our next presenter, who is Dr. Al Berger from Germany. Um, over to you, Dr. Berger. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm glad for the opportunity to speak here. And um, my name is Anil Berger, I'm a seasoned life scientist and uh, part of the management team of MindPeak. Um, today, I present to you the evolution of AI analysis, uh, culminating now in the um, newly available zero click solution. And with this, let me share my screen. Okay, I will skip that. So um, back in 2018, we set out uh, to start bringing our deep learning AI platform um, into the market. On the one hand, there is a huge need with cancer cases worldwide on the rise. And on the other hand, um, a number of the number of pathologists is stagnant. From the beginning, we had a platform concept in mind uh, that will speed up the development of new algorithms. Building the platform took us roughly two and a half years, and now we can leverage this platform to build new algorithms within three months only. And our founders uh, personally brought more than 20 years of practical experience in computer science and deep learning to the table. Um, using a powerful but data efficient hybrid approach, the neuronal network um, is initialized in an unsupervised manner where it learns basic tasks unattendedly from unlabeled data. Then our data scientists further train the model with state-of-the-art supervised methods with data annotated on a single cell level. As you can see here, for example, with these uh, colored dots. Along the way, uh, we started sharing best practices because our groundwork in the area of deep learning and image analysis has been recognized by the German Institute for Norming. And this is probably the most German institution that can be. And um, with this in the background, we uh, were able to consult members of the German parliament now on several occasions um, on the use of AI in healthcare and um, in particular on the employment uh, in medicine of such approaches. Yeah, our algorithms are able to use morphological and contextual information um, of each cell in order to auto, uh, automatically identify tumor cells, while all, all other cells, for example, stroma cells are excluded. The tumor cells are then uh, subclassified into positively and negatively stained ones. Here you can see the process in the icons. All this is possible um, directly on the respective IHC image, so without any co-staining like cytokeratin, which involves also um, co-registration. In addition, the results of our AI solutions are easy to check by the pathologist, as we show them instead of a heat map with um, an overlaid dot on a single cell basis. So the first step of this evolution was um, a region of interest tool with a live calculation. Um, we developed tools for three biomarkers in breast cancer, ki 67 ER, and PR in the first round. And um, these algorithms could be used by drawing a region of interest and um, are then live calculated on our cloud servers. The images in these cases could be either uploaded or um, copy pasted uh, from any viewer that you have. And now let's do this in a live environment so that I can show you how it works. So as it says, you can either drag and drop a, a, a file, you can copy paste an image. Let's just click, open an image. This is a screenshot I took earlier of a whole slide image. Now you see the, um, the image by pressing the right mouse button, I can uh, draw a region of interest. And this is now live calculated on our parallelized uh, servers and the results are coming back. As you can see, we have uh, a nice tumor stroma differentiation and you can hide and show the overlay um, of the cells so you can easily check whether the re uh, results are correct or not. Also, the tumor cells have been identified correctly and 
the positive and negative uh, classification was done uh, depending on the browners. Now back to the presentation. As this was the, I would say, more general um, implementation of an AI tool, um, we then wanted to set out um, uh, for robustness and uh, CEIVD clearance. Um, we first participated in a German proficiency test um, intended for laboratories to renew their accreditation and passed this test with an extraordinary result of 96% concordance. And with this encouraging result in the pocket, we set out to tackle the ability of our AI tools to generalize um, very well over real life uh, image variability. We performed, to our knowledge, the largest variability study to date for a deep learning AI in pathology with over 200 uh, cases um, in the study. And uh, they were stained on three machines and then digitized on six instruments, uh, even one microscope camera. We had 10 pathologists review all these images. Then uh, one month later, they reviewed um, them again, but this time using the AI. And in both cases, they were able to choose the hotspots freely on the whole slide images to really add um, as close as possible um, uh, yeah, complexity to the study. And our goal was to show non-inferiority, uh, which we were able to show. And the non-inferiority threshold was derived from a submission of Roche uh, for uh, FDA clearance. So as you can see, it does not matter which stainer was used or which scanner was used or which biomarker was considered. Um, in all cases, uh, the pathologists um, arrive at the same clinical conclusion. And this um, nice set of results is currently under publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Yeah, and with this um, or these um, CEIVD -IV cleared models, we are now operational in 14 laboratories, uh, laboratory chains uh, worldwide, 12 in Europe and two in the US already. Then we um, set out to investigate um, IMS integration or workflow integration. Um, because in our eyes, this was a really a big goal to achieve, uh, because then you can leverage uh, more potential of the AI in pathology um, if it's deeply integrated into your workflow platform. And um, I think uh, we are today the pro AI provider with the largest number of such integrations. This is just an excerpt and the um, number of uh, platforms where we are available is uh, still growing. This already sped up uh, the diagnostic process um, with image pre-calculation in the background, because the, uh, once the scanner uh, acquired the image, it can be directly um, yeah, sifted through by the AI, pre-calculated. So when the pathologist uh, then draws one or many regions of interest, um, irrespective of size, the results were immediately displayed without any delay. We created an um, easy to implement uh, API for this, so uh, along with the uh, extensive documentation. So um, all uh, functionalities that we have in our demo environment can now uh, be leveraged uh, on these platforms. Yeah, um, this, um, maybe you uh, recognize the image from before. This is where I took the screenshot. This is a whole slide image. Okay, let me refresh it. <laughs> okay, nice, there we are. We load the whole slide image. We can zoom in. And now I can draw one region of interest, the second one, a third one. And you see uh, that the results uh, come in immediately without any time delay. And this is exactly possible due to this concept of pre-calculation. Then um, let me, uh, let me show you something else here. Um, you could even take the whole biopsy and have a result in this case for uh, 14,000 cells immediately. You can uh, go in, you can zoom in, hide and show the cells. And um, I also uh, told you about the ability of uh, our AI tools um, for a generalization. So let's have a look at that. 
I have brought several other Ki67 images, maybe here. And you can see even in an image that is darker, has more stroma in it, the um, tumor cells are found and they are uh, classified correctly. Also here, you may notice that uh, the positive cells are more reddish than brownish. The resolution is not optimal. In another image, we have a purple background. Um, the color palette is uh, completely different, but still the AI works very well, finds the cells. Then if we go over to an overstained image, the positive cells are overstained. The counter staining for the negative tumor cells is uh, hardly visible. If we apply the AI here, also the result comes in uh, immediately and the cells are found correctly. And then we have the, the worst of the bunch in terms of image quality. It's rather monochrome. Um, resolution is not good, but still even here the AI finds the cells and works um, on the image. So this is really showing um, how well our AI can generalize. And also um, it does this uh, without any um, retraining per laboratory. So this is an out of the box functionality. You use the AI, apply, the, apply it uh, to your images and it works immediately. Now back to the presentation. Um, Exactly. So beginning of this year, we were able to uh, issue a press release uh, that was um, on some parts also astonishing uh, to ourselves, but uh, still uh, we made it um, into the clinical routine in the US as the first, uh, as the first AI uh, provider. And um, this um, we managed uh, together with a platform, uh, an image management platform where we are deeply integrated. It's called Gestalt Diagnostics from uh, US Spokane. And um, together we uh, attracted bioreference laboratories that uh, since December last year sign off cases in clinical routine using our AI on a daily basis. Now, some of you um, may are, uh, are probably familiar with the ki 67 uh, scoring concept of global scoring. Um, the current recommendation for scoring um, for ki 67 in breast cancer uh, would like to have a transition from a hotspot consideration to a more whole slide or whole tissue consideration. And, um, this is here summarized uh, what the guideline actually asks you as a pathologist to do. So you are to choose for areas um, uh, of um, each 100 cells at least that uh, are representative of um, uh, negligible, low, medium and strong proliferation. And then you need to look at the whole tumor and decide how much of the whole tumor in percent falls into which of these four categories. So you weight the categories and out of this you get a weighted uh, proliferation score. Obviously, if you follow this guideline, uh, you have a lot more to do per case, per slide, than you uh, had before when you just were doing the hotspot um, consideration. And uh, Sweden is now the first country, uh, or was the first country, to op uh, adopt this in clinical routine. We have come up with a um, tool to facilitate this, actually. So uh, you can draw... Um, simply for circles in areas that are representative, like negligible, low, medium, and uh, strong proliferation. And then you have weighting sliders um, with which you can set the proportion of the whole tumor falling into each of these four categories. And uh, once you've done this, um, you already get the calculation of the weighted proliferation score which will of course differ from the hard uh, average um, that you also get as a kind of comparison. Yeah, and uh, Unilabs as one of the um, largest um, laboratory chains in Europe, private laboratory chains, um, actually adopted uh, also this feature in their Swedish laboratories, and uh, this will now spread um, within Europe where they have uh, the labs. Yeah, and the culmination of uh, the evolution of uh, AI in digital pathology in our eyes is uh, what we call zero-click solution. Um, if you consider a whole slide image um, on the left-hand side that uh, was just scanned, um, then um, 
you will see that uh, many AI tools uh, work hand in hand to deliver um, a fully pre-processed image on the right-hand side. So uh, this is the current uh, method of scoring KI67 um, with uh, finding a hotspot, scoring the hotspot, and being done with the slide. And um, what happens in the background is uh, actually this. One part of the algorithm finds tissue on the larger image. A second part segments the found tissue in order to identify the two more areas. Here you see these um, yeah, dark black uh, dots. And if you enhance the magnification, you will see different outlines. These are drawn by an AI part that finds the tumorous areas. Within these tumorous areas, another part of um, the AI algorithms kicks in and um, finds all the cells, as we, or as we already saw. Um, all other cells are excluded. The remaining tumor cells are then further classified into positively and negatively stained tumor cells overlaid with uh, red and yellow dots. And out of the spatial distribution, of uh, these uh, tumor cells, we can then derive um, hotspots and um, they come along with a clinical score. And in a magnification, this looks in, in your manage, image management platform like this. So you have four hotspots. Um, you can just click on the list of hotspots and um, uh, they come already with a proliferation score, as I said, and here you see one of these hotspots um, with an outline. You can uh, check the cells inside and be done very quickly. This um, uh, concept of zero click is of course also available for other uh, biomarkers such as estrogen and progesterone receptors. But here uh, you don't consider um, a hotspot but rather the whole tissue, the whole tumor. And uh, therefore uh, you will get a score for the whole um, tumor. So let me show you this um, also in a live environment. Oh, I have the menu bar here, sorry. Okay. So let's take a KI67 image. You, you are presented with these four hotspots and if uh, we can uh, show and hide the cells. And we can show and hide uh, all these polygons containing uh, two more areas. We can check several areas just to be sure. Maybe we go here. So this is a great tool that helps the pathologist in routine um, to really consider the whole uh, two more areas on the slide. Yeah, and then um, you can uh, switch this off again. This was just a debug view. So in the final product, we don't show uh, all these outlines. And uh, then you go um, to a hotspot, take the first hotspot with the uh, highest proliferation rate. And then you say, well, here I have a folding artifact. I don't want to use it. Um, you go to the second one and uh, here you can hide and show the cells. You go to a third one. Also a folding artifact, not so nice one. And if you agree with um, the results of the AI here, then you are done with the case very quickly. Yeah, for ER and PR, um, I can also show it to you in a live environment. Let's take this image. Now it takes uh, some seconds to load because there are so many cells, roughly 400,000 uh, cells. And what you can see here um, is also a very in, a nice concept. So for example, here um, in the top, of, top part, it's the question of whether it's a DCIS or uh, invasive. If you say, well, in my eyes, it's invasive, you always have an eraser tool with which you can uh, erase uh, smaller or larger parts um, of the image. And um, whatever you do here is live considered um, in the calculation, of course. And therefore, thereby, you as the pathologist stay in full control.
yeah, and this brings me uh, brings me to the conclusion. Um, let's have it here. The AI part um, needs to bring um, some, uh, yeah, some functionalities and some concepts. So the AI needs to be robust and uh, robust against image variability so that it can be used immediately by every laboratory. Um, then the AI uh, needs to deliver results per cell. This way, the pathologist can easily check uh, the result and um, intervene if he is of other opinion. Then the AI needs to be deeply integrated into workflow platforms. For this, the AI provider can uh, come up with an API documented well so that platforms um, have an easy time of integrating it. And then always the question is, uh, do these services run in the cloud or on premise? Um, we have had many discussions in the past about on-premise installations. In the end, nobody chose our on-premise installation so far. So uh, everybody was in the end uh, fine with the cloud service, um, especially as um, uh, things like HIPAA compliance, GDPR compliance, etc., cetera, uh, were fully met. And of course, in, uh, in this ideal picture, the IMS providers, the workflow platform providers, they also need uh, to bring some uh, things to the table. Um, if you think about, for example, um, of your mobile phone as platforms, you can now simply use your preferred apps without being bothered uh, with a setup routines, etc. So um, they should integrate third party AI tools image management platforms uh, should uh, make it accessible or the AI tools accessible in one window, one viewer. So you don't want to switch uh, all the time between different windows, of course. Um, image pre-processing is only possible in a setting uh, where you have uh, an IMS system that is connected uh, to the workflow. So um, this makes the results later immediately accessible upon um, opening of the image. And um, I always get the question, how long does it take to pre-calculate an image? Um, this is usually the scanning time. So you have a case with several IHCs, for example, the ki 67 is scanned, it's pre-calculated and while uh, pre-calculation of the ki 67 runs, the next uh, biomarker such as uh, ER is scanned. Then of course, um, in a fully integrated uh, workflow, reporting can be facilitated and automated and um, together, um, there are many efficiency gains uh, for routine workflow. Uh, we have uh, heard many um, estimations about how much time, uh, time can be saved. If we think about the four regions uh, tool, for example, uh, we have now a data at hand that shows that it's uh, over 85, uh, close to 90% uh, uh, time efficiency, uh, time saved um, if you use uh, such a tool. With this, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Berger. I think that was really a wonderful presentation. Um, it's, it's really very nice the tools that are available. And I'm sorry if I did not catch it. Did you say that I do have a couple of questions, um, but I'll check if anybody from the audience has any questions for you before I start. <laughs> Feel free to leave a message or uh, you could ask the questions directly as well. I don't see any questions in the chat, so perhaps I'll take the opportunity to ask you the first question. Um, when you were talking about your CE marking for KI 67, did you also say that it is CE marked for ER and PR as well? This is the entire panel CE marked? Yeah, so uh, this happened actually uh, last year. And uh, now uh, this year, uh, actually this month, until end of this month, we will have uh, the updated versions, even with the pre-calculation uh, CE marked uh, for KI 67, ER and PR. Um, her too, as a, a new biomarker for uh, our breast panel that we introduced last year, will also receive a CEIVD clearance uh, this year in That's May. Brilliant. 
Thank you so much. That's really interesting. I know that in May we have also been having a change in the IVDR requirements uh, and see marking in Europe. So you know that's going to change the whole uh, approach to how we do it. That's why I was interested. So when when you talked about these different markers, um, I did see that you had included a number of variability in staining and heterogeneity in staining practices as well mm -hmm. as the different scanners. But uh, did you also include any different antibodies that were used? As you know, there are so many different antibodies. Were they also included as part of the uh, validation exercise? Um, it was a handful of antibodies, but we have come to notice that um, at least for uh, ki 67 ER and PR, the um, actual antibody and the staining result does not make uh, so much of a difference. Um, it is a much stronger difference uh, if we think about PDL1, where we will now also mm -hmm. introduce a CE marked tool um, this month. And uh, there, our first product will cover SP263 from Roche. And um, later, we will adopt uh, this to bring out a second algorithm that will be able to cover clones like uh, 22C3, 288, etc. So um, here the staining uh, result is differing a lot. And therefore, uh, we think we need uh, two algorithms yeah, to tackle you. this. So when did, since you spoke about PDL1, um, for SP260, what was the, what is the indication that you're looking at and what the yeah, thank you. Uh, I forget to, uh, forgot to mention this. Um, can um, our goal will be to introduce uh, new tissues, new subtypes of tissues. If there is non-small cell lung cancer, there is obviously also small cell lung cancer. Yes, um, um, PDL1 playing a prominent role in other cancers, such as um, also breast, of course. If it's, for example, a triple negative breast cancer, you would uh, then go for PDL1, for example. But also other tissues like uh, I don't know, a bladder or a gastric. There are so many applications, and currently we see. Um, uh, out of this concept of the companion diagnostics, etc., that sometimes for this tissue you take that, that antibody and so on. Also, uh, there have been um, yeah uh, ideas from pathology labs to you just use one antibody for all the tissues and uh, be done with it. So um, we need to find an AI solution for this. <laughs> Definitely. And your readout for the PDL1 SP263, I know I will stop with that, it'll be my last question. <laughs> uh, the readout for your uh, PDL1 SP263, is it a TCIC or a TPS score? How was it? Um, well, our, our software is actually able to determine uh, all three scores, but we, uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, give out uh, the TPS score because this is what we will have in the CE uh, marking. But um, the software can also give out the CPS score, including the uh, leukocytes, etc., or we can calculate the IC score. So um, uh, in research use only versions um, with the same algorithm, we might uh, be able to display all these other um, scores as well. And for her too, maybe just an addition. Uh, also, uh, many pathologists are now uh, looking at her too low uh, with the new treatments on the horizon. This is something that um, many uh, were not used to doing in yeah. routine. So um, there is maybe uh, not so much experience. And also here AI can help to discriminate, for example, between zero and one plus. Well, yes, definitely. Uh, there's one more question for you. It's a, an optimal use of AI that's wonderful. Would this limit histopathologist demand as it saves time and resources? Um, I don't think so. So our idea is not to make pathologists obsolete, but we want to uh, free them of tedious tasks uh, such as uh, counting uh, so many cells or looking at so many areas. Um, if you work with an AI tool, uh, you will get um, more time to uh, look at cases where your expertise is really um, necessary. We have seen this ER image that I showed you. There were some areas uh, where the AI was not sure whether it is DCIS or uh, invasive. Yeah. And um, if you think um, this was mistakenly uh, shown as um, invasive, it should be DCIS, it shouldn't be considered in the score, then you can erase it. And um, in the end, you will be quick, uh, quicker with your diagnosis. And if you think about uh, patients and uh, cases that you have on your desk or virtual desk, uh, however, um, you can be uh, much more efficient, much more relaxed, and you can uh, do an outstanding job as a pathologist. Completely agree. Thank you so much. 
Um, I think, um, thank you so much. I mean, it was a very, very uh, interesting uh, presentation. And I think there's a lot of interest among the community as well. So all the very best. And thank you once again, Dr. Berger. We'll now proceed to the next thank speaker, you. who is um, Mr. Nir Kadzir from, from Israel um, to start his presentation. Welcome and thank you. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much. My name is indeed Nir Katsir from Applied Spectral Imaging. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. okay. So the presentation today will be on our uh, past fusion uh, offering, which provides a combined solution, as you can see, for HND, IHC, and uh, FISH. Um, SI, uh, actually, I'm in the company from 1993, as well as the company itself. So we are not a young company anymore. Uh, SI offers a, a solutions in the clinical cytogenetics, pathology, and also for the research markets. Our presentation today will be limited to the ASI pathology suite, uh, covering whole slide scanning, IC analysis, tissue matching, and tissue uh, fish. So for this, this was supposed to be the slide. So here are the product that you see, cytogenetics, uh, cytogenetics, pathology, and uh, a research market. So I can say that it is quite acknowledged today that uh, creating a digital pathology workflow with remote access capability should be the goal of every uh, clinical uh, laboratory. Um, I'll uh, start by maybe I added this slide in order to clarify that our solutions are microscope based. I'm talking about a full solution. So unlike uh, uh, companies that provide either scanning or analysis or database, our solution provides all together in a combined and uh, integrated way. Um, uh, even as the simple, as you can see here on the left, the simple uh, manual uh, microscope it can provide uh, solutions to part of the item that I'll show you today. Um, but uh, both the nine slide solution that you see here and the 99 solution that you see there uh, cover the entire offering that uh, we will uh, show today. Once imaging is complete, uh, ASI offers two options for review of the slides, uh, either a physical one um, either physical one or uh, remote or virtual to meet the needs of remote uh, access solution. ASI offers Genesis Anywhere, which provides the flexibility and uh, to, to work safely off-site from either home or different satellite location to perform the remote uh, uh, consultation or analysis. And additionally, our system can connect with the laboratory, laboratory, the, the list, laboratory information system, and you'll be able to type in the information uh, of the patient in your laboratory information system, which will be populated automatically to our system, and vice versa, the results uh, can be returned to the uh, laboratory information system automatically. So the display the workflow that I'm showing you here um, starts from a slide preparation on the top left. Sorry. And continues with several scanning and review steps that includes the fish uh, slide analysis as an option. However, I would like to concentrate on the right. And on the right is the part that the pathologist is uh, uh, in charge of. And as you can see, the first item is the on-screen computer-assisted IHC scoring. Uh, pathologists also review the um, HND or IHC and um, uh, mark uh, tumor regions 
for a further fish analysis to be restricted for those regions. And of course, at the end, validation and approval of the fish analysis that was previously done by the technologist. At this step, the pathologist can also sign out the case and uh, perform uh, reporting. As you can see on the left, there are um, the technology steps involves settings of the slides for scanning, tissue matching, and review of the automated fish analysis, as you can see here on the left after the scan. So there are two workflows that we would like to present, and we'd like to present uh, some uh, uh, videos taken on the actual software. The first will go over the IC review uh, and analysis flow after the slides were scanned. And the second will briefly show our fish analysis after matching between the H and E um, and the fish uh, slide. So this high pass pro video demonstrates the analysis of our IT breast panel uh, breast panel while highlighting some of the unique tools and features of the ASI high pass um, software. We'll begin, we'll begin with this uh, database. This is called case data manager of ours, where you can actually create cases by either manually entering in the demographics or having them imported uh, automatically from your laboratory information system. Slides can be manually entered, or we have multiple slide panels that can be generated based on the most um, uh, common panels in your laboratory. We have many options for review, analyze, reporting, and we have also a robust filtering system to allow one to search for cases based on any of the K slides and cell uh, fields. Once a case is scanned, we can click uh, on that case and see the information populated in the bottom left uh, hand corner. And when you click on the slide, the slide details illustrate the status per particular slide. It's direction to the pathologist. So let us launch tissue, tissue Suite, which is the application for whole slide image review and analysis. We'll begin, we'll begin, we'll begin with the H and E slide. With the tool that you have, uh, you can uh, uh, locate at the bottom of the, you know, on the bottom of the screen, as you see, we can enhance and change brightness. There are counting tools typically used for cell counting. One is able to flip the image and rotate it, as well as indicate any slides or technical notes for this particular uh, slide. You can also compare the 4X scan to the high magnification scan, ensuring that the tissue was detected and captured in full. We've also a toolbar on the top to add slides, indicate tumor areas, measure, take snapshots, and uh, add final results or request for fish. When viewing the slides, you can zoom in and out by jumping automatically to a certain objective power by selecting the correct number where you wish to jump to. Slides are scanned at 20X and you have the ability to zoom in digitally up to 80. You can also use your mouse wheel, of course, to zoom in and out and across the entire region. With a measuring tool, you can perform measurements of the entire tissue section or up to uh, measurements even of an individual cell. And when drawing your tumor regions for matching um, or any other corresponding slide, we have several tools available, a brush tool, circular tool, or even a freehand tool. We have two optional two options in order to add additional slides in the viewer. Our tissue suites allows up to four slides uh, to be viewed at the same time. Right now we will perform tissue matching between all those four. We need to mark actually two matching landmarks on the slides uh, we wish to match. This can be done automatically, but manually enables some additional capabilities. So that's what you see now. We we'll take this thumbtack icon to tag first distinctive locations on each of the slides and then move to the second region and perform these on the, on the second region. And having this step done very equitably as possible enables a, a, a very correct tumor matching uh, later on to be, uh, uh, to be uh, used. So as you can see, once matching was done, the tumor regions from the reference slide are automatically populated across all four slides. And when you 
navigate and zoom through one slide, the corresponding three slides will ensue. If you wish to add additional region, you may do so at any point of the process. You may keep it specific to one individual slide, or by pressing update all regions, it will automatically update the cross. One of our new tools is being able to edit a region without having to redraw it, and that was actually just demonstrated. You can distinguish a control region from a patient sample. When marking a region, you can actually indicate that this is a control region, but still have image analysis occur. This was uh, the laboratory. Uh, this way, the laboratory has uh, documentation that the control regions were analyzed, but those statistics are outside of the patient tumor area. One can perform image analysis on the individual uh, tumor region on the slide or on uh, all scan slides at the same time. To review the analysis, one can actually toggle out a slide to zoom in and select the analysis chart, then there is an option to toggle between the control results and the sample results. So here we have the ER and the HER2 samples and we are reviewing the control area. By pressing the space bar, the user is able to toggle back and forth to see the analysis display and the region within it. And of course, each score cell is, is color coded based on the software rating of its uh, stain intensity 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. You can toggle between the various regions and see the statistics change across the entire slide panel. Uh, and once we go to all regions, you'll be able to see the statistics for all the regions on the slide uh, that were analyzed. With our hyperspectral unmixing background, ESA is able to unmix the color so that you can actually see uh, just the dab or the hematoxylin separate. And for nuclei stain, the software just places dots on the nuclei like you actually saw in the previous presentation. Uh, the color coding is the same as displayed for membrane uh, stain. So once the analysis is complete, and we are able to take snapshots of specific tumor areas across the entire panel. And these images can be then uh, placed uh, on the report. Ensure them in any modification that you want. For completing your results, uh, use the summary tab. The pathologist just need to add his final results in the case result tab, the statistics per slide, uh, and snapshots images will automatically be included in the reports. Um, then we can actually, yes, after the yes, pathologist now can mark the case as completed uh, and generate the report. And these ASI reports are actually custom uh, designed. Here we are actually reviewing the results of the control region, but it's actually the same and uh, we'll see an example report summarizing, summarizing results of all uh, slides that were analyzed. In this case, as you can see, here PRK67, HER2, and the original one on the HM. Fish, as we'll see later on, fish can be added into the same report in a single page. So before we continue to, uh, with a short presentation of the fish flow, I would like to describe a few of the options that relates to the fish uh, capabilities. <clears throat> so as I said, our system is a complete system, including the scanning. And scanning in fish is not so basic like in bright field. You have to, you know, capture is being done in high magnification and you have to take into account the limit of memory and speed that you can afford. So this slide shows a few of our scanning options for tissue fish. If we concentrate first on the left, um, due to the need to restrict the scan of the fish only to the tumor regions within the tissue, we provide a flow that enables the pathologist to mark the tumor regions on the HME, or if he wants the IHC slide, which is then automatically populated to the fish slide after they are digitally aligned. I'll show a short video showing this part in a second. On the middle, you can see a different flow, that uh, alternative flow that uh, identifies the tissue first automatically, in the, and then in a 
uh, it's being done, of course, in a few seconds of pre-scan. And then it captures all the slides in 3D, full color, and so on, all the area, all the tissues, sorry, all the tissue area. The analysis can then be restricted so that you'll not get millions of cells. The analysis is then restricted to specific regions of the tumor after you review them visually on the screen. This, of course, uh, flow is typically selected for small tissue regions like needle biopsies in order to limit the amount of data. And on the right, you see a third option, um, a flow that is a more interactive flow. It enables the user to define a specific field of view for capture and analysis based on what you see through the eyepiece. Uh, some prefers, each, each one prefers a different flow, and actually those are not the only one. Uh, for suspension samples like cytology or um, hematology, there are other special flows, but we will not address them uh, here. So I would like to address the issue of the confidence in the result that you achieve with, with our system. There are many features that contribute to this confidence. I'll just mention a few of the ones that you see here. Major uh, gaining confidence is achieved due to the accuracy or to the accurate definition of the tumor area, of the, yes, of the tumor area. The, this is done, as you saw, based on the high resolution digital HD image and then digitally matched to the fish. Uh, in relation to the IHC analysis, the system provides accurate quantitative IHC analysis based on thousands of cells. And so for nuclei or you know, membrane expression like K67, HER2, and others. And uh, so the statistics is, is uh, much, much more accurate and manual. And we saw it also in the previous uh, a presentation. Fish and fish signals are detected in 3D and enhanced to ensure accurate classification even for faintest signals. And uh, this helps a lot. Fish is, is much harder to score, uh, of course. And let's see a five minutes uh, uh, video of the, of the fish uh, part. So this product is called Pass Fusion because it's actually a fusion of both the fish and the bright field uh, capabilities that you've seen before. We'll begin by uh, selecting, we'll begin by selecting uh, the case in the case data manager and open it in tissue suite as you saw before. And when tissue suite launches, we will see that the pathologist has already defined the tumor regions. and he defined, it, he defined them on the H&E slide. The fish technologist has already scanned the fish slide under a low power objective and is now performing just the tissue uh, section matching. Similar to what we saw before, actually, we find two areas that are identical on both slides. And once those landmarks areas are ident uh, ident uh, indicated, the software will uh, realign the bright field slide so that it orients itself to match the fish. And of course, the tumor regions are automatically marked, will be marked on the fish uh, slide. However, in real life, in real life scenarios, some tumor sections, when going through the mi microtomy process, do shift and change. So we have the ability to manually, as you can see here, update like we did for region number five. So there are a lot of fine tuning that needs to be done in fish. Now the slide, now we'll return to the scanner for high power imaging of all these regions. It's, and the, the system is uh, available for image analysis. Here is a result after automatic capture in high power of the tumor area. And we can review the frames that were indicated during tissue match. You can see them, each one of the region has few regions. In this example, the laboratory has selected to capture only four frames per region. Analysis was performed automatically on all frames that were captured, and we can review the cell that were classified into their groups, you know, one to five per the CAP ASCO uh, uh, guidelines, the latest one. You can see here the signal map uh, showing how many cells fall into each red uh, and green count. And in reviewing the frame, we can actually display the cells as they are classified according to the signal pattern. 
that are color coded um, as well as distinguish to distinguish which group each cell uh, is placed in. And the cell is highlighted, as you can see here on the right, it will appear on the zoomed in image on the right with a multi-layer panel display directly below. The, enhance, the enhancement tab allows the end user to increase or decrease the, bright field, the brightness uh, of each uh, individual color. And with a 3D uh, option, as you see currently, you're able to toggle through each Z stack layer, either on the composite image or each one of the separate individual uh, filters. So we are keeping all the information that relates. The user does not need a microscope in order to review the data. He will actually see the data even better here. And the technologist, of course, can add, remove cells or regions and verify that indeed the tumor cells that were automatically segmented and scrolled correctly represents the, the tumor. He is doing it over several frames and then uh, it's ready for the pathologist or director for review and uh, approval. So now we are moving back to tissue suite, which is the pathologist uh, application. Signing in as the pathologist, uh, signing by the pathologist or the director. So we are now in the third tab. We've seen the first and second before. We are able in this tissue suite fish result tab to review all the statistics that were calculated during the analysis. And uh, uh, now we can see how each cell is placed into the different group, the classes, the amplification ratio, the regions can be displayed as and, and, and specific frames. It can be either in four blocks or specific frames. Uh, we can actually see the original or unenhanced image that was captured from the microscope and toggle back and forth to the, um, uh, to the enhanced image and the analyzed one. And the important part is actually on the left. We can actually navigate through different regions and frames in multiple ways. One option is to navigate through this slide viewer and you can actually zoom in and out between the different regions uh, on dry field on fluorescent slide as well. And this is very important for the pathologist as you can double check that the anal analyzed region and even cells are indeed the relevant tumor ones. We have skipped already to the uh, summary tab and, uh, and in the summary tab, the pathologist can create the report. And here you can see an example report. This report includes only the Asian and the T in a single uh, page, but as you saw before, it can combine all the slides that we customized based on the laboratory needs. And the data can be, of course, transferred automatically to the, automatically to the uh, LIS uh, system. So to summarize, that were uh, mentioned uh, before. So first, uh, when we are scanning the bright field uh, slides, our scanning captures optimal focus at each point, not like other systems. We actually perform focus per point in order to ensure sharpest uh, image, even if the uh, slide is non flat We also incorporate the color calibration process to ensure that the image that you see uh, image that you see on the on on the screen will be identical with its color and, and sharpness to the image that you see through your uh, through your uh, eyepiece. This is important for the pathologist. Uh, we saw how landmarks are uh, defined in order to perform the registration. We saw how uh, regions are matched and shown over all. Uh, the slides simultaneously. The system is not limited to four, but only up to four you can uh, view together. The IHC is performed uh, on the entire uh, regions together, all the slides together or per specific slide as uh, requested. 
Now a flexible uh, uh, displays and simultaneous display, as I said, of up to four slides together. There is ability to perform statistics globally or per region. Here you can see an example of uh, looking, of, of selecting a specific region and showing the statistics per this specific region. And also, of course, here you can see that the statistics was changed. And now you see the statistics over the entire uh, analyzed regions. Switching to the fish flow now, the HMD and IC slides are first came to review, identify, and quantify the tumor. That's what you see on the left. Tumor is marked and then matched with a fish pre scan to identify the tumor regions on the fish uh, slide here on item two. And those tumor regions are then scanned automatically in high magnification. Typically, we do it in 60x with all probes, color, in 3D to ensure all signals are accurately captured. Analysis can be done in parallel to the capture process, but the review can then be done on the either same station or remote, or remote station. The analysis is then reviewed by the pathologist, follow, following by reporting and sign, out, uh, sign up uh, the case. And I'd like to stress that the ability to uh, define the, unlike you know, the course marking that you do with those uh, markers, um, with digital marking, you can get to very accurate definition of the tumor, as you can see. And in the tissue suite application, it enables the pathologist to review the fish results and uh, identify the exact location of each field of view, both in the h &D and the fish slide, as you saw here on the, on the slide viewer. This further increases the confidence of the pathologist, ensuring that the cells that were scored are indeed the tumor cells of analysis. This is a major advantage to the pathologist, this capability, not just to mark and tell the technologist what to do, but also review what the technologist did and kind of double check the result. If the cuts are good, you might even get to a, a per cell, per cell uh, matching, almost, almost per cell per location matching between uh, one slide to the other. And in regards to the fish samples, labs take comfort in knowing that our fish software is actually FDA approved for ALK, Eurovision, and the entire breast uh, uh, panel, including the hair to fish, and of course, the, I, the entire panel for the IC. In addition, our algorithms detect break apart, fusions, two, three, even four colocalized signals of fusions simultaneously on the same point and uh, practically any probe type can be analyzed. Uh, we are done with this presentation. I just want to mention, in, uh, to mention in 20 seconds that there are other more basic solutions like this M counter that enables you to do the analysis and review all the eyepieces of the microscope and just it enables you to score it digitally without a mechanical or electronic counter. You have our fish view that enables to capture without the analysis part just capture for documentation. And you have this very attractive spot scan interactive solution that still can use any of your microscope, manual microscope, no automation needed, no automatic stages needed. And still the entire analysis will be automated, meaning all the images that you captured, the cells will be identical, I, 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 just segmented and detected automatically. Signal will be detected and cells will be classified based on their signal pattern. That's it, thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, hello. We hear you. Hi, how are you, Dr. Katsuya? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, before I introduce myself, I would like to invite audience to ask the questions. If any questions for Mr. Nir Katsuya, 
about this wonderful presentation, Accurate Digital Pathology in Brightfield and Fluorescence. Any questions? You can always also post your questions to chat box and we will discuss later. If there is any question at the end of the presentations. All right, seems there's no question, Mr. Nia. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, for this interesting presentation. Now, uh, okay, before we proceed, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Ali Mokhtarpour from Norspur Diagnostic Laboratory in Iran, and I will be chairing the, next, uh, the sessions for, uh, for the next few hours. And uh, for now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Manjari Kisho from India. Dr. Manjari. So she will be... Uh, actually launching uh, her book on endometrial cells in pap smear, a clue to underlying pathology. All right, Dr. Manjari, so the stage is yours. Thank you, sir. Please in okay, introduce yourself and start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so my slide is visible? Uh, not yet, Doctor. Have you have you slide shared your screen? Visible. Can you share your screen? The green button? Yeah, yes. Yeah, At the bottom? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you just share your screen, please. Yeah, just try to um, yeah. open your presentation and yeah, I yeah. think it's coming up. Good, here you go. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Manjari Kishore. I'm working as an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology, Noida International Institute of Medical Science. It's in Greater Noida, India. And actually, uh, I was studying, I had uh, done a research on this topic. So I finally thought I should write a book on this topic because it's a very uh, common thing. Normally, we see pap smear for cervical cancer. So it becomes a very simple tool where we can detect and uh, sorry, cervical cancer. The patient can be given early diagnosis for the cervical cancers. And, uh, but still we can use pap smear for detecting other endometrial pathology as well. So in this book, actually I have tried to, uh, like this is basically a book, a comprehensive atlas-based uh, guide, which will be helpful for the residents and practitioners in department of pathology, as well as obstetrics and gynae because I've gone through uh, literature also. There are so many papers on this topic, but actually because of limited data and uh, because of we don't see endometrial cells so uh, like uh, cautiously as we see the uh, endocervical cells. So we miss out some endometrial cells and in retrograde, what we do is we miss endometrial pathology in such female patients in which we can give an early diagnosis. So basically in this book, what I have done is a uh, detailed research uh, analysis of this topic, along with the uh, proper images, the cytological images showing the normal, atypical, and malignant endometrial cells, and the corresponding histology image of uh, uh, such patients, like uh, what pathology they got after we reported endometrial cells in those pap smear. So as we all know, endometrial carcinoma is one of the most common malignancy. In fact, in West, it is more common as compared to cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is seen in like developing countries like ours, but still uh, like we are not able to contain it or stop it, but uh, still with such a simple screening tool. So this screening tool can be employed to detect endometrial carcinoma. 
so as such till till date there is no any widely accepted screening test for endometrial carcinoma and so, hence we can use the simple papanicolo test that is the pap test we commonly call it for screening of cervical cancer so as i said it can also be used for detecting endometrial abnormalities and this book what i am highlighting is is the role of endometrial cells in pap smear in prediction of endometrial pathology like if we get normal endometrial cells in pap smear there definitely be some kind of pathology which is going on in endometrium maybe it can be leiomyoma or it can be any kind of polyp but if we are getting definite abnormal or malignant endometrial cells in pap smear it is reported to be highly associated with significant endometrial pathology so in this book there are beautiful illustrations of normal atypical and malignant endometrial cells in pap smear along with their detailed histological images so i have already introduced myself uh, i did fellowship in nephropathology also under international society of nephropathology and my special area of interest are oncopath renal pathology and molecular diagnostic and till date i have written about 75 papers in various national and international journal and presented many papers and poster as well so this is the overview of my book It's available online now on Amazon, Flipkart, online everywhere. So this is the front image and this is the back. So basically, it is highlighting. It's a research topic which uh, needs to be validated more. Like if we come up with more and more data, so it will compile us in giving a definite uh, screening test for endometrial carcinoma also. so endometrial carcinoma it it has actually a huge toll 97% of all the uterine carcinoma it accounts for it and arise from glands in the endometrium so goal of site cervical cytology cytology which is done rampantly in various camps and then every in a hospital like we have given certain guidelines according to age also like which which female should be like uh, they should go undergo pap test so there are different guidelines along with cervical uh, pap smear hpv testing is also required so uh, like what but it can also be used to detect endometrial abnormalities so that is the highlight of the topic so what we see is that over 60% of cervical smear which are obtained from women in the first few days of menstrual cycle they may have endometrial cells however if normal endometrial cells are observed in smear when physiological exfoliation so when the normal exfoliation is expected so that is normal but if we are seeing in the second half of menstrual cycle so then the pathological significance becomes greater hence the proper dates of the menstruation should be known should be clearly mentioned in the form and hence then we can correlate like if we are getting endometrial cells in the second half of menstrual cycle so the patient will have significant pathological association so now spontaneously exfoliated benign endometrial cells they might indicate endometrial pathology in post menopausal women then we have to work up more so we have to concentrate on the second half of menstruation then elder adult females mainly post menopausal uh, post menopausal female or female on uh, hormonal replacement therapies and if and uh, uh, abnormal endometrial cells are reported then uh, 100% we have to subject that female for histopathology so basically the aim of our study and the writing behind this book was to ascertain the relevance of endometrial cells in detecting uh, detected in the routine cervical pap smear to predict what is the underlying pathology in females so what we did we reviewed 3 years of uh, pap smear of 3 years over 29736 pap smear were reviewed and inclusion like we included all the pap smear which had endometrial cells be it benign atypical or uh, malignant then we excluded the pap smear which did not have endometrial cells so what we got out of 29736 conventional pap smear 189 smear showed endometrial cells so just 0.64% showed and we included this in our study so 189 were the uh, our subject so here we can see the frequency of the endometrial cells in different age group so what we are seeing is endometrial cells are more common in age group of 41 to 50 years and what this is a distribution of the symptom how the female presented like mainly it was for screening like in uh, like 30 to 35 years they come for screening uh, for the of the pap smear then uh, menorrhagia was the most common symptom followed by post menopausal bleeding dysfunctional uterine bleeding polymenorrhea followed by uti y discharge ca breast others 
so mainly they were presented with menorrhagia and post menopausal uh, bleeding so hence we have to concentrate on post menopausal female more and along with the second half of the menstruation so what we did like out of 189 smear we divided this group into two category one was the normal endometrial cells and second category included the abnormal like atypical or malignant endometrial cells which we can see on cytology so out of 189 169 were normal appearing benign endometrial cells and 20 came in our second category of atypical and abnormal so here we can see these are the small clusters of benign endometrial cells here we can see and very well differentiated from the normal endo endocervical cells which we see routinely in our pap smear and background the showing the other squamous epithelial cells then these are uh, again uh, image showing sheets of benign endometrial cells we can very well differentiate it from the background squamous epithelial cells and here uh, the top hat like appearance dense 3d aggregate of benign endometrial cells also and the classic top hat appearance is appreciable in these so these all slides these all slides uh, are there uh, from uh, our study like these are the original slide which we reviewed because in some cases reporting of endometrial cells were missed by because we don't usually tend to report endometrial cells in pap smear but now in fact according to bethesda system also reporting of endometrial cells has become mandatory in 45 year earlier it was to uh, sorry 40 years now it they have it has increased it has been increased to 45 years because 40 to 45 years 40 years it was not found so significant but when we see 45 years above they had significant uh, endometrial pathology uh, underlying in them so in fact we saw in our group also like 41 to 50 year of age group was the uh, group which had maximum number of uh, endometrial cells so this was the uh, image similarly we can see some clusters of degenerating benign endometrial cells also and here we can see benign endometrial cells with cytoplasmic vacuolation so we have to take history like of any uh, like it cannot it should not mimic with any atypia or uh, like any atypical cells so we have like patient was on uh, hormone replacement therapy in post menopausal age so we can appreciate some cytoplasmic vacuolation as well in this slide so this again dense cluster of benign endometrial cells with neutrophilic rimming so in the rim we can see the neutrophils now coming to atypical so here we can see high nc ratio the endometrial cells uh, are increased in size along with neutrophils and debris so this is the high part of the same few cells which we are seeing here similarly atypical endometrial cells with in neutrophils so all the criteria of neutro uh, it, normal atypical and malignant endometrial cells should be clearly made out again we can see some hyperchromatic atypical endometrial cells so these all patients in which, whichever we got normal endometrial cells or abnormal endometrial cells were subjected to biopsy again we can see degenerating atypical endometrial cells so here very well appreciable malignant endometrial cells clusters uh, in cluster in both a and b image so here also hyperchromatic malignant endometrial cells with neutrophils background inflammation so actually in conventional pap smear it becomes a bit difficult to see the morphology of the cell when we have background inflammation and hemorrhage so this was a tedious job because we reviewed the conventional uh, pap smear so similarly this study can be taken on the liquid based smear also like uh, sure path or thin prap so those slides they had they uh, like they eliminate the background elements of neutro uh, inflammation and hemorrhage so the cell become more appreciable so again sheets of malignant uh, endometrial cells so overall frequency wise like uh, we had 89% benign endometrial cells out of 189 cases and 11 cases 11% had uh, endometri abnormal endometrial cells so this is just a representation like how many had top hat how many had abnormal uh, like stromal cells in the background along with histiocytes and necrotic debris <coughs> sorry so this was the biopsy finding so what we saw was leomyoma was the most common uh, this is the distribution of the biopsy of the this uh, uh, patients who were subjected for biopsy so leomyoma was the most common followed by secretory endometrium then endometrial polyp then proliferative endometrium endometrial hyperplasia endometrial carcinoma adenomyosis actually we got endometrial cells in 189 patients so if the data is more 
so that's why more and more research are welcome for this so endometrial cells what we got this endometrial cells why it becomes significant is we in this patient there was benign endometrial cells in pap smear so that female she presented uh, on biopsy she presented with endometrial carcinoma so that's why reporting of benign endometrial cells in pap smear becomes significant so even one case if we can detect so that saves the life of the patient so in fact bethesda also recommends that we have to report benign endometrial cells in 45 years of female 45 years and above so they can also it is easy to like they can be diagnosed with cancer at an early stage so this was the pap smear and this is the corresponding histo section from the the surgically resected specimen so here we can see this is the benign endometrial cells and here corresponding histopath image showing a poorly differentiated carcinoma so this was there in the female which the benign endometrial cells so in abnormal endometrial cells uh, whatever abnormal endometrial cells we 20 cases we got abnormal endometrial cells in pap smear so those 20 they had significantly associated malignancy so this case was out of 169 patient who presented with benign endometrial cells and we got one case who presented with malignancy so here we can see atypical endometrial cells with histiocytes and neutrophils and again corresponding histopath image showing poorly differentiated endometrial carcinoma grade 3 again cluster of atypical endometrial cells with neutrophils and debris so here we can see endometrial hyperplasia similarly so this is the corresponding pap smear and this is the corresponding histopath showing this this is showing grade 1 will uh, willow glandular endometrial carcinoma similarly cluster of endometrial cells with malignant endometrial cells with neutrophil and debris and corresponding histopath showing poorly differentiated carcinoma so out of uh, with so that was the benign endometrial cells before uh, what we saw that one case we got ab abnormal in uh, this is the uh, this is the distribution of the female who presented with abnormal endometrial cells in pap smear and corresponding biopsy so out maximum had endometrial carcinoma like if we get abnormal endometrial cells in pap smear definitely the female will have significant pathology so what we got was 75% presented with endometrial carcinoma one two case presented with endometrial hyperplasia and one or two case presented as secretory endometrium so this was the age distribution and the epidemiological factor age benign endometrial cells it was actually extreme but majority were between 41 to 50 years of age and abnormal was so we can see the narrowing of the age range so maximum was between 50 to 60 years of age so this is the common age is 51 to 60 and benign is 41 to 50 so symptomatic case when we consider it is more in case of uh, like uh, 100 out more, more in case of abnormal endometrial cells they presented with significant abnormal uh, uterine bleeding then uh, the postmenopausal bleeding dysfunctional uterine bleeding and significant endometrial pathology when we consider out of 20 case seven cases presented with significant endometrial pathology like if we get abnormal or malignant the patient had endometrial carcinoma on biopsy and we consider less than 40 and more than 40 so post menopausal bleeding was the most common mean age was around 50 and uh, abnormal endometrial cells were present in more number of cases so more than 40 less than 40 we not require but now in fact it has been increased to 5 more years so 45 years we have to report benign endometrial cells in pap smear so this is just the presentation of the cases like less than 40 more than 40 who were had biopsy and what was the correlation so significant endometrial pathology was present so when we consider symptomatic or asymptomatic definitely the symptomatic women they have significant endometrial pathology and when they have uh, underlying malignancy so they will present with some kind of uh, this so coming to a uh, significant kind of pathology so this pap test which was introduced 80 years ago now it is actually a very rampantly used procedure in cervical cancer screening so it is currently like in contrast endometrial carcinoma now it is coming more common in fact in our country also what we are seeing endometrial carcinoma is taking ahead of the cervical carcinoma also and but it uh, like when we have to for a screening test it has to pass through the economy also like it it should not be so costly that it cannot be applied on a large scale so it has been observed that the pap test has 
if low sensitivity still low positive predictive value in detection of endometrial cancer though there is a discrepancy regarding clinical significance of finding benign exfoliated endometrial cells in pap smear like whether we should report benign endometrial cells or not like if we get abnormal or malignant definitely it will raise a hue and cry and then patient will go undergo biopsy but in fact if we are getting benign endometrial cells also then we have to report it the various study were done in fact now recent study also are done i have not added here like uh, they or what they got was prevalence of significant endometrial pathology was there in 35 some 22% 14% 32% cases in our case it was 32% significant pathology was got in the female with benign and malignant endometrial cells and number of carcinoma cases so it was like if we get benign endometrial cells like lai et al he got significant number of uh, like endometrial carcinoma out of 81 he got 16 patient with endometrial carcinoma we got only one case in out of benign endometrial cells but this was a study which got so there is a actually a discrepancy in the different study but definitely if we are getting benign and patient is able to maybe some pathogenesis which is going on shedding of the endometrial cells because of some endometrial pathology which is going on so that makes endometrial cells shed in the uh, like cervical smear similarly significant endometrial pathology was is got in various study so to uh, conclude i would like to say that what we have studied like first and second half so if, even if we uh, like don't consider the first half because that is physiological so if a female is giving the pap smear in second half of menstrual cycle and asymptomatic menstruating women they are not so likely to be associated with significant they may present with leiomyoma what we had seen in our study leiomyoma or endometrial polyp so uh, uh, if not clinically indicated uh, further investigations may not be required but if patients are symptomatic on women age more than 40 or 45 years even with benign endometrial cells so first category secondly if we see it in post menopausal women with or without symptom second category and in women with abnormal endometrial cells so these three classes so they become more important where we have to report like in post menopausal with or without symptom women with abnormal definitely and symptomatic more than 45 years 40 to 45 years so like we don't usually we don't get proper history or clinical information regarding the symptom or the menstrual status of the patient so then we can uh, like use the age as the uh, main criteria to as uh, to like uh, stratify the risk of an underlying endometrial carcinoma so these are few references so i hope this book will like inculcate a bit of more research in this field and uh, like being a small topic but i think it should be like uh, made uh, it should be considered in the routine practice like reporting of endometrial cells should be highlighted like as we see endocervical cells thank you so much thank you so much dr manjari kishore uh I would like to invite audience to ask the question. Actually, there is one question already in the chat box. So, uh, what were the different pathology and uh, actually different cervical pathology? I think the different pathologies noted in all cases of endometrial cells on pap smear. So, different so cervical pathology, <clears throat> like when we got uh, like malignant endometrial cells. So, there were reactive changes in the endocervical cells. but the endocervical cells were like with no uh, atp or marked nuclear pleomorphism was seen so they <clears throat> they had reactive changes when the malignant mm -hmm. abnormal cells were there and in cases where benign endometrial cells were there we got similarly we got cervical like endo normal endocervical cells in sheets and cluster few presented with endocervicitis like some kind right. of but no significant pathology was seen in cervical uh, cancer like cervical okay. lesions so both were not associated okay. like what we got mm -hmm. uh so <clears throat> my question uh, do you report any kind of uh, endometrial cells in pap smears uh, regardless of their menstrual status i mean 45 years age let's say the patient is 45 years old and uh, would you report routinely in your uh, in, in your practice that, uh, that there is yes and now we have started uh, actually endometrial cells 
Yeah, like initially it was not. So that's why when we were retrieving yeah. the data, so few patients, yeah. like many many pathologists, they don't tend to report endometrial cells when they see right. benign. Yes. So they skip it. So we had to look back into those slides and then re mm. re report it. So there were few cases yeah. where we had to re report the endometrial cells. And in fact, in one or two, we got abnormal endometrial cells also, like few clusters. So then we subject yeah. uh, like we went back to the histopath reports and they had significant pathology. So normally you report anyway, I mean, and regardless so now we have started reporting stuff. according to Bethesda, like yeah. if we get endometrial in 45 yeah. plus, so we have started reporting. Yeah. So last okay. one year okay. we are reporting okay. the same way. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thanks. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank is there you any so question? Much. Any question from uh, Dr. Manjari Kisho? Uh, actually, it was a nice presentation and a uh, nice book on endometrial cells and pap smear, a clue to underlying pathology. Thank, Thank you very sir. much, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mrs. Sherry Scott from UK. So yeah. she will be presenting on laboratory sustainability, how to embed sustainable practices into the healthcare laboratory. Uh, Ms. Scott? Oh, hi, uh, everyone. Can you just confirm hi. that you can see my slides? Uh, I, yes, yes. Now we can see your presentation. Brilliant. Thank Could you Could you please much. introduce yourself and start your presentation? Thank you. Will do. Thank you. So um, thank you for inviting me along to speak to you all today. Uh, so I am Sherry Scott. So I am a uh, senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Um, I am what's called a practice-based lecturer. So I have come from working in clinical practice and I've got a clinical biochemistry background. So I use my practice from experience to inform my teaching and to remain professionally active with my professional body, the Institute of Biomedical Science. So just really just to um, introduce my talk, I'm going to just sort of go over some of the key concepts of sustainability and how we can embed that into uh, laboratory practice for a more sustainable future. So learning objectives of today, just help you understand that concept of sustainability, help gain some knowledge on the different laboratory sustainable practices and help you to relate sustainable concepts to peers uh, and also to your actual lab practice. So my background, um, so I have worked in a clinical laboratory for over 21 years. Uh, as I've mentioned, that's biochemistry. And I had a numeral roles in that environment. I um, trained and then became a senior lab manager and looked after the, the training in the laboratory. I have a fellowship membership with the IBMS and I'm also a chartered scientist. And my continued roles with that uh, professional body include the advisory panel membership. Um, I'm an editorial board member for the British Journal of Biomedical Science, and I hold science council roles and um, where I perform assessments for professional registration. And it was through those professional roles that I became really interested in the concept of sustainability. And sustainability is that balance between the environment, equity and economy. And there's been a lot of work recently um, in developing sustainability development goals where the UN has come up with these 17 global goals, which replace the Millennium Development Goals to try and embed sustainable development. And that sustainability is about being able to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's well documented that our changing climate is leading to, a more, to more frequent heat waves and that extreme weather events are going on, such as floods, um, droughts, and increased fires. And there is also growing evidence that um, there's health impacts of climate change, such as the air pollution that's affecting the number and the um, of people suffering with asthma, there's increased levels of heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, and there's also this increased potential spread of infectious disease. Now, I've got a very short video, but I'm not sure if it will play through the screen, but we'll, we'll give it a go.
I'm not sure the sound is working actually, but you can find this video through um, YouTube and I will include, I'm happy for you to share the slides to do so. But it's basically looking at the Lancet countdown and tracking that progress of health and climate change. So what it really means is what can we do to try and mitigate these risks of, to the climate? And our university is a green, green university. It's one of the fifth most sustainable universities in the, in the world. We've got um, a larger degree of biodiversity across the campus. We've got, we embrace green spaces. We've got sustainable, sustainable methods of transport. We've got sustainable construction with some of our buildings actually having a negative zero footprint. We make sure we recycle our waste, watch our energy consumption and our carbon production. We ensure that we've got engagement of staff and students in sustainable practices and that we ensure that we've got a, a good catering and procurement policy to ensure fair trade. And it's because of this that I've started um, looking at how I can increase my sustainability activities within the university. So I'm a representative on our Sustainability Development Academic Forum. So I look to help increase sustainable education within our curriculum. Now, as course lead of an apprenticeship, I have students that work in a clinical lab environment and come on to study one day a week at the university. So I wanted to embed in their education, the lab sustainability um, objectives, so that they could take them back and spread the word within their own workplaces. I also provide those seminars and, and uh, workshops for the students. So get, again, when they leave our university, they can take those practices beyond. So why embed sustainability into the curriculum? Well, climate change is more apparent from that, the real life events. It's becoming more and more um, featuring in employability skills. So we want our students to be employable within the different healthcare professions and the lab environment. It's showing up in professional registration. The Science Council now have sustainability within their standards. And it's appearing in our um, curriculum benchmarks and university initiatives. So we need to incorporate that in our teaching. And because I am a professional uh, and I professional practice, I need to also help the professionals in the workplace to understand sustainability. So some of those um, current collaborative projects I've got going here is I am an active advocate for sustainability within my profession. And I am developing and launching a clinical laboratory sustainability network through um, Centres for Sustainable Healthcare, which any member um, of the UK and beyond can join to, to facilitate resources and knowledge on sustainability within the laboratory. I am working with the European Federation of Laboratory Medicine as a core member of their task force to promote green laboratory practice. I'm working with Health Education England to promote those educational materials. And I'm working with key stakeholders such as um, the LEAF um, framework and My Green Lab to try and establish um, methods of uh, validation and methods of uh, certification for those clinical laboratories so that they can work towards that more sustainable practice. So I really want to bring that into how we can practice you as pathologists within your own workplace. So the carbon footprint, it's a circular, um, circular pattern. We have to look at not only what we, carbon we are producing within our current practice, but also where the carbon has been produced in the procurement and the um, resources that we use. NHS England and NHS Improvement are leading sustainability. So our, how healthcare system has got a good, solid sustainability agenda. And its core approach is the development of looking at balance, the different needs of both the environment, social and economic limitations. They have a greener NHS plan, which aims to tackle the climate change by reducing the emissions. And we've got various um, initiatives such as Getting It Right First Time, which aims to better improve the health and the facilities to 
of uh, improving that health. So our greener NHS is about the care um, that we provide. It's about the medicines and the supply chains of the patients. We look at the travel and transport within our healthcare, and we embed sustainability in our innovation. We look at our heating and lighting in the NHS, and we look at how we can adapt our efforts and build resilience of the workforce. And we have those key fundamental values that are led by the government. Our professional bodies are embedded, as I've said, that's sustainability. So they've got their own, their own policies and agendas. And whether it's from reducing plastic as part of their um, um, sending out their magazine, or whether it's those standards that we're all trying to work towards that code of conduct. But the main areas of focus is within our lab practice. And the, there are four fundamental areas that we can make a difference. We can look at the uh, waste and reducing plastics within our laboratories. We look, can look at the water we use and the waste we produce that might affect that water. And we can look at embedding greener chemistry principles within to our practice. We can look at how we can reduce the energy that we consume and use, and we can consider our health and well-being. So um, Universities College London have produced a great poster that sort of really shares with you 10 ways to reduce plastics in laboratories. Now, what I've found during my research um, in the last 12 months is there are lots of resources out there for research and academic labs, but there is not a great deal that can be fundamentally applied to the pathology departments. So we need to be um, proactive and look for how we can take those research initiatives and embed into uh, the pathology department. So we take, need to take a closer look at our suppliers, our procurement. Can the packaging we receive the reagents or our consumables in be sent back to those suppliers? Are there opportunities within the lab to use glass instead of plastic? And if we have to use plastic, is there a way that we can make it reusable? Do we require gloves for all the procedures that we perform within the laboratory? Or are there key procedures where we need to use those gloves? And is there a method of being able to recycle contaminated plastics and contaminated gloves? If we have any leftover plastic containers, is there a possibility to use them elsewhere? And I've got some examples later on in the slides. Can we purchase flexible kits? Can we refill what we're using? Can we recycle the packaging that we're receiving our consumables in? And in some cases, can we create reagents and kits in-house? Could we buy in bulk and could we share the delivery with our other departments in the pathology department? Can we downsize what plastics we use? And just one example of is uh, uh, for plastic um, reduction is using tip boxes that can be reloaded. So it's a way of thinking about our current practice and adapting it and, and consider those core principles uh, versus sustainability. Greener chemistry is about looking at the waste that we produce. Now, there is a lot of a more regulation within the pathology department than there is within the uh, uh, research and, and academic labs. So we need to work within that regulation. But there are things we can look at. Do the chemi chemicals we use, are there less hazardous alternatives? Are there benign solvents and auxiliaries so that we can use? Think about the, the temperatures that we use, think about the catalysts uh, that these re the reagents, and there's some really good research projects going on, potentially looking at why we can embed greener chemistry. Obviously, there's some things we can't change, and that's where we need to look at the way we work within our laboratories. The sheer number of the, our carbon footprint and the number of um, waste that we produce is directly linked to the number of samples that are, are coming through our labs. So it's a way of we need to actually work with 
our clinicians, work with our patient-facing prof um, professionals and our GP services, at looking at whether there is a looking at the education of whether a test is really needed, and about getting it right first time. If a patient needs more than one sample taking because there's been an error at some point in that patient pathway, we're going to be using twice as many resources as we really would initially need to use. We need to look at ways we can reduce the energy within the lab. So if we use a fume hood, can we close the sash? Can we put autoclaves on standby mode? Can we set our freezers lower? There is no research out there to say that minus 70 is any, has an impact on our results more than minus 80. But that's essentially where we can get students to do mini projects to check that, that, that research. We can turn off our equipment when not in use. And if we've, we use timers within our homes, why can't we use timers within the workplace so that that equipment is ready to use when we need it again, but it's switched off when it's not? We need to properly maintain our cold storage. So if we are using fridges and freezers, are they regularly cleared out? Are they regularly checked for the temperature and that they're working to efficiently? We need to be able to share equipment amongst our labs and, and turn off any duplicate equipment we've got within the workplaces so that we're not using what we don't need to. And if we're not in there out of hours, we need to make sure that we've got lights turned off over those, those, um, those time frames, and also that we use LED lighting where possible that has got motion sensor the test, so the lights switch themselves off. And we need to be able to share the sustainability efforts and encourage others to change their behaviors. So it's not all about the, the chemistries that we use or the plastic or the waste, though. It's also about looking after each other. One of the sustainability goals is looking at health and well-being. And we need to remember that we are fundamental in that patient pathway, that 70% of diagnoses are made within the pathology department. So we need to look at it. We need to ensure that we eat healthy, that we get regular exercise, that we look after our mental health and well-being, that we get the right nutrition, the right hydration, that we use the PPE. We need to make sure we get sufficient sleep and have that healthy work-life balance. And there's various initiatives going on within our um, NHS service and beyond to help support that. And we need to have conversations with our suppliers and partners. We can't do this on our own. We need to work together. And if you go on just a few of the mentioned um, companies on this slide, they have their own sustainability agendas and they are looking to work with you to reduce those um, plastics, to reduce that waste, to use those greener chemistry principles. So it's time to have a bit of a, a thought, a discussion with yourself. What do current labs do? Are there any areas that we can make an impact on our own practice? Go away and have the discussions with your colleagues, with your mentors, with your uh, managers, and work to those six R, uh, R principles, reduce, reuse, recycle, repair, rethink, and restore. Here are just some examples from social media when I was in conversations with, with colleagues, closing the slash, defrosting the freezers, switching off, making sure we turn that tap, um, affix any uh, leaks, using those greener chemistries, keeping an inventory so that we don't order uh, unnecessarily. And also it's just looking at our own individual practices. We need to buy and think green. Here is an example uh, by a green IVF lab of how they are inviting colleagues to reuse some of their plastics so they don't go into the waste. So we need to think about how we can reduce that carbon footprint of pathology. And there's just two examples of papers out there that you, if you want to know more, that you can go and read. We've got the carbon footprint of pathology testing, where you can actually look at the, the, how much carbon is produced in certain biochemistry and hematology testing. And we can also look at some of the proposals by Lopez to 
for the mitigation of the environment impact. And one of those proposals is looking at how we can use point of care to reduce the need of the, the patient to come at a visit the clinic to have a blood sample for that blood sample to be transported to the lab and the lab to process. There are lots of alternatives out there and it's ways we can embed them into practice. And we can look at what we do. We can look at our own activities so we can promote that paperless office so in our practice. And the NHS has, has uh, really taken this to heart and produced a, um, they now use recycled paper and the quality of that paper discourages people from actually printing within the workplace. We can look at the recycling waste within our offices and our labs. We can look and use publishers and printers, so publications who actually supply paper from sustainable sources or have that forest stewardship council accreditation. We can use digital practice where we possible. And we can also look at uh, recycling PCs and, and mobile devices and exploring how we can set our equipment to sleep or safe mode. We can look at how we can encourage those attending meetings to, to use public transport in favour of cars. Can you attend a conference virtually? We can look at the frequency of meetings and whether we can do them on Zoom or Team or other digital sources. We can look at that motion sensitive lighting we can look at low energy light bulbs and we can make sure we turn equipment off. We can look at the waste we produce. Is it, can we go vegetarian one day a week to help the economy and help our health? Can we use dedicated bins for recyclables? Can we use filtered tap water instead of bottled water? Can we use reusable containers so that we don't continually buy the plastic bottles and produce more plastic? And we can look at those leaks. We can look within our current practice and look at sustainability and quality improvement. Is there any service improvements within your labs that, that can incorporate sustainability? We can look at paperless printing, resources, reagents, lab impact and waste. And there's some great resources and just bear with me, I need to plug my computer in. So we can go on to and do searches for lab sustainability resources. LEAF is that um, laboratory framework that gives you a way of embedding sustainability practice within your lab and getting, and getting a bronze, silver or gold level um, certification. There is a European um, network so you can work together with a clear vision to form that collective identity. identity. You can work with other colleagues within your own healthcare environment and labs and neighbouring labs to more work more efficiently. And then on these sites, you've got knowledge, you've got resources, you've got evidence-based practice, you've got those networks, and they're, they're these, these different organisations are there to support and help. Lamp Conscious it provides a blog with sustainable practice. There's green lab tips, there's resources, there's videos and equipment guides. And these, these resources include how anything from recycling to guidance on best practice. And you can use, they've also got grants and funding and equipment and ideas. There's the Lean Laboratory Efficiency Action Network. It's an organization for individuals that are passionate about sustainable science. And they again, provide resources and connectivity and they standardize, create, and promote those resources on best practice. And they've got resources on anything from laboratory behavior change programs through to equipment efficiency. They look at plastic use, they look at support services, and will help you to change your policies and strategies within your organizations. There's My Green Lab, which is a nonprofit organization that works in a, uh, worldwide in helping towards a permanently improving sustainability in scientific research and I am working with them for a clinical model. So we're looking at the lab environment and looking at the activities that we can embed to make those changes for the better. And they have a different, um, different ways you can do that. There is a freezer challenge that you can join 
to look at reducing those free, uh, freezers from minus 80 to minus 70. There's this, you can be, do a um, few hours training to become a My Green Lab ambassador and spread sustainability practices within your workplaces. There is a certification for chemicals to show that they are green and friendly to the environment. And you can work towards that Green Lab certification. Here in the UK, we have HCPC standards that we have to adhere to. And I'm looking at the ways we can embed sustainability to help the students learn and foster sustainability practice. And then I've included a few resources at the end of this presentation, just in case anyone wants to go out there and read more and consider how they can help the environment. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Sherry Scott. Uh, I would like to invite the audience to ask their questions. Any questions from the audience? Uh, actually, it was quite an interesting topic. So we are less commonly looking into these issues you know, in our routine practice. Uh, so uh, with that, we can also save our resources and, you know, um, I think uh, great look into this, uh, you know, issue. And I'm afraid uh, I, I, you've frozen. I'm not sure if it's me, but... Um... Presentation. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. And if I would like to feel... invite our next keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Mrs. Uh, okay. Without further hesitation, I would like to invite our next keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Redsky from USA and uh, he will be presenting topic on breast cancer and the preoperative window, a historical perspective. Uh, Dr. Retsky? Yes, hi, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Can I ask for my slides to be shown? Uh, yeah, I would like to ask uh, our technical team to share the slides. And by way of introduction, uh, this is a yep. project that started in 1993. I actually have a background in experimental physics and I ended up making a career change into cancer research by some strange situation. And I've continued to do that. And uh, I have been working with physicians and researchers and uh, a number of people of different backgrounds in oncology and science and medicine. This project has crossed a number of medical boundaries. So that was a, a good uh, uh, fit. Can I see my slides, please? Uh, can I ask our technical team to share the slides, please? Well, let me start as long as there's a delay here in the slides. Uh, this project okay. started in 1993, as I mentioned. Yep. I was attending a uh, cancer conference in Europe. I forgot what city it was. And I walked in the lobby where the Milan National Cancer Institute was showing a poster that described uh, data from Milan, and these data showed a bimodal relapse pattern in patients that were treated with mastectomy only. There was, a, you'll see this in the number of views later on when I get the slides, but the, uh, the, there are two peaks of relapse. There was a sharp peak at about 18 months, and then a minimum at about 
four or five years, and then it seemed to start up again. And there was a broad, shallow peak with a peak around five, six years. And then that extended to uh, 10 and more years. But this was unusual. I had not seen this before. I, I was intrigued. And then Sorry. I walked in. Sorry. Uh could you please could you please uh, share your present share your own presentation because I think uh, they, they they don't have this now at the moment to share if if you can share it I I really sent it twice it. today I sent it off twice to them so I see thanks Are you able to see this? No. I don't. So at any rate, uh, this, these data uh, turn out to be, uh, as I mentioned, I, I walked into the lecture hall and Michael Baum, a UK surgeon, was discussing a bimodal relapse pattern in, in uh, patients from UK. Uh, the three of us got together afterwards and it was determined that what uh, Dan McKelly and uh, Mike Baum were talking about was the same thing. I think by far the better data were the um, data from Milan. So that's what I used. Uh, my background, as I mentioned, is in experimental physics, and I have a I have knowledge of how to use computer simulation to study tumor growth. No one has yet found this slide yet. Sorry, it's not showing uh, up. Yeah, I believe the, the files that you sent uh, to them, I think not working at the moment. So that's why we ask you to share your own presentation if it's available. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't find a share button on this. Uh, Dr. Epsky. Yes. Can you see a green button share screen? First, you need to open your slides. I and couldn't see any button at all, sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's at the bottom, green color. I see no green color. It's at the bottom no. share screen. No, there's nothing there. My wife was looking over my shoulder and she doesn't see it either. That's not it. No. Fingers are right here, but. No. <clears throat> well, let me go on as if uh, you can see my slides. Okay, these. Uh, These data uh, were presented, uh, were studied. Uh, Romano Demichelli and I decided to collaborate on this. These data, there was a, a bimodal relapse pattern, as I mentioned, that sharp peak at about 18 months, a minimum about four years, and then it started up again. And this had not been seen in other databases. And the data that, uh, that Milan uh, showed was uh, quite sharp. There was a sharp peak at about 18 months for the postmenopausal patients, patients, but when they did the same thing for the premenopausal patients, <clears throat> that first peak at about 18 months seems to show two separate peaks, one at about 10 months and the other at about 30 months. Other than that, you can still see that uh, 50, 60 um, month uh, peak. So, 
Something's going on a little differently between premenopausal and postmenopausal patients. <clears throat> Another uh, data from Milan was a paper published in a New England journal in 1995 by Bonadonna and Valagusa. Bonadonna uh, died some years ago, but he was the first person to use multiple drugs and adjuvant chemotherapy and breast cancer very well-known person in the world of uh, breast cancer. And Panucci of Balagusa has been a database manager since, these, since this project started. And I have a lot of experience with databases and I trust these data and it's, uh, the presence of Balagusa is a major factor in this. Uh, in, in Italy, uh, women are tip typically stay in the same towns and cities, so they're not lost to follow up and they are known to be uh, cooperative with physician directives. So from a variety of reasons, the Milan data are the best I've ever seen. Uh, there was another data based from Fisher, Bernie Fisher. I might've mentioned this before. Uh, Fisher uh, died at age 100 a few years ago, I think in 2019. <clears throat> He, he showed uh, data from patients treated with mastectomy only, and he was looking at relapse rate, disease-free disease survival for patients for 11 years after surgery. And they grouped the patients by what, what, what were the number of positive lymph nodes. And he looked at zero nodes and he looked at one to three nodes, four to six, seven to 12, and greater than 12. And <clears throat> I, I had been studying the Milan data very carefully and looking at this figure, I can see the same pattern. There was a sharp drop off in relapses in the first three years. And then it seemed, seemed to have reached a plateau at about three years until it got up to about five years and it started up again. And looking, well, you can't see it at all, but I'm looking at it. The, the zero node patients, they had, they had a, they, uh, there was about 10% of the patients had relapses in the first three years. Then there was a period of very little relapses and it started up again. And they had a total of 20% of the patients who relapsed or if they would just remove, if they simply remove the primary tumor for patients with zero nodes, 80% of the patients would, would survive. They would not have a problem after that. Looking at the, at the largest number of <clears throat> lymph nodes, <clears throat> the ones with more than 12, the same things happened for the more than 12 compared to the zero nodes, but the numbers are vastly different. For example, the, the uh, uh, more than 12 node patients, about 85% of them relapse in that first three year period at about the same time as the zero node patients, but the numbers were far larger, I guess say 80, 85% of them relapsed. Then there's a period with a few relapses, then it started again. And virtually all the patients relapsed with, with more than uh, 12 nodes. And th this was just not explainable with the continuous growth model that has guided breast cancer early detection and therapy for many years. Then McCauley and I decided to get together. He has an uh, MD PhD. Uh, he, uh, he, was, he, had been done, he had done a lot of research with animal models. He looked at tumor growth in animal models for a number of years. And he said the simplest explanation he could say of animal tumors, animal uh, uh, cancers, they start off as single cells that could sit in a dormant state for a variable period of time. And then once they start to divide, they get to a size of about a millimeter or a million cells. And they cannot divide any more than that until angiogenesis kicks in. Once angiogenesis occurs, they can grow up to a, le a lethal size or a, a detectable size. So the, the strategy between Demichelian and myself is that I was to take his growth model in the Milan database, the Bonadonna Velagusa database, and using my skills in computer simulation, 
try and understand what were the what was going on to cause those variable relapses at uh, at uh, within at the thirty at eighteen months and at the at the at the five year period. I can I, I'm just going to tell you what the solution is. About eight, at about ten months for the. And these uh, avascular micrometastases that were induced into angiogenesis by something that happens at or near the time of surgery, and they showed up as relapses at 10 months. The 30 month peak corresponds to single dormant cancer cells that were induced into division, <clears throat> and then they underwent. Uh, angiogenesis stochastically and showed up as relapses in about 30 months. Uh, the rest of the curve at 60, 70 months is about the same as I showed you before. But the, the distinction that this computer simulation came up with was that the 10 month and the 30 month peaks were iatrogenic. These were caused somehow or other by the intervention. And uh, you, you can't see this, but uh, I was visiting professor in Bill McGuire's laboratory at the University of Texas in 1989. Uh, McGuire asked me to be a visiting professor for six months. And my task was to try and add the value of estrogen markers to the outcome of patients in his database. Uh, McGuire is, is well known for the person who first proposed that estrogen is a prognostic factor in breast cancer. And I had a six month uh, <clears throat> post-op visiting professorship there. But at four months, I had to go to McGuire and I say, it's a failure. I, I have not been able to get anywhere and I don't know why. So McGuire brought in the person to develop the database and they found out that <clears throat> one of the columns I was given was mislabeled. This, these data were actually the time when the patient last saw the physician, but I was told it was when the relapse occurred. So it turns out that <clears throat> I, I could not have solved the problem because the information I was given was erroneous somehow or other. So McGuire says, well, there's nothing you can do in the two months left in your and you're visiting professorship, do whatever you want. So I spent time in the medical library at uh, University of Texas, San Antonio. I was looking for data, <clears throat> excuse me, on patients who were treated or not treated, and they had data on tumor growth. In, in uh, 18, 1990 or so, this was a time when Physicians often left cancers alone. They just watched and waited. Even though there was active cancer, they would just watch it instead of uh, doing something. This is a case report from case of a 16-year-old boy who was diagnosed with osteosarcoma and uh, osteoclea relapses to the lungs. So what Smithers did was he took pictures of the boy for seven months. He took x-rays of the, of the uh, lungs of his boy and nothing could be seen until in the seventh month he first saw activity in the lung and then he watched that tumor grow for an additional 12 months before he removed it. This is something you'll never see again. This is something that was done in, in the 1968 time. The interesting thing about these data was that somehow or other, there was a correlation that the 21st tumor was when they amputated the leg. Uh, it was striking. It was exactly the same time they amputated the leg. But the question arises, <clears throat> Was that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that the amputation 
and the first appearance of the lung metastasis appeared, or was it, or did the amputation cause the relapse? And can't tell for sure, but I thought it was very <laughs> unlikely that the amputation, uh, that this could be a, co a coincidence between the amputation and the first presence of that, of that cancer. Any rate, it was in the back of my mind, this looks like reasonable clinical data that surgery can cause a relapse. So <clears throat> I was able, when I was doing computer simulation of those Milan data, I could not, I could not make the computer simulation look like the data. It just didn't work out until I tried to use, put some surgery induced activity into the computer simulation, then it could make it happen. And then the computer simulation looked very much like the data. And just going ahead on that, I mean, this is not hard evidence unless you believe that the data from Smithers, it looked like 20% of premenopausal node positive patients underwent angiogenesis at the time of surgery and showed up as relapses at that, uh, at that a 10 month peak. And this was five to one node positive to node negative and two to one premenopausal to postmenopausal. And looking at these data from Milan, it looked like 50 to 80% of relapses of these patients are iatrogenic. Those relapses are caused by something that happens at or about the time of surgery to show up as the relapses. The late peak is more or less a natural history of breast cancer and the benefit of surgery to remove metastases, to reduce metastases first it appears at about five or six years. The second. I have looked at a lot of other cancers, pancreatic melanoma, lung cancer, prostate, osteosarcoma, on and on. And since I'm, my eye is calibrated to this bimodal pattern, and if you know what to look for, you can see it in all this data. These are uh, single case reports or large databases. I've looked at, it's gotta be 15 different cancers and they all show some patterns of a bimodal relapse pattern. It turns out I was looking for a paper in a journal in a, uh, that was published in uh, 1994. I uh, was looking for a paper by my mom and I ran across another thing here at, at the history of treatment of breast cancer and he went back 2,000 years. He looked at, at writings from Celsus and Galen, uh, Greek and Roman scientists, researchers, physicians, whatever. And the, the, the comments I'm going to be reading to you are probably have been translated through several languages. So the wording might not be exact, but you can get the, the picture here. This is Celsus who was uh, from 30 BC to 38 AD. Celsus, according to this comment, was first there was the Cacoethes. Cacoethes is not a term that's used these days, but in prior years, it, it described small obvious lumps, tumor lumps that had not gone through the skin. So you can just barely detect them with palpation, but that's about it. So those are called the cacoethes. So Celso said, first there was a cacoethes and carcinoma with alteration, then the fungating ulcer. He goes on, none of these can be removed, but the cacoethes, the rest are irritated by every method of cure. The more violent the operation, the more angry they grow. After, it excis after excision, it recurs, bringing with it the cause of death, whereas at the same time, by using no extirpation, 
protract lives notwithstanding the disorder to an extreme old age. Uh, Galen uh, from, 11, from 131 to 203 AD. We have often cured this disease in the early stages, but after it has grown to a noticeable size, no one has cured it with surgery. Well, I, was, I was astounded to see this. First of all, the fact that they can actually cure cancers 2,000 years ago without benefit of in, in, uh, infection control or pain control, that was remarkable to me. I couldn't imagine that. Okay. Uh, my colleagues and I decided to uh, examine uh, possible ways of showing that this might actually be some sort of a relation between surgery-induced activity and sudden appearance of some um, amputation or tumor removal. And there are three, there are four items that we can say we've done some good analysis and there's some correlation between these, these four th things I'm gonna describe and what we reported in those papers. First of all, adjuvant chemotherapy works particularly well for premenopausal node positive patients. And published a paper in 2004, uh, I'm first author, co-authors is Gianna Bonadonna from Milan, the uh, person who first used multiple drugs to treat uh, breast cancer, and Judah Folkman. I was on Folkman's staff at the time. Uh, Folkman is the person who first discovered the, the uh, option, the idea that uh, tumors has to go through angiogenesis before they can get to a detectable or in, in the lethal size. So we published a paper in 2004, and the, the theme of this paper was that, that chemotherapy should be more effective for premenopausal node-positive patients because that's the most intensive growth right after surgery. We have avascular micrometastases that are induced into angiogenesis. That's the most rapid growth situation right after surgery. And that's when uh, Bonadonna found the best time was to give chemotherapy at that, at, right after surgery. Uh, the next item is that mammography works better for women age 50 years and 49 years and published a number of papers. Uh, one in particular, we were published paper in 2005 and a reporter from the Wall Street Journal happened to be a guest at one of the Folkman lab meetings. This was very rare. Folkman did not like uh, reporters, but this lady, um, Amy Marcus, a Pulitzer Prize winner, report, winning reporter from the, from the Wall Street Journal was there. And with some just this common discussion between her and I, she found out that I was going to submit a paper. I was going to have a paper published in a, next week. Myself and Demma Kelly were, were co-authors. And the subject was that this the fact that Women who are premenopausal have a uh, worse outcome from mammography than women postmenopausal. And Amy Marcus was a premenopausal woman and she had never heard this. And in particular, had never heard that we were saying that this is the result of surgery induced tumor growth. So Amy Marcus wrote up a report in the Wall Street Journal. And on the day that this paper was published, September 2005, uh, this Wall Street Journal report came out. Uh, it was a front page of one of the, one of the more well-viewed uh, sections in the Wall Street Journal. And also Harvard issued a press release. And as you might expect, I got a lot of publicity out of this. I ignore nothing else except one letter. I've got a letter from a physician, Isaac Gukas. Isaac, uh, another physician who died from cancer recently, he was, uh, he was from Nigeria originally, and he was a surgeon. 
and he was treating breast cancer in Nigeria for about 10 or 15 years before he moved to UK where he was working at a hospital in UK. So in this letter to the editor, Isaac Uka said, this could explain what they see in Nigeria. In Nigeria, when a, a woman finds a breast pump, they typically do not go to a surgeon to have the, the tumor removed. Instead, they go to an herbalist to get some soothing ointment and they go back to their village where they die of untreated breast cancer. So that's what Isaac described as what happened. Uh, this came out and got a lot of attention. If you go to, to Google and ask does surgery cause cancer, you'll probably see 100 million hits and it's all traceable to the report from all, uh, Amy Marcus in the Boston Journal. Okay, the, the theorem that we can use to say this core between what I was describing and clinical outcome is that there's a racial disparity in uh, African Americans compared to European, and there's a 1.5 excess mortality. However, there's an inversion at age 57. African Americans diagnosed under age 57 have poorer outcome compared to European Americans, but if they were diagnosed over age 57, they have superior outcome. So it's hard to explain this by reduced access to quality medical care. It's got to be biological. Um, and the fourth item we would say is that uh, physicians, cancer physicians, that breast cancer in young women can be aggressive. And while they call it aggressive, that they remove a primary tumor and within a year you get a relapse, that would seem to be an aggressive reaction. But from our viewpoint, it's clockwork relapse at 10 months after surgery, approximately. So we had some reasonably solid evidence that there's a clinical correlation between what Dan McCauley and I were reporting in this observation. So if something happens at or around the time of surgery to, to precipitate that early wave of relapses that accounts for over half all breast cancer relapses and surgery apparently causes something that induces angiogenesis of dormant avascular micromets and starts growth from single dormant cancer cells. And this may be a general effect, not just related to breast cancer. In uh, 2010, uh, there was an unexpected uh, and dramatic report from a group of, of uh, anesthesiologists from uh, Brussels. This is for Jay et al. published in Anesthesiology and Analgesia, 2010. This is a teaching hospital, so they have to expose all the residents to the various drugs that are used in anesthesia. And they use a variety of drugs. They don't, there are three NSAIDs that are available as IV, but at this time, the only NSAID they had was Catorlac or Toradol, Toradol. So one of the drugs they used, they did a retrospective study of the outcome of these patients grouped by what drug was given at anesthesia. And one drug stood up far and away better in reducing relapses. And that was Catorlac, the only NSAID they used. There was about a five-fold reduction in relapses in months 9 to 18, three versus 15 events. And there were some 300 patients involved. And these are all treated by one surgeon uh, sequentially, and they were given conventional therapy after surgery. So it was a five-fold reduction in those early relapse of nine, nine to 18 months. So at this point, we knew that some intervention at or about the time of surgery would be needed to prevent these relapses, but what mechanism could explain the Forget data? And I'm quoting here a page, a, a sentence from a paper by Hiller, Brodner, and Gottschalk, 
best practice in research clinical anesthesiology 2013. The sentence that attracted my attention from that paper was the perioperative period can be considered a perfect storm of immunosuppression and inflammation in the presence of residual or circulating tumor cells. That's a take home message. So what my colleagues and I decided to do, we did a, a correlation. We were looking for correlation among some very large fields, surgery, inflammation, and it turns out that IL-6, a marker for inflammation, shows up in serum and breast and colon cancer for about a week after the surgery. Angiogenesis uh, is apparent because platelets actively sequester angioactive factors and they degranulate in the presence of infl inflammation. So VEGF is increased uh, by about 10% uh, in that one week after surgery. It is well known there are circulating cancer cells for cancer patients. The immune system is known to uh, have an effect in cancer that in certain situations, the immune system can curtail cancer growth. And cancer dormancy is known that sometimes cancer cells and avascular micrometastases can stay in a dormant state for a very long period of time. And neutrophils also show up. Neutrophils are the body's reaction to intervention. Uh, one of the first things that happens is that the body kicks off uh, maybe 10 to the 11th neutrophils, whose job it is to uh, re recover, uh, cure the, the seal off the, the wounding and prevent uh, pathogens, bacteria, and viruses to, to be uh, invaded. What neutrophils do is they, they can go through the, the, um, the capillaries and they have the ability to extravasate. They are better off at extravasating than any other uh, white cell. What they also do is they can expel some of their DNA is a form of a net, it, it's, it's called a net, N-E-T, neutrophil extra, failure, extra, neutrophil extra, I don't know, extra something or other material. So it's sort of like a butterfly net that it's going down the capillaries and it can capture cancer cells and can extravasate so it can take the cancer cells into the, into the tissue of the body. It turns out that a paper by Agawa in 2013 reported that capillary permeability increases in the presence of inflammation, whereas without the inflammation, you can have 30 to 70 kilodalton particles escape, but with inflammation, you get 2,000 kilodalton particles. So there is a number, there are a number of reasons why you could expect neutrophils to be an effect where they can capture cancer cells in circulation and, se and sequester them and take them into tissue where they can become tumors. So I, I can show you five mechanisms that we came up with, well, that other people came up with that we found that could explain these data. Uh, the neutrophils that talk talked about. Uh, this is, there was a paper, Najma uh, Kuhl's La in uh, 2017. And uh, Romano Demichelli and I edited a book that was published by Springer Nature, published in 2017. And chapter four was written by Hiller, Shire, and Rydell. And after reading that chapter, I would be surprised if surgery did not cause the metastasis to occur. Okay, the name of that book was uh, the, peri uh, the Perioperative Window, Breast Cancer. Second mechanism, this was a paper uh, published by a group from MIT. Uh, Jordan Krell was the first author 
the, uh, the work was done in the laboratory of, uh, of uh, uh, Bob Weinberg, Bob Weinberg, who was a very well-known cancer biologist. And Weinberg wrote the foreword into that Springer Nature book. And in essence, he said, in a, they developed a mouse model where they can inject cancer cells into this mouse and they would go into a dormant state, but only if the immune system was intact. If the immune system was non-functioning, this would not happen, but they could inject cancer cells into the mouse and they would go into dormant states. Then they could do an experiment. My colleagues and I can do analysis of, of breast cancer data pretty good. We're, go, we're skilled at that, but we can't do an experiment. So what they did was they could operate on that mouse at any place on the mouse and you can get relapses, you get secondary tumors that were uh, tumors that would grow up any place in the mouse. So you can operate on the left side and you get a tumor on the right side. And furthermore, this could be controlled with the perioperative NSAID. So what, what this Creel paper described was very close to what we saw in those data in the computer simulation. The third mechanism was uh, described in chapter eight in that Springer Nature book. This was Marie-Louise Bonnelike Berntz et al. from Denmark. They were looking, they were using a zebrafish model where they could color code neutrophils and then they could uh, wound this zebrafish and watch what happens to the neutrophils. Neutrophils get directed to the sites of wounding. I mean, that's their job to clean up the wounding area, but then they get diverted to pre-neoplastic cells that then start to divide. So this could be another mechanism whereby surgery can cause a relapse. Uh, fourth relapse, uh, platelets actively sequester angioactive factors and then degranulate in the presence of, in, uh, presence of inflammation. And as I mentioned, uh, platelets decrease by 10% uh, for a week post-surgery and VEGF increases similarly. <clears throat> Fifth mechanism, uh, this was a paper published by Panigrahi et al. in Journal of Clinical Investigation 2019. This was a Harvard group and I happen to know three of the authors in this group. Uh, this is a very high level group. The, uh, the, the main author was Vikas Sukatmi, who was Dean of uh, Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical School. And he is now Dean of Medicine at, uh, in Georgia at uh, Tem Temple, Temple University or Tom, Tampa, is that the one? any rate, the first sentence in that Panigrahi paper is, this is a quotation, cancer treatment is a double-edged sword as surgery in parentheses. And then tumor may escape and static outgrowth resolution of inflammation. You can look up that paper in Journal of Investigation 2019. Uh, okay, just in general, I, I've mentioned this before, but the Milan data, I, they are the best data I've seen. Uh, women in Italy typically stay in the same towns and cities so they're not lost to follow up. And women are typically compliant with physician directives but in person, Panucci Valagusa had been the database manager since this project started. These are all good factors for a high quality database. Conclusions, the early relapses, which comprise the majority of relapses consists of surges of angiogenesis and single cell activation of dormant uh, um, cancer activity. These are triggered by the primary surgery that causes systemic inflammation lasting about a week. 
and the systemic inflammation causes dormant cancer cells and deposits to exit dormancy, resulting in relapses by those five mechanisms, by one of those five mechanisms. And the question can be asked, is this why adjuvant chemotherapy is administered after surgery? Second item I could say in my conclusion is that data suggests that transient systemic inflammation is a precipitating factor resulting in angiogenesis and single cell growth and dormancy. The third one is that Forget data. Forget, this is that data from uh, that Belgian uh, anesthesiology group. This is a retrospective study that perioperative NSAID Catorolac reduces early relapses fivefold. This has not been confirmed in a prospective trial. It has been confirmed in prospective studies, but that's not uh, in uh, post-active post, uh, st studies, but not in, in uh, provisional. Am I getting that wrong? Okay, th this has not been totally confirmed, and we say that this could reduce breast cancer mortality by 25 to 50% at low cost and toxicity. And breast cancer runs its course in over a decade, but most of the events that lead to relapse seem to occur in that one week after surgery, suggesting that the metastatic progression is amplified, amplified a hundredfold during that post-week surgery. And judging from the Fisher graph, 10% of node, node negative patients and 85% of patients with more than 12 nodes have surgery-induced relapse. And this may explain the value of mammography. When they do mammography, they want to find patients with zero nodes because then they can cure 90% of them just by removing the primary tumor. That's what they like to find with mammography. And there was a second retrospective study of perioperative NSAID reported in uh, Desmet Demichelli in the Journal of National Cancer Institute in 2018. And uh, comments from a uh, person who was at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, his opinion is that the surgeon and the anesthesiologist need to do whatever they can to control inflammation. At Beth Israel, Catorolac is given to all breast cancer patients. Just after surgery, the patient is on the table and has not been taken out of anesthesia, and that's when they give Catorolac. Giving it that way, they reduce the chance of bleeding, post-op bleeding, enormously. There was a clinical trial underway in Japan for non-small cell lung cancer using an NSAID, not Catorolac. And uh, I would say a crisis is apparent. This is, a, this is something that looks like this could be considered something that is just before a, a clinical change, a, 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 a change into a, uh, a new method of, of treating cancer. Okay, i sorry, I don't have any figures to show you. But I'll be happy to take any question. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Michael Ritzke, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, we regret that we couldn't actually see your slides. Uh, I would like to invite the audience to ask their questions. Is there any question uh, from Dr. Ritzke? Uh, I think just there is a comment in the chat box that uh, Dr. Leda Manu, I think, uh, actually, she thank you, thanks you. This is this was so interesting. It is popular belief here in Albania that you should not biopsy a node or tumor because they get malignant. It's same anecdotal to me till today. So there was a comment for you, Dr. Ritsky, back then. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Ritsky. And, uh, with that, by the way, would like... most of this information is in a paper I published about a year and a half ago. In uh, it's called Breast Cancer and the Black Swan. It's uh, 
published in 2020. All the information is in there. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. So uh, I would like to invite our next uh, speaker, Dr. Aksa Nasir from the USA. Dr. Nasir, I, actually, she will be presenting on a topic what we know about serrated colorectal polyps in patients with bona fide Lynch syndrome. Uh, Dr. Nasir. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind info, uh, introduction. I will share my screen. Yep. Could you please introduce yourself and share your screen, please? Thank you. Absolutely. I'm Aksa Nasser. I am a GI liver pathologist at the University of Florida in Gainesville, USA. And today I will share with you my experience regarding the serrated colorectal polyps in patients with Lynch syndrome. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Dr. Okay, perfect. So we'll get started. So before I start with the presentation, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee, especially Dr. Pasco Reni, uh, for uh, inviting uh, for this talk and also uh, all help with the coordination. I have no disclosures. Uh, so colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer um, causing death in men and women in the United States, excluding skin cancers. And according to the estimate by the American Cancer Society, um, there will be a little over 100,000 deaths from colon cancer and over 44,000 deaths uh, from the rectal cancer in uh, 2022. And uh, overall, it is associated, uh, expected to cause around 52,000 deaths in uh, 2022. Uh, though the overall death rate has dropped, however, the uh, death rate in the younger population is increasing at around 2% per year from 2007 onwards. This is the table which tells you about this five-year uh, relative survival rate for colon cancer. And you can see the rate um, is around 91% for the localized cancers, and it decreases to 14% uh, with distant metastasis. Similar is the case with the rectal cancer. It is 90% for the localized, as opposed to 17% for the uh, cancer with the distant metastasis. And it emphasizes on the fact that early detection and management can help save a lot of lives. Traditionally, it is considered that adenoidus polyp is the precursor region for the colorectal cancer. However, the recognition of the serrated nucleasia pathway introduced us to another concept. And now we know that this is uh, the sessile serrated adenomas are approximately responsible for 20% of the sporadic cancer cases. So what is serrated polyp? It is defined as a lesion with serrated or salt at the parents of the colonic polyps. And we have four different types, hyperplastic polyp, the sile serrated adenoma, traditional serrated adenoma, and the serrated adenoma unclassified. This just shows you the evolution of this uh, terminology starting from the third WHO edition where they were termed as serrated adenomas to fourth WHO edition where they were defined as a sile-serrated adenoma slash polyp with overall distortion of normal architecture in two or three contiguous graphs. And they were updated as a sile-serrated lesion in the WHO fifth edition, uh, where they were defined as having at least one unequivocal aberrant graft. This table shows you the different characteristic features of the hyperplastic polyps, the sile-serrated lesions, and the traditional serrated adenomas. Hyperplastic polyp and the DSAs are more predominant on the left side as opposed to the SSAs, which are more common on the right side. So, sile serrated lesions are usually small, sessile, and flat. However, the DSAs can be large, pedunculated, and polypoid lesions. On endoscopy, the hyperplastic polyp appears as pale, same color as the background mucosa. So, sile serrated lesions can have a mucus cap, ring of debris cloud-like surface and irregular shape. 
And traditional ciliated adenomas have a large appearance because of their polypoid pedunculated look. They can have a pine cone appearance and erythematous. This was first um, considered um, as an entity in 1984, one of the early publications, which talked about mixed hyperplastic and nidogotous polyp having both hyperplastic and adenomatous appearance. And they reported a case in which the colorectal adenocarcinoma was arising in a similar polyp, though the size was small, but there were two foci of the cancer node. Then later in 1990s, this publication talked about the mixed hyperplastic adenomatous polyp and the serrated adenomas. They have um, around 110 colorectal polyps with this morphology. And they compared them with the traditional adenomas, hyperplastic polyps, and other colonic polyps. And these were distributed throughout the colon with a little more predominance on the right side, especially in the cecum and appendix, for the larger lesions more than one centimeter in size. These lesions have 37% with foci of significant dysplasia and 11% with areas of intramucosal carcinoma. And they were termed as serrated adenomas to emphasize on their neoplastic nature. This publication by my mentor, Dr. Snower, uh, from the University of Minnesota, um, emphasized on serrated adenomatous polyposis for the first time. They talked about several cases which presented with numerous polyp, more than 50, 100 carpet-like lesions. And they for the first time define what are the distinctive features of these serrated adenomas, we differentiate them from the hyperplastic polyp. So they define them as the polyps with dilated preps at the base, which are parallel to the muscularis mucosae. And they have a proliferation zone, which has moved from the base to the middle of the upper portion. And they are associated with eosinophilia. Their conclusion was that these, uh, the serrated adenomatous polyposis has not been described before, and it should be distinguished from the hyperplastic polyposis, given its possible association with adenocarcinoma. And this has not been termed as serrated polyposis. The follow-up study from the same authors further talked about the morphology of the serrated polyps, and they provided a provisional classification of these polyps in the colon and rectum. Hyperplastic polyps were further divided as microvesicular polyps, goblet cell polyps, and mucinic pore polyps. Then there are serrated adenomas, traditional type, and the third category was serrated adenoma, sessile type with abundant mucin production. Authors recommended that these polyps have abnormal proliferation, similar to the seen, uh, seen in the polyps of the hyperplastic polyposis described in their earlier publication. And they also emphasize on the fact that evaluation, evaluation for the site, size, and morphologic features is important because a subset of these polyps is associated with colorectal carcinoma development to the microsatellite instability factor. So I'll just go over uh, some examples of the serrated polyps. This is um, a hyperplastic polyp, and you can see the funnel shape Krebs, where the more of the uh, proliferation is happening in the middle and the upper portion, and there are these serrations. This is an example of the microvesicular type of the hyperplastic polyp, in which the columnar cells of the lining have these microvesicles of the mucin. They tend to happen more on the right side, and around 85% of these are associated with the rack mutation. This is an example of the goblet cell hyperplastic polyp. You can see the numerous prominent goblet cells throughout. There are serrations. These polyps tend to occur more on the left side of the colon, and around 50% are associated with Keras mutation. This is an example of the goblet cell hyperplastic polyp. This is an example of the mucin poor hyperplastic polyp. You can see, as compared to the prior two examples, mucin is not as prominent. However, you can still see the serrations. They almost never occur in the right side, and they are associated with regenerative and injury. This is an example of the societal serrated adenoma. You can see in this, the serrations are extending to the base of the crepes, causing dilatation. This is muscularis mucosae. So the dilatation is happening parallel 
to the muscularis mucosae, causing the T-shaped L-shaped formation, and sometimes what we call as little boots. This is an example of the traditional serrated adenoma. It has more eosinophilic pink look to it. Uh, serrations can be identified. And the most characteristic finding is the presence of the aberrant preps. So there are two pathways through which these serrated polyps can go different mutations, resulting in colorectal carcinomas. One is the Kira serrated pathway which can lead to Kira's mutant microsatellite stable colorectal carcinomas. And the other is the BRAF serrated pathway. In this, two types of changes can happen. One is resultant BRAF mutant microsatellite stable colorectal cancer. And the other in which the societal serrated lesions further undergo MLH1 hyperlipidation, resulting in dysplasia and, lead, uh, and uh, leading to the BRAF mutant microsatellite instable colorectal carcinomas. This publication talks about the prevalence of the different types of the colorectal polyps uh, in unselected population. And you can see here uh, the, uh, the non serrated adenomas, they can happen almost equal on both sides. However, the hyperplastic polyps tend to occur more on the left side as compared to the societal serrated adenomas more on the right side. This is another publication talking about the distribution of the societal serrated adenomas. You can see here the majority happening on the right side in the symptom and the ascending column. The mean size in this um, uh, study was 8.1 millimeter. And around 4% of these societal serrated adenomas were related uh, with the synchronous adenocarcinomas, all happening on the right side. This is a publication that talks about uh, the experience of the gastroenterologist in detecting these lesions. So in their study, they found that the Caucasian population, uh, there is more uh, detection of the societal serrated adenomas as compared to the African American. And also depending upon the experience of the gastroenterologist, um, they tend to have a more uh, detection rate of these polyps as compared to the non gastroenterologists This publication uh, talks about the experience of the gastroenterologist during the colonoscopy, as well as the experience of the pathologist. You can see here, there are two groups uh, reviewing uh, these polyps. The first group was the journal surgical pathologist, and then the same cases were reviewed by the GI pathologist. They have a little over 1900 patients. And you can see here, many of these polyps were reclassified by the GI pathologist as TSA conventional polyps and also serrated unclassified polyps. So the detection rate by the GI pathologist is around 7.4% without dysplasia and SSAs with dysplasia 0.6%. This study uh, uh, looking to multiple publications uh, for the prevalence of the societal serrated adenoma. And we can see here there is pretty broad distribution with some studies uh, reporting as little as 0.6% and with some uh, going high up to 13.8% prevalence of SSA. And these all published between 2003 to 2014. This is a review article uh, talking about various features of the societal uh, serrated uh, colorectal neoplasia. And here they talk about the autopsy studies, which were published from around the world. And you can see a significant amount of patients were, a number of the patients were included. And there is a broad range of uh, percentage of patients with the serrated polyps going as high as 56.6%. That's pretty significant. These are the American and European guidelines for the surveillance uh, of the uh, different types of the polyps after colonoscopy. And you can see the, uh, the time uh, line goes down to three years if there are societal serrated lesion with one centimeter or more size or any size with dysplasia, a single hyperplastic polyp with at least one centimeter size or TSA of any size. 
So uh, there are several types of the hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes, and I'll be talking about two in my talk today, Alin syndrome and the serrated polyposis syndrome. So the serrated polyposis syndrome is characterized by multiple serrated polyps throughout the colorectal and increased risk of colorectal carcinoma. And in the updated WHO uh, criteria, there are two criteria now. One is that at least five serrated lesions proximal to the rectum, all five millimeter or more in size, with two or more that are one centimeter or more in size. The second criteria is more than 20 serrated lesions of any size distributed throughout the large bowel with at least five proximal to the rectum. Any one criteria is enough for the diagnosis. All types of the serrated polyps are included in the final count, and the polyp count is stimulated over the period of multiple colonoscopies. Lynch syndrome is an inherited cancer syndrome characterized by the tumors which display microsatellite instability. It is also known as hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. It is caused by the online mutation in the mismatch repair genes, most commonly FMH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And individuals with this syndrome have high frequency of adenomatous polyps. This table uh, shows different types of the cancers that can occur in Lynch syndrome patient by age 70. And you can see here regarding colorectal cancer, the journal population risk is 0.5%, and you can see a significant increase in patients with Lynch syndrome. There is very limited data, however, available for the polyps in the serrated, with the serrated architecture in patients with Lynch syndrome. And you also don't know what is the frequency and an anatomic distribution of different types of these polyps in the Lynch syndrome. This is one of the uh, publications from the Netherlands, and they looked at two uh, population data. You can see the patient with the Lynch syndrome and the control population, and they looked at various types of the polyps, including various types of the serrated polyps, and you can see there was no statistical significance in, the, uh, in their study. So they suggested that maybe the serrated neoplasia pathway for the development of the colorectal cancer in Lynch syndrome patient is comparable with the general population. So with these things in our mind, we thought about doing a project looking at what is the prevalence of the serrated polyps in the Lynch syndrome, the sites of the serrated polyps in the frequency, the interval when the first time colonoscopy is performed to the time where the first diagnosis of the serrated polyp is made, and also at the, age, the time of the diagnosis, um, what is the age of the patient. So we have uh, consecutive colonoscopy biopsy slides we reviewed um, with the patient who were known to have Lynch syndrome clinically at Mayo Clinic from 1992 to 2018. And these are the various uh, categories that we classify these polyps into. This is one of the examples from our study, a patient with cystic serrated adenoma, and you can see nicely dilated crepes, serrations. This is the high magnification view of the same polyp. You can see the dilated crepes parallel to the muscularized mucosae. This is example of the cystic serrated adenoma with dysplasia arising in it. And this is the high magnification of the same polyp. You can see the serrated features as well as the dysplasia. So we have total of 147 patients uh, with, uh, who have 735 colonoscopic biopsies, which are approximately same gender distribution. And the age range uh, for the biopsy uh, was 28 to 89 years. This is the distribution of the various types of the polyps in 187 patients with serrated architecture. Majority were hyperplastic polyp, followed by the cystic serrated adenoma. And in five, uh, we could not identify exactly which category to put them into. So they were defined as serrated polyp, not otherwise classified. 
This is more detailed uh, chart showing you the different types of facilitated cult that we saw. Three societal adenomas have dysplasia, and also the number of the tubular adenomas, tubular villous adenomas, and the villous adenomas identified in this population. So, out of 147 patients, 13% have societal adenomas, and 42% have hyperplastic cults. In our cohort, the hyperplastic colors show the left-sided predominance, which is comparable to the other published studies. However, interesting finding that uh, we have society-related adenoma also with left-side predominance. It just shows the different uh, sites of facilitated polyps in our cohort. One patient met the criteria for facilitated polyp was placebo. This uh, shows that the prevalence of at least one society-related adenoma reached 50% at 20 years after first colonoscopic biopsy. Here you can see this. And the median age at the time of diagnosis was 63. Then also, there was prevalence of any polyviscerated adenoma reaching 50%, you can see here, at 10 years after their first colonoscopy. So when we analyze these patients with germline diagnosis uh, confirmed by in-house molecular testing, and in this we have total 36 patients, which form 25% of the people are equal gender distribution. Range of biopsy was one to 14 per patient. Number of patient with any polyp with sedated architecture was 15, accounting to 41%. This is the distribution of the various types of the polyps in which we have in-house molecular confirmation. You can see society-related adenoma with dysplasia, only in one, three society-related adenoma, hyperplastic polyp, and 67 were adenomas of various types. So the prevalence of the society-related adenoma in this subgroup with molecular confirmation was 11%, which is similar to our overall cohort, which was 13.5%. And it was also pretty similar to the prevalence which was reported as uh, by one of the larger studies earlier. So in our conclusion that our data with large consecutive series of patients with Lin syndrome, we found out that the prevalence of the society-related adenoma is 13%, which is more than the average risk population. Also in our cohort, the patients have more left-sided predominance of the societal distribution. And our data show that half of the Lin syndrome patients will develop society-related adenoma by 20 years after their first colonoscopy. And if total colectomy is not performed, patients with Lin syndrome can develop society-related adenoma at a median age of 62 years. And this data can be used for counseling in patients with Lin syndrome and their relatives. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Cram, and Dr. Hartley, if you have the Politics of New Clinic, and our research coordinator, Catherine Yu, for all their help with this project. These are different references that I used for my presentation. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Aksan Nasir. It was quite an uh, interesting topic. <clears throat> Actually, I myself uh, sometimes having difficulties, you know, diagnosing uh, serrated, uh, uh, sisal serrated polyps. And uh, there are actually uh, some issues also related to our, uh, you know, uh, technical, technical aspects of uh, the processing of the specimen and, uh, you know, taking biopsies. Um, I would like to invite audience to ask their questions if there, there's any question. It seems that there is no question in the chat box. Um, may I ask you, actually, um, this is always my question. Uh, if you just see one crypt having the features of uh, serrated, uh, I mean, lesion, uh, so how do you approach this, this uh, polyp? So is that uh, sufficient for you to call it serrated polyp? Yes, uh, it's a very good question because previously it was like up to three contiguous crypts, but now with the new WHO, they have revised the criteria and one crypt is enough. So if I see one crypt, I call that society attribution. 
All right. And how, how do you approach fragmented or insufficient material? I, I mean, uh, sometimes we suspect that there is, uh, uh, you know, like that open perhaps just one part of the crypt is uh, visible, but we cannot comment on the whole specimen. So how do you approach? Do you have this, uh, I mean, specific reporting for that? Or how do you, how do you manage that case? Right. This is actually, yeah. I have faced this difficulty here. Yeah, actually, it's a very common occurrence. I also see it day to day. Like today, I'm on GI biopsy sign out, and I actually have a similar case. Uh, so usually, when we see this case, I tend to get the deepers because deepers can help you. Okay. Um, sometimes you can see the better orientation, more tissue. Okay. But if I don't see anything, and especially if it is in the right side of the colon, yep. then I sign it out as serrated polyp and put it in the comment that, you know, there's minimal tissue and or the orientation is not very well. So hyperplastic polyp or sessile serrated adenoma is in the differential. And then I let them do the correlation with the endoscopy finding. Okay, so there's no role uh, for, for, for the staining, uh, I mean, uh, or for, for molecular studies in difficult cases yet. Sometimes right? they say you can do MLH, uh, but I usually, yeah. MLH one, but I usually don't do it in my practice. Usually, um, mostly if there are polyps, depending on the site also, because for the right side, it's mostly the sessile sedated adenomas and hyperplastic polyps are very, you know, less frequent. Yeah. So that is why right. I either go, you know, for further deeper, or I just put it in the comments. So I usually do not perform um, in, you know, staying in my routine practice. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you very much for this interesting topic. And thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's no more question from Doctor Nasir, oh, let me see. There's there seem to be. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, do you perform MLH one to uh, every serrated lesion to rule out dysplasia? This is the question. From Dr. Yeah, Laura, some, from sometimes, yes, it's a very good question. Sometimes we do that, but very few times. Most of the times I have seen, if I have question of dysplasia, getting deeper have helped me tremendously uh, because some things, you know, become more evident. Uh, but in some cases we do that, but it's a very less, you know, very less frequent. Okay, all right. Thanks again, Doctor. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, I think uh, for our next presenter, Dr. Aniel, she, uh, he has provided the recorded presentation. So the presentation will be uploaded on YouTube. Uh, and uh, in general, everyone will receive the recordings of all the presentations soon. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we are going to end uh, and close the day one of this conference. Uh, so we we will actually uh, resume tomorrow about I think 10:55 a.m. UK time. So thank you everyone for your attention and presentation. Uh, we have had so many of different uh, kinds of interesting presentations and topics for discussion, and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>